Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to call to order the April meeting of the Safety Committee, the MTA Board. Uh, can we hear the, uh, uh, the safety announcement, please? Your safety is of the foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen and adhere to the following instructions. If you witness an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and call 911 immediately. Please follow any audible instructions provided through the public address system or visually on screens in the event of an emergency. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell B down the hallway past the elevators. If you have a mobility disability or cannot self-evacuate, please proceed to stairwell D or E for assistance by MTA staff or emergency personnel. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. If you need assistance during an evacuation, please tell an MTA staff member or emergency personnel. Thank you and have a safe day. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Chris, is there, are there any public speakers? Uh, we do, Chair. Chair Labor, there are five public speakers. Three are present, two will be remote. The first speaker will be Mary Bowden, followed by Lisa Daglan. Good morning. Can you hear me? I just sent you a present, uh, Jano. It's the uh, cap that, that the police wore when I came here. And my question to you is, why don't you issue that color cap to the rest of the MTA crew so that we know who works for you? You use a dark blue cap. Hey, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair because I can't stand so long and I can't walk so far. But I also can't see that well. If I can, to put, to off, the traffic people have it, why don't your true have it? Safety, safety is consistency. I got it written down. You, you've, you've gone high tech, but you stopped at the beginning. You're using road lines that are 50 years old. They were designed for a world that doesn't exist anymore. Drivers can't drive where the lines are, and you've created a situation where if you can ignore it, why can't we ignore it? The signs that you see on the overhead, the big ones, you can see a mile away because the 3M company bribes somebody to use highly reflective stuff. You can see the signs, you just can't read them. It's all about money. Who's making money? Did the Going right across all of your organizations, everybody's doing high tech, but they forgot where you all came from. This is not 1950. Robert Moses is long dead. If you want drivers to obey, you got buses that reading the, the lines left and right. You have to consistently have lines on the left so the computer on a bus knows where to go. The cars are driving themselves. And you can change the direction of the lights in the back, but you can't get the loads right. Please you conclude your remarks. The road right. Yes, you're right. I speak too long. I can't remember too much. And I want to thank all of the people that have been so nice to me at the MTA. I could not done, have done it without their help. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Our next speaker is Lisa Daglian, followed by Jason Anthony. Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to Good morning, I'm Lisa Dagley, and Executive Director of the Permanent, Le Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. We again point out the importance of the safety committee meetings and ask that they be held monthly and later in the day at a time when more people are likely to pay attention. It's so disheartening to see the increase in assaults against employees and MTA PD. 
This month's book shows the, that in February, Metro North was where the preponderance of these unacceptable acts were occurring. But why? No one should put their life in jeopardy simply by going to work on the railroad. And while the numbers seem to be declining against both Long Island Railroad, subway, and bus employees, they're still way too high. In the breakdown of summonses and arrests across the system, it would be good to know if people are being caught and held accountable for these crimes, and then what the outcomes of those cases are. In the electronic security program update that will come during this meeting, we look forward to hearing how the technology being used is to is, will help protect riders and the system, but also the employees and the PD who keep the MTA rolling. We'd also hope for an update on the e-bike, e-scooter policy. You can't turn on the news without hearing about fires from lithium-ion batteries. Also, the councils uh, will be speaking about it this week. We hear continuously from riders about people charging these devices on board trains and in stations, and also riding them in stations. A solid and declarative policy with teeth will let people know the rules and give those enforcing them the backup they need to do their jobs. In fact, I saw a sign in my library about no riding and no charging scooters or e-bikes. We stand ready to assist. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Christopher Greif. Good morning, General. Good morning, Pat. Um, Jason Anthony here. Uh, just returning from my spring break vacation in Orlando, Florida. Uh, this morning, I'm going to speak regarding several incidents that have been occurring in our beloved subway uh, system, one of them being in my home station, Atlantic Avenue Barclays Center. It is very alarming that Transit District 32 is not there at during the night, it is very concerning that yours truly uses that station every day for the past seven years. And I can see police officers from that transit district and from police uh this uh, precincts from that area distracted on their cell phones, receiving reports. And yes, we could understand that they could receive reports on their cell phones, but they have to be attention attentive to their surroundings because something could happen in a snap of a finger. And I could be listening to music on one AirPod, but I could be attentive to my surroundings. And that's, we need to be telling to our police officers while they're patrolling our subway system. Because we need to stop these incidents all at once right now. I'll see you guys in the Please next meeting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Greif, followed by Alita Dupre. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christopher D. Greif. I'm sorry I'm not there, but I'm here on the screen. Uh, I'd like to bring up some safety concerns for people with disability as well as seniors. As we get on these elevators at certain stations, they're not in that much in Brooklyn issues, but they're in the other boroughs. I am glad to see there are officers, but at the same time also, safety is a very important for seniors and people with disabilities across the board. And we need to make sure that officers are also near the turnstile areas, like in there's a lot of the major transit point stations and non-transit point stations. I'd like to thank Transit 34, the precincts in this and the parts of Brooklyn are been attending and seeing these people try not to sneak through the gate but we definitely need to continue working on that. And I do want to thank the MT8 police that did catch some kids trying to almost jump off to a track and lucky they did respond very quickly. 
Uh, it was a, a couple of weeks ago. I wasn't here in the city. I was away. But I still want to say thank you to the MTA police. But again, we do need to work on strongly to safety for seniors and people with disabilities, all the boroughs, including Staten Island, because as you know, people want to get on the trains and buses. They want to commute. They want to head to their destination. If it's working, if it's going to classes, or even better, going somewhere to have some fun, spend time with their family and friends. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alita Dupree. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair General Lieber and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her. Uh, it's good to be back with you. I need my clock here. Uh, I'm going to talk about safety. Um, and I, I talk about the basics, uh, as I mentioned in the topics. Uh, uh, revenue and, and property. Um, I, I think we're doing some good things with the station agents uh, and that we are having our money put into the vending machines. Uh, but how, how can we go to the next level with our uh, railroads? Uh, because uh, people are at risk when we have money uh, being collected on the trains, and I think they still do. Uh, so uh, that's something we have to keep working on uh, because we want to reduce uh, targets. And uh, safety awareness is, is essential. Uh, how can we have signage to help uh, people to be more informed about being aware uh, on the system? You know, when I get on any transit system, I'm scanning, uh, looking all around me, and I generally pace around a lot. I rarely stay in one place. Uh, because I want to be safe on the system. And I think overall, th this is a very safe system. It's not a perfect system. And uh, I'm not laying blame on anybody. But I think awareness is key for all of us to have the safest system that we can. And uh, we, we have lots of stairs. Uh, how can we keep after uh, issues such as spills and other objects on platforms and stairways that people can trip over. Uh, that's, a, that's a part of safety too. So I have to keep my wits about me when I'm climbing and uh, riding on escalators. Escalator safety is very important. I look forward to using the long escalators in Grand Central Recording Madison. Recording in progress. I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Lieber, that concludes today's public speaking session. Okay. Thank you to all the public speakers um, for participating. We do appreciate it. Um, Pat, are there any oh, approval of the minutes? Are there any changes to the minutes? It's a strictly grammatical one, but on page five, Mr. Warren commented on some of the efforts. The word of is missing. Some of the efforts. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other changes or additions? Okay. okay. I'm told that we're, we're lacking a quorum. Um, in that event, we'll, we'll we'll make the changes, but we'll bring it back for formal approval at the at the next meeting uh, of the committee. Um, Pat, are there any changes to the work plan? Chair, there are no changes. Okay, um, we're going to do a, a presentation on on the uh, the PEV policy, the use of e-bikes and e-scooters. Um, this is an area that we've been trying to figure out for some time because I think as folks know, they are present on the system. They do have uh, significant advantages for some, uh, some of our customers, especially folks who are dealing with that first mile, last mile connection. They may be coming from our outlying areas and wanting to get to a commuter railroad station or in many cases, folks find it useful to move around the city uh, when they get into the city on those um, uh, on those areas uh, on those vehicles, um, it's also environmentally responsible, and um, they're they're here to stay. I think that we're, we're we are seeing just by the prevalence of these types of uh, these types of uh, vehicles that we we have to deal with them. Um, we want to allow them on the on the subway and on our other facilities, um, but it has to be done safely, and that's why we're talking about it today. 
Um, so we've got a new policy that's been uh, worked on for some time, and I'll hand it over to P Pat for a presentation. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we're fortunate to, to have an extremely talented safety uh, prof professional uh, on staff, Jonathan Fazio. Mr. Fazio has over 20 years of tactical and strategic experience in both the um, heavy construction field and railroading. Prior to joining the headquarters um, safety team, he served uh, eight years with Long Island Railroad, working on projects ranging from PTC to mainline expansion, better known as third track. Jonathan has spent a large part of the last year um, researching the many um, safety aspects concerning PEVs and authored our new policy for, for these devices. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Chairman, uh, you folks probably haven't seen me up here, so but chances are you've heard me say, your safety is of the foremost importance to the MTA. <laughs> so that would be me. If you take anything away from today, just remember that. So with that, we'll, uh, we're going to dive right into this. Okay, oh, back one. All right. So I got some notes I'm going to read through, but I'll go through the slides basically and just elaborate on everything. We'll have a question and answer session at the end. Um, the MTA Safety Management Office began its research by collecting a body of information regarding PEVs and transportation systems from safety and security organizations, including the Department of Homeland Security, National Fire Protection Association, and various fire departments. We focused principally on the risks and hazards associated with lithium-ion batteries. Our work with the FDNY identified challenges of how and why lithium-ion batteries fail due to overcharging, overheating, repacking, damaged batteries. These lessons aided in some of the restrictions that our policy addresses. We also used the NFPA's lessons learned for e-bike and e-scooter safety. Our research found that fires commonly attributed to lithium ion batteries and PEVs occurred as part of the charging process. We found no incident where an undamaged, unaltered, overcharged, and UL certified battery in PEVs overheated or caught fire during common use. So as, as you can see here in the slides, basically it just shows how we benchmarked, we collaborated with various outfits, uh, reviewed existing MTA requirements, and then uh, reviewed various hazard analyses. So with benchmarking, the MTA Safety Office further reached out to leading transit agencies, both national and international, to collect a body of information regarding their work, research, policies, procedures involving PEVs. We found that leading transit agencies have similar guardrails in place or have not yet developed a policy. Those agencies with PEV rules specified conditions for bringing PEVs into their systems to which we included and then further elaborated on. <coughs> agency, uh, basically we went through agency safety departments, operation departments, legal, the whole gamut. We went up and down all the agency departments to get uh, input, collaboration, lessons learned, and um, basically we consolidated this research information and developed a draft policy which was then vetted multiple times within the many departments, at MTA headquarters, and our agencies. Additionally, we turned discussions with some of our board members, adv advocacy groups, to aid in the policy development. Policy development considered operational and safety topics including current bicycle policies, scooter and other personal conveyance policies, the environment in which PEVs would operate, existing operational conditions, the ability to enforce and how to enforce, establish legal requirements regarding transit and railroad rules of conduct. After s dozens of reviews, it says dozens, but it was way more than dozens, many, many, many reviews, revisions, enhancements, we believe we have developed a forward-thinking and well-researched PEV policy. So this slide's gonna highlight really some of the high-level stuff, the high-level restrictions with the policy. Number one being no charging. The MTA already has policies which limit size and weight of personal vehicles, and those are reiterated in this policy. Similarly, current PEV policies address the safety hazards created when PEVs and other objects block passive egress and emergency equipment. As such, there are limitations on size, weight, quantity, as well as time of day, peak versus off peak, and which days th these can be brought onto our systems. And because each agency has different contra uh, constraints in their stations and vehicles, this PEV policy points to some of the agency's policies for bicycles and other personal equipment. Shared micro-mobility equipment is prohibited, 
And lastly, we reiterate the current policy for PEVs prohibits operation of any PEVs on property. So these are considered as a bicycle, but the lithium ion batteries obviously are the, are the largest hazard in this, the overcharging and the fires. Don't charge it anywhere at all. You can't operate it in the system. So I know folks like we can leave this boardroom, chances are we'll see a PEV in the system. And you, you might have seen them you know, flying down the, the platforms or whatnot. We never had guardrails in place. So this is really going to set the industry standard for, for guardrails with, for PEVs. The size and weight restrictions are similar to that of the bicycle policies, so we're not over, you know, o overlapping that. And then do not block aisles, walkways, equipment, vestibules, uh, operator cabs, so on and so forth. Okay, as batteries are the primary difference between a PEV and other personal vehicles, this policy provides requirements associated with batteries, including that only UL certified batteries that are structurally sound, again, not repacked, not damaged, not leaking, are permitted. The policy also directs that when equipped, PEVs must also be folded and that they must never be discarded, locked, or attached to an MTA asset garbage can, column, so on and so forth, uh, piece of equipment. Uh, the customer communications campaign. So these, these folks are really great. Um, to inform our customers of the new policy, we developed a communications campaign using the various communications mediums, including web pages, apps, digital screens found in cars, buses, trains, stations. Um, each agency will have a similar campaign catered to their unique operating environment while directing folks to the same MTAY policy. So if you look on the presentation, you're going to see Metro North, buses, subways, and Long Island Railroad. All, they're all going to point to the same policy, but they're kind of tweaked to um, each individual operating department and agency. Yes, sir. Um, the print was very fine on that, uh, on that slide, but does it state what the penalties are for violating these policies? So at that level, it's, it's really a high level it doesn't go into uh, rules of conduct or, or, or state. You know, I, we would work with MTA, PD. Like if somebody yeah. is caught zooming down a, a subway platform on a PEV, can it be taken from them? Can it be seized? I mean, what's... We, yeah, we, we didn't put those, those type of um, uh, restrictions in, in, in the policy or in the advertising campaign, uh, but that's something that we can consider to kind of um, have as an addendum or attachment or something along those lines. Sure, Thanks. so folks know what happens if you, yep, understood. Uh, board, board Member Albert, uh, you know, we currently have similar issues with bikes on the platform now, so it's the same, it's the same policies that we have now, which are, uh, I we can tell you that we've looked at summonses, we've looked at all the recent, um, like for the last year worth of stuff, very small, usually riding the bike, usually a summons issue, that's typically the, the, what's happened. And, and then uh, finally, to wrap up the customer communications campaign, uh, there's going to be some high-level restrictions listed, as, as you just saw, with a QR code that points directly to the actual policy guidelines and breaks everything out. So as importantly, messaging bulletins are being prepared and delivered to our workforces describing the conditions of the PEV policy and what their responsibilities are regarding it. And just to kind of recap and reel this whole thing in, we evaluate the risks, hazards. We engage with all the stakeholders in this agency and outside of it. Um, methodically developed a policy that addressed concerns, and we're launching a comprehensive customer edu ed education campaign. And we're confident that what we are doing, we are doing this safely and effectively as possible as we look to continue setting the bar for safe and reliable transportation. I'll make, now take any questions. Fire away. Does this policy apply to mopeds as well as PEVs? It would apply to any, right, so mopeds, if, if it's a gas Which powered vehicle. It may have a license plate, actually, but. Exactly, so we have a size and weight restriction. So a moped, historically, would probably be outside of the guardrails of what this policy would allow. Thus no gas powered vehicles. No gas, no gas powered, powered hydrogen. It's, it's only electric. Battery powered Okay, vehicle. thanks. Sir. Mr. Bringerman. Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to piggyback on what uh, Board Member Albert said earlier. We should have something in there about pest possible penalties or fines. Okay. That's what gets people's attention if you hit them in the pocketbook. You know, if one of these guys knows they get hit with a $100 fine for riding down the platform, they're less likely to do it. And if they see one of the MTA police writing a summons for something like that and say, hey, you know, we can get hit, it's going to grab their attention. The other thing on the, promote, the promotional, the uh, publicity campaign for this, 
you know, you mentioned don't block aisles, walkways, whatever. But I think you really need to emphasize don't block the handicapped access space because that's a, an open area and that's where most of the people are parking them now, you know, because it's set up for a wheelchair so it can easily fit one of their things and that's what we're seeing. So if you could just add that to the, you know, to the don't block, yeah, it'd be greatly appreciated. The last thing, and uh, I don't want to push the issue right now, it seems like you have it under control, but you mentioned maybe an addendum down the line, is let's review this once we set this thing in place and maybe come back in six months to see if, if we need to go with permitting these vehicles. Not the regular bicycles, just these vehicles. If, it, if you can enforce without doing a permit system, that's great, but just something to keep in mind down the line. And that's it. But other than that, Absolutely. I think it's great. I think it's long overdue. And speaking for the riders, uh, I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Say, I, I appreciate your comment about that we have to com communicate clearly about what areas are, are the, you know, the right locations for people to, to park these things. So um, that's a really good point that we should pay special attention to. We don't want folks using the handicap um, parking area for that. Mr. Testori. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll piggyback the same thing about the permits for the future. And, and I know that we are going to look at it and consider it for down the road. It, can we also assume when we're talking about aisleways, walkways, obviously we can't occupy a seat because that seems to be a, a, a big problem. This, even folded, if somebody is riding in a seat, they could stand it up next to them and occupy a seat, and then people don't have the ability to sit next to somebody. So I would, you know, hopefully overhead racks, <coughs> but if they don't fit in the overhead racks, occupying a seat uh, um, is going to be a continued problem. I don't know if we want to add that verbiage as well. Duly noted. Well considered. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Presentation will be circulated. A couple of good uh, pointers for us to add into the, the, the communications campaign. There's no reason it can't be adjusted to highlight a couple of these issues. So thank you, Mr. Fazio. Pat? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So let me, um, we're at time here, but um, uh, in addition to the PEV uh, policy, which we, we put in this brief today because it was important, it's timely, and we needed to do it, right? Uh, but there are the two other topics that were in the work plan. Um, they included um, safety program update, which, which is in the book, as well as electronic um, access control system update, which is also in the book. There's a lot of material in there. And um, I asked you to take a look at it. And, and if there's issues to circle back or you want to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, I'm glad to do that. Um, and I thank Shelley for putting the material together, to, to, together today for Metro North Railroad. So thank you for that. And um, I think that's it. Well, I mean, it, it, we're, we're rushing a bit. But yeah. just to emphasize, we should, uh, when we have the, in the transit, we'll have the, the chief here to talk about it. But we continue to. Uh, maintain, improve, say, uh, crime statistics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 2022. And I just, I will say it again and again, we're getting tremendous cooperation from the Transit Bureau of the NYPD. Chief Kemper has been a great partner. Um, um, is there anything else you need to talk about with respect to employee uh, safety and accidents? Um, just will say that that employee safety and accidents, and as well as customer, they t they either trend they're trending improving, trending down slightly, or they're largely flat. Um, so that's a, that's good. Um, but um, you know, we, we, the team, as Shelley was going to highlight, was about what they're doing to try to get after those trends and and, and improve them. And the electronic uh, uh, security update uh, would pile on to the what the chairman just talked about in terms of how we improve security in the system by. And the many systems, very robust um, uh, programs out there for whether it's um, cameras, AI, <laughs> um, uh, LIDs, TIDs, and, uh, and other devices that are going into the system and the statuses of all those programs is in the, is in the update. So, uh, Mr. Albert, I would like to hear from Ms. Prettyman for, for just a moment. Uh, are we going to make a presentation? She has a presentation. Go ahead. I, okay. I know we're we're, we're going to we're short of time, but I I don't want to. I can certainly um, keep it keep yeah. it brief in the interest of time. Please. But Mr. Fazio, I believe you have the clicker. If you don't mind, if you, you can just the clicker be moved. That's fine. 
While he brings that around, I'll just, I'm um, going to give you a brief overview of the Metro North Railroad System Safety Program. Thank you. And forward and back. I should be able to do that. Okay. Okay, there we go. So there are five divisions in the Metro North Office of System Safety. I'm going to go over four of them very quickly. A little more detail on field safety operations and investigations, because as, as uh, Pat said, um, I want to give you a sense of the key efforts we have in place to prevent incidents and drive down those customer and employee injury rates. So the other four divisions, emergency management and fire safety, that includes emergency management planning and preparedness, EMS and fire response. I want to mention this quickly. It's not just the GCT Fire Brigade, which I think you're all familiar, is uh, uh, covering uh, GCM now, Grand Central Madison, as well as Grand Central Terminal, and the system-wide fire marshals in chief. Fire prevention programs, code compliance. We have the risk reduction group with hazard analysis, industrial hygiene, environmental compliance, and safety engineering. Safety Analytics and Initiatives it handles all of our data collection and analysis, including reporting internally and externally, including to the FRA, and our TRACS Public Safety Education and Outreach Program. And finally, federal and company drug and alcohol testing, that's pre-employment, post-accident and incident, and random testing and contractor oversight for the Part 219 plans. So what I really wanted to say a little bit more about today is field safety operations and investigations, and this is still just highlights of the programs that this area covers. And I'm going to dig in most into the incident investigation process, so that's the process for investigating every customer incident and injury, every employee incident and injury, and property damage report. They also conduct operational incident investigations, and there are a few other programs there I'll say a couple words on. So for incident investigations, they mentioned each incident and injury is documented and investigated. We have field safety managers who are assigned by district and in partnership with the investigators. They uh, work with operations to um, investigate as according to the incident and whatever it may require. It, the investigation may include interviews, site inspections, equipment inspections, procedural reviews tool and equipment reviews. Obviously, any immediate actions that are needed, those uh, remediations are done um, as appropriate. And while the report is being completed, system safety staff review the status daily to close out. The, the investigations result in identification of root causes, contributing factors, corrective actions. They're identified and documented for follow-up. And one thing that we've recently reinstituted, which we found is really helpful, is rotating biweekly meetings with the operating departments to review key cases in depth. So the analytics group will look at recent incidents and injuries and look for patterns or trends or, or light cases, and we'll sit down with one of the operating departments and really dig into those to make sure that our investigation process identified everything that we can be doing to prevent future incidents of those kinds and, uh, again, drive down those, those rates. So the findings and trends are also shared with operations training so they can incorporate that into ongoing operations training. So for significant operational incidents, um, this is, for example, um, if we have a mainline or yard derailment or a blue signal violation or critical operating rule violation, if we have an incident any of that sort, we lead the investigation of those incidents through a committee process. So system safety investigators report on scene to initiate the invest to initiate the investigation with the operations leads. So they document everything on site, conduct interviews, audio and video reviews, again documentation and procedure reviews in partnership with operations. And obviously operations will also, will also perform equipment and infrastructure inspections as appropriate. An interdepartmental committee is convened to review all of the evidence and determine, again, the root causes, contributing factors, and establish corrective actions. And we, cr we track those corrective actions through closeout. So again, it's important that we don't just conclude the investigation, but we look at the findings and trends, and we share those and review those, communicate them in multiple forums, including our district performance reviews, our quarterly safety focus events, our labor management committee meetings, and again, we share those always with operations training so we have a feedback loop to make sure that the most recent safety trends and um, findings are included in our training programs. Other key programs and initiatives, we have the Roadway Worker Protection Audit Group. So through this effort, uh, groups of managers from operating departments, operating rules, operations training, and of course system safety will dedicate an entire shift 
to going out and about the right-of-way to conduct audits for compliance with the roadway worker protection rules and our safety rules. And a, a really important part of that is that interactive discussions are held with the employees on site about the rules and procedures to ensure understanding. We also, in our, our field safety group, conducts regular proactive audits and inspections of stations, yards, shops, and locations along the right-of-way. And they conduct periodic cleanups in partnership with operations, of course, of yards and right-of-way locations. And the district safety committees are actually one of the key forums where we don't not just review um, safety concerns in the district, but we also uh, plan, review and, uh, those uh, inspection findings and plan the cleanups. And finally, I wanted to mention the Grade Crossing Safety Improvement Program, which I understand is on our agenda for our next Safety and Security Committee meeting, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that. So I, I know that was very, very quick. In the interest of time, um, the full presentation is in the book. I, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Mr. Brinkman. Okay, actually, this is a general question for both of you, because mm -hmm. um, I've always learned never assume anything. Uh, oh, do both railroads have similar programs? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, you share best practices. Yes, we absolutely do. Excellent. I think that's that's very impressive what you're doing. Thank you very much. Ms. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning. I may have missed it, but I assume that the findings that you do um, identify, you use it for future trainings? Absolutely. That's one of the um, important partnerships that we have is with operations training. And they're, they're part of those... Um, roadway worker audits that I mentioned, they're um, included in the district safety committees. We meet with them monthly, separate from all of that. So yes, it's an ongoing conversation to ensure that. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I would just add that one of the other important features of safety uh, in our system is the, is, is the inspections of the rolling stock that yes. take place daily in many cases and also on quarterly cycles. And Kathy Rinaldi and I were out at Croton Harmon uh, on Friday um, touring with Assemblymember Zabrowski, who is actually the new Corporations Committee chair and is an important, uh, obviously a very important uh, uh, member of the legislature for us because he's the Assembly side uh, committee chair overseeing the MTA. And what it really highlighted was how the new Croton Harmon yard is enabling a really first-class modern approach, how much more, uh, uh, how, how it facilitates our inspections and our whole safety process to have a first-class facility. And the, so it sort of reinforces how investment in capital, it doesn't always seem self-evident, but investment in major capital projects like the Croton Harmon Yard actually supports a first-class safety management program, and, and we've got one at both railroads. Um, I'm going to bring us to a close because we're a couple minutes behind, but I, I just wanted to note, I mentioned before the transit police of the NYPD, but our own MTAPD have been doing an extraordinary job uh, on the railroads. And um, something that we've both been fighting for hard uh, took place at the end of last week, which was the first transit ban of somebody who uh, committed an assault on uh, one of our employees. Um, that individual was banned from both railroads. We initially because of the way that the statute was worded and, and the judiciary was interpreting it, there was, in a couple of cases, some confusion about how the ban would work. But there was a ban entered uh, against an individual who, who committed an assault against one of our employees. And we continue, when we see this and other ban-eligible crimes, to pursue it. And I just want to uh, credit Chief Mueller because he has been uh, on, on it uh, day after day and making sure that, that, that folks who move against our employees improperly uh, are appropriately penalized. So with that, Mr. Testatore. Very, very quickly, so very, we appreciate it and the Chief's efforts and the message to the public should be if you assault a transit worker, you're going to get banned from our system. That's what has to be the takeaway from this. You hurt an employee at the MTA, you don't get to ride the MTA. Amen. Thank you. Well said. Um, all right, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Any opposition? We are adjourned. Thank you. I actually love what I do. This is my 18th year on the railroad. 
I love instructing, which is what I'm doing now. I'm instructing student engineers. I love operating as well, so when I can, I still do operate training, and um, it's just a great job to have. My name is Inade Maruga Sr. I'm uh, currently a locomotive engineer special duty instructor. I've been with Metro North for five years now. My name is Robert Sapari, and I'm a training officer, locomotive engineers for Metro North Railroad, and I've been with the MTA for 10 years. My earliest train memory is being in the train with my dad as he was operating. Uh, I'm second generation of railroad. We actually operated around the same time uh, just before he retired, so that's probably one of my biggest memories. Responsibilities for a locomotive engineer are vast from dealing with your crews and having a job safety briefing to checking your equipment and making sure all your safety checks are complete. Safety plays a major role in what we do because of how many lives we're responsible for. One of the coolest things you get to see when you're up front operating as an engineer is you'll get the best views. If there's a 4th of July, you'll see all the fireworks up and down the Hudson. You'll see eagles fly in and dip in and grab fish and fly right next to your cab. It's cool to run the Yankees trains, especially when they win. See all those Yankee fans out there to be able to bring them to and from the game. To just be operating a train through Harlem, to look on both sides and see the buildings and everything, it's just, it's just a great scene. Knowing that my work is essential to keeping this city moving is a, a sense of great pride. It gives me great satisfaction knowing that I'm getting thousands of people to their destination safely and they're relying on me to get to work. I'm an engineer and I run trains as an essential employee moving essential employees through the pandemic to be able to bring doctors and uh, food workers for us to be able to get them to and from their job safely take a great sense of pride in being able to do that. I take pride in my job now and I really enjoy it. I am glad I became an engineer. It's an amazing job. You know it's a lot of responsibility but at the end of the day, when I go home, you know, I'm happy with what I've done for the day at work. I know that I have a great job to come to, and I'm grateful for it. Sometimes the public may call us train drivers. Honestly, it doesn't bother me because I know they don't know. My name is Keisha Cole. I'm a train operator, and I've been with MTA for six years. I work on the seven line. It's approximately 21 stops from Main Street to 34th Street, and it takes about 36 minutes from end to end. My name is Jim Van Name. I'm a train operator for New York City Transit. I've been here about three and a half years. I operate the train on the Q line, which end to end is approximately 44 stops, and it takes me about an hour to complete. My earliest train memory is I was a kid. I got on the F train with my mom. The first time I was on the train, I was excited. It was fun. I was raised on Staten Island and my friends and I used to take Staten Island Ferry over to the city and we used to ride the train all over the place. Uh, that's probably where I got my first love of the subways. As a train operator, there are two different ways you can pick up your train. You can pick up your train in the yard as a put-in, which means you okay your train for service and bring it into the terminal station, which is the last stop on the train line. Or you can actually pick it up from the terminal station. When preparing my train for service, I do various checks to make sure it's safe for myself and for the public. Once my day starts, I have about three round trips. I take passengers from Main Street to 34th Street.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> do we uh, have any uh, speakers today? Good morning, Mr. Chair. We have three members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that, in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware of the clock in the front of the room and the warning light you will see, reminding you that you have 30 seconds left to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Christopher Greif. Following will be Murray Bowden, followed by Alita Dupree. Good morning. I'm Chris, good morning, everyone. I'm Christopher D. Greif. I'm sorry I'm not there, but today I'd like to remind about motorcycles and these legal uh, RVs. They are traveling on our bridges and tunnels. And right now, the concern of safety is, is as we work with our local precinct NYPD, we need, we need the MTA to also please work together to get these legal motorcycles and these RVs out of danger. As people are traveling on the bridges or tunnels, we're trying to travel, we pay the tolls, we go through them, but we do need to be more safety and more carefully and be more alert. I'm asking the MTA to please help us out to get these legal motorcycles and on these RVs out of danger, out of the streets, out of the neighborhood, and maybe understand that there is a track for them, there is a race track for them, but not on our local streets as well. And I hope to see more proper lighting and more cameras in these bridges and tunnels to make sure that people are following the rules and regulation for safety when we travel on these bridges and tunnels. There are too many accidents, too many vehicles that don't follow the speed instructions and they need to do that today, as well as making sure our walkways are truly ADA accessible and proper lighting is up there. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Murray Bowden, followed by Alita Dupree. Thank you. Morning, Dave. Good to see you. Kathy. What you just read to me was, <clears throat> we have a two-minute limit here to follow the rules and stop speaking after two minutes. Well. Bridges and tunnels with the lines on a road, the other things they do. We have buses that now <clears throat> look for people. They need to see a yellow line on the left and a white line on the right. Somebody once taught me that consistency is safety. The buses have to calculate where they are and see the people. But you're using rules and regulations that go back to 30, 40, 50 years ago that were never updated. <clears throat> You've got all kinds of technology going on, but you never corrected the lines from 30 years ago. So if you want safety, I guess it's uh, Mickey McGuire said you follow the money. The 3M Corporation went and put all those guide signs up there in high reflectivity so they could sell a lot of reflective material. You can see the sign, you just can't see the words. They point the arrows down. You can't line them up. If you gave us a sign that, on the, like they have on the side of the road that tells us where each lane goes, we're not stupid, we can count. I designed with two other people the dotted lines for auxiliary lanes, exit lanes, you don't put them in. So until you or somebody starts to follow the law as currently written, why do you expect anybody else? Yeah, I know it's buzzing, I'm not done. Which law you want me to stop, but you won't follow the law? If you, if you don't follow the law, why should we? You Thank expect you. people to... No, I'm not Please done. conclude your remarks. I'm going to die soon. I'm going to be 90 in June. I may never get here again. You want to arrest me again? I'm here because the last time the MTA arrested me, the judge said, Mr. Bowden, case dismissed. Go back and do exactly what you did. So what I'm doing is under the direction of a New York City judge who 
when you brought the case and had me arrested, told me to continue to do exactly what I'm doing. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. Me again, be my guest. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. The next speaker is Alita Dupree. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning to the chair. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her and talk about bridge and tunnel today. Um, how do we build the best bridge and tunnels we can? And, and I think we are. Um, I haven't been on the bridges and tunnels in a while because uh, I don't have a car, but maybe I'll get to use the uh, express buses when I hopefully come to New York uh, coming up in maybe two weeks uh, and see uh, what they look like. Uh, hopefully we can get some new uh, LED lighting on them as um, uh, may already have happened. Um, I'm just thinking about the Bay Bridge here in San Francisco. They're doing a lot of work with uh, lighting on it, some kind of new project. And uh, easy pass recovery is uh, absolutely essential because the money that we use is uh, important to make sure that we keep these bridges and tunnels maintained. So uh, we have to keep working on our recovery efforts. Emphasize that whenever somebody operates a motor vehicle on a, on a public road, that there are privileges and responsibilities. So uh, thank you for continuing your work with uh, recovery. And in the agenda, I, I see something about the Nassau County uh, Bridge Authority, uh, Atlantic Beach Bridge. Uh, th this is long overdue. And I look forward to hopefully being a presentation about this and implementing it. Uh, because I think everybody uh, on any uh, toll conveyance anywhere should be able to use um, all electronic tolling. People don't carry money around like they uh, used to. And uh, it cuts down on uh, traffic and seeing videos of bridges without toll plazas. It just makes things easier. So uh, I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes the public comment. Paul, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and I happen to agree with uh, uh, the, la the last speaker regarding <clears throat> the speed and traffic flow with the easy pass. <clears throat> uh, I like to have a motion on the minutes from last month's meeting. Second. All in favor? A any questions on the minutes? Okay, I'd like to turn it over to President Sheraton. And Murray, keep going. Stay healthy. Thank you, Chair Mack. Um, there are no changes to the work plan for, uh, for 2023. Um, additionally, I've been advised that the fourth quarter 2022 diversity report for bridges and tunnels, which appears on page 56 of the committee book, will be discussed at the diversity committee later today. I'd like to start by sharing some photos of our agency's 90th anniversary commemoration from April 3rd. We had a great turnout and are pleased Commissioner Glucksman could join us that day and represent the board. It was truly a memorable gathering for BNT employees past and present. Archival photos filled the boardroom and the unique and compelling history of the original Triborough Bridge Authority, which later became the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority and now MTA Bridges and Tunnels, was shared with an engaged audience. I want to thank our program speakers, including MTA Chair and CEO Jano Lieber, Construction and Development Senior Vice President and BNT Chief Engineer Joe Keen, and the manager of the BNT Special Archive, Mary Hedge. A few days later, on April 6th, Mary and Special Archive Project Manager Nellie Hankins represented BNT at a virtual public presentation sponsored by the New York Transit Museum. The team treated viewers to a dy dynamic history lesson about our agency and its role in the development of New York City and the region, showing never before seen photos and documents from the archive. Thank you both for an informative presentation. Several weeks ago, I was pleased to spend time with our dedicated volunteers and donors at the BNT Blood Drive on Randall's Island. I was impressed by the effort and enthusiasm across all our departments to recognize and address this critical public health need. Thank you to each employee who donated life-saving blood and to the BNT staff who volunteered to coordinate this successful event. 
Finally, with the approach of Mother's Day next month, this is traditionally promised one of the highest volume traffic days for B&T crossings. It also signals the start of a seasonal shift in traffic as warmer weather moves in and recreational travel ticks up. The B&T workforce remains prepared and vigilant as always, monitoring our facilities with, with the expectation of higher and varied volumes throughout the spring and ahead to summer with safety as the highest priority. And as the nation observes the work zone safety and distracted driving awareness campaigns in the month of April, and as Governor Hochul, who also drew public attention to New York State's strong commitment to these causes, the BNT team continues its daily focus on these critical issues, as you'll hear from our department leaders shortly. BNT work zone safety initiatives are also aligned with the significant amount of construction that MTA C and D executes on BNT facilities. Our C and D partners are in close communication with BNT leadership and our facility teams regarding the need for assistance and work zone speed enforcement to protect employees, consultants, and contractors from unsafe drivers. Starting this month, instead of the operations and safety data we've reported on in previous committee meetings, we plan to highlight various themes throughout the year, which our BNT leadership and staff are focused on to hopefully give you a deeper view into the workings of BNT. The traditional reports are still included in your committee books, and our department heads are here to answer any questions you may have. I'll now turn it over to Assistant Vice President for Safety and Health, Pashko Kamaj to begin our presentation regarding BNT's coordinated <coughs> approach to work zone safety and distracted driving. Thank you and good morning, board members. As Interim President Sheridan stated, we draw, we draw special attention every April to raising awareness regarding work zone safety. National statistics indicate that crashes within designated road work zones increased substantially in the past decade, increasing the relative risk of injury to workers performing maintenance on the roadways. Controls to prevent work zone intrusion, intrusions are routinely emphasized to employees and our customers. I am pleased to report that BNT practices have largely been effective in limiting work zone incidents on our facilities. BNT Vice President Chief Safety Officer Eric Osnes recently addressed our maintenance workforce for an interactive safety talk, as you see in a photo below. Controls designated to modify driver behaviors through principles outlined within federal guidelines are reinforced to our employees during tool toolbox talks. These components consist of communicating with our customers, alerting them to work, zone, work zones ahead, workers' use of protective re reflective equipment, and establishing driver cues to allow for smooth redirection of travel to accommodate roadway operations. Planning is paramount as these components are modified based on site-specific conditions such as speed limits and roadway geometry. These principles are also, also serve as conduit between B and T contractors and C and D management teams so they may evaluate and enforce their work, work zone designs on our roadways. April is also designated as the National Safety Council to fo focus awareness on distracted driving, which is a primary contributor to work zone intrusions. We have emphasized to our employees that the two are not mutually exclusive and that the communication with the motorist is key to modifying behavior. This was part of our field discussions to highlight challenges and the need to reinforce in place the roadway to overcome competing distractions. I want to emphasize that BNT employees who perform these maintenance, who perform maintenance on our roadways, perform their duties with the benefit of considerable experience in ex executing work zone and configurations. I will now turn it over to Charlie Passarella, Vice President of Maintenance, who will discuss how our maintenance employees interface with our customers. Thank you. Thank you, Kupashko. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. In addition to Safety and Health Vice President Eric Osis addressing our maintenance employees on work zone safety, throughout the month of our maintenance superintendents also held safety meetings at all our facilities with our maintenance crews with special attention given to work zone safety. Specific topics covered were proper cone line tapers to provide customers plenty of advanced warning to recognize an upcoming lane closure, proper placement of attenuated trucks at the beginning of the cone line with flashing yellow arrow board lights indicating the direction of traffic movement and proper placement of the truck at the actual work zone to protect all workers. Workers were reminded that under these conditions, they must always wear their protective gear, including high visibility reflective safety vests. 
The importance of staying alert when working on roadways was underscored, even when lane closures are set up properly. I would now like to play a short video clip which shows from a customer perspective what a proper cone line and work zone looks like. I will now turn it over to Richard Hildebrand, Vice President and Chief of Operations. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Pashko. Our interdepartmental partnership is evident in all we do. And on behalf of operations, it's an honor to work with maintenance, safety and health, and C&D on these important customer and employee safety initiatives. The final piece in the work zone safety puzzle is enforcement. One way this is accomplished is through active enforcement of vehicle and traffic laws and other regulations. When our officers observe a motorist committing a violation, they may issue a summons or engage in other law enforcement actions as necessary, authorized, and appropriate. Passive enforcement measures within a work zone, as you see here in this photo, may also be executed by strategically posting marked vehicles with activated emergency lights or by deploying directed patrols to our roadways. The intent of passive enforcement is to bring awareness to motorists that they must follow all safety rules while on our facilities. This is especially important when driving near or around an active work zone. Our bridge and tunnel officers, sergeants, and lieutenants play a vital role in ensuring the safety of our maintenance and contractor workforce who perform duties on or adjacent to active roadways. Enforcement also enhances safety during incidents such as collisions, disabled vehicles, and debris removal. Our teams are trained in quick clearance tactics of New York State's Traffic Incident Management Program, also known as TIM. This training equips our workforce with the knowledge and equipment necessary to respond, mitigate, and recover from roadway emergencies while preventing consequent incidents that may impede the restoration of normal traffic flow and safety. Enforcement of posted speed limits, the safe movement amongst lanes, distracted driving, and the New York State Move Over Law are part of our efforts to enhance work zone safety, not only during National Awareness Weeks, but each and every day. Under normal circumstances, speeding violations carry a heavy monetary fine and impose penalty points against a driver license. Not only can points increase the driver's insurance rate, but they all also may lead to the suspension or revocation of driving privileges. Here you see an, active, an example of active speed enforcement within a work zone at the Marine Parkway Gil Hodges Memorial Bridge. When our officers determine a driver is speeding in a work zone, the, ve the vehicle is safely interdicted and a summons may be issued to the operator. Fines and points uh, penalties for work zone violations are doubled. The penalties for work zone speeding violations may range from $90 to $1,200 and include an $88 court surcharge on top of that and 3 to 11 driver penalty points, depending on the number of miles per hour over this posted speed limit. As April pairs Work Zone Safety Week with Distracted Driving Awareness Month, our officers will be out in force to make the roadways as safe as possible for everyone crossing our facilities or working in our roadways. It's the mission of MTA Bridges and Tunnels to bring stellar service to our customers via a smooth, safe, and secure passage for each and every crossing. I thank you to our workers, our contractors, and all of our customers for banding together in this important effort. And this concludes my report. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding work zone safety or distracted driving efforts? Commissioner Brown. Yeah, um, well, I guess I'd like to compliment the cops and the operations department for um, the um, police interface on the um, work zone speeding and the, um, you know, and the, and the higher fine schedule. And, um, and I'm probably aware that uh, it's a big issue in Long Island now among the um, people in favor of speeding, whoever the hell they are, um, that, that it's, that there's a, um, you know, there's automatic enforcement that's set up around the work zones in Long Island where they just prop a, uh, camera up and, and shoot the speeders as they go by and they have, but they have a very low fine levels too to go along with it. And I just think it's much more effective what you guys are doing than what they're doing and uh, people will feel it more if they're pulled over by a cop and the higher fine schedule of course will um, reinforce how important this is. Uh, they had a horrible accident, um, shouldn't say accident, I should, should say crash I guess, uh, uh, last week in I believe Maryland or DC that killed 
you know, a dozen workers, and um, work zone safety is critically important, and uh, I don't know how your guys do it out there on the bridges. Sometimes people are very disrespectful the way they uh, go around the uh, workers. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Any other questions? Okay, Chair Mack, there are no procurements this month, uh, but we have one action item, which will be presented by Mike Minuni, Assistant Vice President for ITS and Tolling, and this is in regard to the Nassau County Bridge Authority Easy Pass Program. And I'd also like to recognize the Chair, uh, Sam Namias, and Executive Director Ray Webb, and they've also got some additional staff here um, from the Nassau County Bridge Authority. Mike. Thank you and good morning. We are asking the committee to authorize the interim president or her designee to take action as necessary to support the Nassau County Bridge Authority, NCBA, implementation of Easy Pass toll collection at its Atlantic Beach Bridge facility, which connects Lawrence and Atlantic Beach, New York. We are asking for approval so that prior to their implementation, we can take steps to enter into an agreement allowing them to receive back office system support from the New York Easy Pass Customer Service Center. Your approval would also allow us to sponsor the NCBA's affiliate membership in the Easy Pass Interagency Group, which consists of toll entities across 19 states that operate the Easy Pass Electronic Toll Collection Program. Our back office support of the NCBA Easy Pass implementation would also further promote Easy Pass market share in the region. NCBA's Easy Pass program would be fully deployed and managed locally by their staff. Any of our costs, such as back office services and staffing, would be reimbursed by NCBA pursuant to the written agreement. This action item is described in the committee report's staff summary on page 52 and is submitted for the committee's approval. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, uh, questions before we vote on it? <clears throat> yes. Um, hi. Hi. Thank you all for presenting this. Uh, I have a question about how reimbursement will work. Uh, is it, I mean, is there a certain timeline in terms of when reimbursement is expected? Um, substantial completion, halfway through? I'm just thinking about also, obviously, MTA finances. Commissioner, we will, we will look to a similar agreement that the New York State Thruway has with the New York State Bridge Authority, and the terms of that agreement will uh, indicate how we are reimbursed and the frequency. Okay, and is there any specificity to that? Um, I'm just not uh, aware enough of the details regarding that agreement. W what is the general specificity of that timeline? So, so we will, timeline? We will be uh, NCBA back office uh, will be out, any N NCBA back office cost transaction processing will be allocated uh, and reimbursed to MTA Bridges and Tunnels. And then any of our staff support will also be fully reimbursed to MTA Bridges and Tunnels. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> you failed to mention the Rockaways come, in, <laughs> come over to us as well. So uh, we're really tied in, and I think this is a great, great addition to the system, and uh, I'd like to take a vote on it now. Can I get a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, uh, is there anyone, uh, any questions, other questions on it? Okay. We'll speed it up for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further questions, this concludes B&T's report. Oh, here I am, back again. <clears throat> Can I have a motion to adjourn? All in favor? Okay. Bye. Everyone have a good week.
My name is Winnie Estrada. I'm a car parents maintainer, and I've been doing this job for 10 years. I work out of Shea Yard. I was interested in helping the community, the public, so when our passengers get on the train, they'll see that I cleaned it. I'll feel good that I did the job, that they're comfortable, and they don't have to worry about the mess because we took care of it. Well, I always had a background in cleaning uh, with uh, janitorial work and also car detailing. Uh, so I came to the railroad and used my skills that I learned from there to help clean the train. I like uh, working on the train, uh, working with the equipment. I always enjoy cleaning, so uh, that's really it. <laughs> A typical day is uh, thorough cleaning here in the EIC dock where we take the seats apart, make sure the sides of the seats are clean from garbage, any newspaper, cans that are left uh, behind, we clean that up. Clean the windows, we take care of the doors, we make sure that the engineer's cab is clean and ready for him to go for the day. So we take pride in um, making sure we sanitize everything from the bathrooms itself and everything the customer put their hands on. You know, it's very important to make sure we take care of our customers here, we sanitize everything. My work is important because we have to make sure the trains are clean, especially in the times of the pandemic. We have to make sure the trains are disinfected and ready for all riders to be comfortable getting onto the train. There's a lot of anxiety going on right now with passengers and customers getting onto dirty trains. So our job is to keep everybody safe and keep everybody's head in the right place. What does an electronic equipment maintainer do? Paul Julian, electronic equipment maintainer. I've been in transit for five years. I work in the department of RSS, radio and security systems. Our responsibility is to ensure that the radio system is functioning very efficiently for that provides communication to the trains. It also provides crucial and important communication for the police in the system, the EMS in the system, and the fire department in the transit system. Also, the surveillance system must be maintained Therefore, we can have proper security and proper recording of activities in the subway system. The intrusion alarm system must also be maintained. These security systems are responsible for preventing and if it happens, to alert any breach, whether it's the breach of a door that has sensitive equipment beyond it, or whether someone enters the tunnel beyond the platform without permission. A key motivator in what we do is to know how important communication, surveillance, and security is to New York City Transit and New York City as a whole. That gives you a sense of duty and pride in doing what we do. Hi, my name is Ryan Motley. I'm a stock worker here at East New York Depot. I've been with MK Bus for one year, four months. As a stock worker, typical day in the job is I uh, issue parts to the maintenance facility. I process uh, transactions. I do express issues, inter-unit transfers. I also help we stock parts, we receive parts from different manufacturers, give them their respective locations. We do cycle counts to find any discrepancies within our inventory also. Here at the East New York Depot, which is the central maintenance facility, we actually process a lot of parts for various depots. Here in this stock room, it's a CMF, Central Maintenance Facility. Buses come in for major work, so we store bigger items, high dollar value items, engines, radiators, transmissions, generators, motors, because when the buses come here, they're here for an extended period of time to get a complete overhaul. So whatever buses that are active in our fleet right now, we have the parts for it. We also store cleaning products for our cleaners that are located in the depot to uh, help them get their job done. We help the maintainers get the correct parts needed for the buses to make service. You know, we have our regular chores of 
making sure that the stock room is clean, no tripping hazards on the floor. That's one of our daily chores as stock workers to ensure the safety of the operation in the stock room itself. In order to be a good stock worker, one of the best qualities you need to have, the top ones are good retention, safety, responsibility. You know, you want to have that kind of characteristic in you to try Good morning all. Do we have a quorum? I believe we do. How many we? Uh, council, do we have a quorum? Uh, given that we have a quorum, I'd like to uh, start the meeting. Uh, welcome to uh, the Joint Long Island Railroad uh, Metro North Committee meeting. Do we have any public speakers this morning? Yes, good morning. Uh, we have 10 public speakers registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Murray Bowden, followed by Jason Anthony. Morning. Um, four minutes, two speakers, two of them. Everything I had prepared to say today is rather irrelevant from what I learned at the last two meetings. The MTA has changed for the best, for the better. And if you all don't know it, I'll tell you, I was impressed by the information that was presented at the earlier meetings. So different as to change mentalities. Problems that I'm standing here asking about for years and years have been addressed very subtly, very quietly, but they were addressed. Everything I had prepared to say here today, I have to rethink it now. Yeah, I'm in a wheelchair, but I can still stand up and walk a short distance. But when I get tired, I have to sit down here. I also lose the words that I want to use. I can't get them up as fast as I did before. It's about time somebody around here enforced the law. I don't have to read you the law anymore. It's been said. We're talking about distracted driver and safety in work zones in the last meeting. You're not going to have safety until you, somebody here, takes responsibility for the idiocy of having flashing red lights and traffic lights on the same pole in Danbury, Connecticut. You can't make up the rules that you think a red box in the cross on a railroad crossing is it makes any sense when the standard is cross hatchings of white used all over the city, all over the state. Why your engineers think they can make up their own laws? Because we think it's better. We had that thing called the manual uniform traffic control devices. Yeah, does it apply to Roaring Brook Crossing? Of course it does. You can't make up your own rules, which is what you've been doing. And nobody's called you on it. You break the law because you feel like it, and you ignore the federal manual that goes all over the country. Why do you do that? Well, I don't know. We've always done it that way, and we're not about to change. Well, there are changes coming. And let me reiterate 
what I saw this morning negates everything I wrote to say today. Change is here. And if you don't know it, get off the board, let somebody else take care of it. We can't afford doing it the same way we did it 50 years ago. The line's on a road. My watch is yelling something at me, I can't tell what. The line's on a road. Send a message, we are not obeying the law. Drivers know it. If you don't do it, obey the law, why should they? It's required that the lines on a road be seen all the time. You don't bother painting the lines on a road so the people don't know where they're going. You want safety? Be consistent. I was taught that a long time ago. Consistency is safety. Do the same thing everywhere else. I can't do it. I'll be 90 in June. I'm failing. I can't find the words. I had to ask people who they were this morning. All kinds of people were extremely nice to me here. Unbelievably so. Thank you. I couldn't do it without your help. But to go forward, I'm finished, guys. I'll be dead soon. Some of you young people are going to come in and say, while we've been doing this for years and years, maybe we ought to do it that way. Out, out in Long Island, in East Hampton, there are six gate crossings. When a train blows the horn down the road, nobody knows which of the six crossings it goes to. Well, we've always done it that way. We blew from, the plates come down. Why don't you sound the horning only at the crossing that they're using? Why? Well, we always did it the other way. So everybody ignores the train horn because they don't know which of the six crossings we're using. Simple little thing. Who's in charge? If you can't get it fixed, then fire that whoever's in charge and get somebody new who, who's willing to obey. Mr. Bowden, please conclude your remarks. The next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Kara Girl. Two minutes for each meeting. Uh, good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Samuel. And good morning to the rest of the joint committee meeting. Uh, Jason Anthony, uh, just coming back from Orlando, Florida, which I discovered a uh, sun rail. Uh, I wish that our beloved uh, Luan Rebel, which is, has a birthday today, 139 years, uh, I wish that ha it should have multi-language multi announcements aboard trains because Sunrail has announcements aboard its trains in English and Spanish, believe it or not, uh, because... Sunrail, which is is a younger system, which is uh, travels four counties in Central Florida, has announcements on stations and on board trains in English and Spanish. I wish that Long Island Railroad will do the same. Uh, let's talk about service. Even though that that. Five minutes away from Atlanta Terminal, Brooklyn, I'm still neglected from service from the Far Rockaway branch and the Long Beach branch. Even though that I have service on the Babylon branch and Hempstead branch. Uh, Kathy, let's at least have one train from the Far Rockaway and Long Beach branch because if I'm going, let's say, to Valley Stream, I don't need to change trains at Jamaica because if we have the Atlantic uh, ticket, uh, let, I will want to take advantage of it. Let's go to Metro North. Uh, same uh, thing. Uh, if I want to buy a city ticket, we have this uh, issue since city ticket was introduced 
I want to travel, let's say, from Grand Central to Woodlawn. We have this conflict that we have C ticket for five dollars and off peak for seven seventy five. Which uh, off peak option I should pick? We're still seeing that option on the eTix app. And we should have multi-language options announcements on station and on board trains at Metro North. And for our friends of West of Hudson, we should uh, keep our ongoing dialogue with New Jersey Transit Rail Operations Inc. Because on 2025, I heard on their board meeting on Wednesday, they're going to have a fiscal cliff, and they're even considering congestion pricing, even though that Governor Murphy said publicly that is, he is opposed congestion pricing. So, Kathy, we need to raise awareness to our colleagues in the western side of the Hudson that we need more service on the PASCAC and per Jervis lines for our beloved friends on the western side of the Hudson. So that's all I have to say for this month. The next speaker will be Kara Girl, followed by Yuki Endo. Good morning, I'm Kara Girl, Planning and Advocacy Manager at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. First, happy birthday to the Long Island Railroad. Almost two months into full service to Grand Central Madison, riders in the railroad are still adjusting to the new schedules. With multiple rounds of tweaks and improvements since February 27th, we appreciate that the MTA and the Long Island Railroad are looking for opportunities to solve the most glaring issues, including adding more service to Penn, lengthening trains, and increasing peak service to and from Atlantic Terminal. As PCAC and LARCC have said from the beginning, listening and responding to the concerns of riders is key to ensuring that everyone can benefit from this major investment in the railroad and in Long Island. That's why we published a survey earlier this month available at PCAC.org to better understand the major issues commuters are still facing. We hope the information we're compiling on what riders like, dislike, and their suggestions for improvements will help inform decisions when it comes time to the next, for the next round of major adjustments. Many comments so far have focused on bringing back timed connections. It's clear that commuters have been regularly inconvenienced by narrowly missing their connecting train and needing to wait 20 or 30 minutes or more when they previously had timed connections or didn't have to change trains. While on-time performance is improving, having trains running even a couple of minutes late can add close to an hour when connections are no longer held. Our survey has also shown some positive results. Commuters heading to the east side have a faster trip and appreciate the one-seat ride to the east side. As time goes on and more riders visit Grand Central Madison, we're confident that you'll quickly reach the next ridership milestone after last week's millionth trip. We're also glad to hear that Mets Willits Point will have 24-7 service, all the more reason for the station to be made fully accessible. We hope that the funding model similar to Elmont UBS station can be used to take advantage of the extensive private investment in the surrounding area. We hope you'll continue to, to monitor rider concerns and make ongoing adjustments. Riders hold the key to unlocking a better Long Island Railroad. Thank you. The next speaker is Yuki Endo, followed by Deborah Greif. The next speaker will be Deborah Greif, followed by Carlton D'Souza. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Okay. My, as I said, my name is Deborah Greif. I am a member of the Long Island Railroad Metro North ADA Task Force. I also, as you know, I am a person with disabilities. Kathy, I want to compliment that the Metro North CARES is now doing as well and respectfully as the way the Long Island Railroad CARES does. It was a pleasure that when I had to go up to Connecticut, the assistance I got from the Grand Central step was fantastic. 
They also made sure I didn't sit next to a bike rail, which I, in the area, I'm very happy. And also when we were in Connecticut, they wouldn't let, they made sure that before we left, that we were, that I was safe as well as my son and that we knew which way we were going and going home, they were just the same way. That's what Long Island World Cares does when I get into Jamaica and they help me sit me where I can when I have to wait for my accessory to go back to Brooklyn. Yes, I could do it in Brooklyn, but the problem is there's not enough parking spaces for the accessory, which is really New York City DOT's fault, not the MTA. So what I would appreciate is if we can get together and work to make sure DOT gives more true accessory bus stops at all your stations that are, will get can get accessory and also the same out in Long Island, up in Westchester, as well as Connecticut too. They all have kind of accessory. So I'd appreciate if this can be done for both railroads, it would be a major help. And again, keep up the good work with the the CARES programs, it's fantastic. I have used them. Thank you. The next speaker is Charlton D'Souza, followed by Christopher Greif. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to speak about uh, Long Island Railroad first for the first two minutes. Um, so good morning, everyone. Charlton D'Souza, president of Passengers United. And I have to tell you, for the last nine and a half weeks, we've been getting so many complaints from Brooklyn Long Island Railroad riders and also teachers, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, many of them who live in Long Island and work in Brooklyn or work in East New York who have been affected by the shuttle trains. The shuttle trains have really ruined uh, the commutes for so many and it's turned into a nightmare. And why do I say that for? Because we at Passengers United were the first to predict that the rush hour schedules, the shuttle schedules would be a disaster. And we were correct, even though the MTA doesn't want to acknowledge that. And passengers have told me that they've lost faith and confidence and confidence in Kathy Rinaldi. And I'll just say it for that. And I hate to say that, but it's what it is. And people are not happy with what's going on. And so we're having a rally this coming Wednesday outside MT headquarters. We have a petition going, we have several petitions going, and we've also reached out to an attorney um, to file a class action lawsuit against the Long Island Railroad. This type of discrimination, because it's clearly discrimination when riders are paying, when Long Island Railroad riders are paying the same fares um, as Grand Central and Penn Station customers, they should be able to get a fast, speedy ride, not go on M3 cars that are breaking down. And on Friday or Thursday, four trains broke down, four trains during rush hour that impacted people because the train was stalled in the tunnel. That is unacceptable. Um, so I would like to speak uh, on Metro North issues now, if I can, for another two minutes as part of my Metro North time. Thank you. So with Metro North, there needs to be improvements um, with the city ticket program uh, because we've gotten a lot of complaints as well about the off-peak ticket. It's confusing to people. And the same thing applies to the Long Island Railroad. But what we're seeing with Metro North is we notice that their service is, you know, they're having some issues um, on the New Haven line because every time the bridge over there opens up in, um, in uh, I believe it's on the New York borderline, uh, they're having issues where the trains are getting delayed. And I know yesterday there were several New Haven trains that were delayed. It's unacceptable on a busy Sunday and a busy Saturday for this to be happening to commuters on the busiest train line in the Northeast. Um, completely unacceptable. I think communication could be better on the trains. It has to be. And, you know, we're getting a lot of complaints and I think the, there needs to be two different presidents for two different railroads because each railroad has complex issues and you cannot merge both the railroads together as is being proposed. I don't think it's gonna work out. And as far as the two conductors who were assaulted, I did wanna mention that uh, we are very sad that that happened. Uh, that should not have happened um, on the uh, Long Island Railroad. Um, 
and to all of our MT employees and our frontline personnel and MT police officers who risk their lives to do the job and serve us. You know, they need to be protected. And that's why a lot of these laws uh, that, you know, with the salts on the trains, um, you know, our state legislature, um, our elected officials, they need to strengthen the laws. They need to ban repeat criminal offenders on the system uh, to protect the employees, uh, the police officers, and, you know, the other first responders, the EMTs. And, uh, yep, thank you so much. The next speaker is Christopher Greif, followed by Andrew Pollack. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Christopher D. Greif. I'm sorry I'm not there, but I'm here in virtual land. But I do want to be, you know, very clear that, you know, with all these changes and all the, you know, things that we have to deal with, there's one thing a lot of people need to also remember is we have an app. We need to use the app. I have seen a lot of people have not used the app, but I will say this again, since we have our ambassadors, our Long Island Cares, they're there for a reason to help people with seniors and people with disabilities. And at the same time, also, instead of getting things, getting violent and getting upset about it, we need to work together and solve the problem, but not jumping into conclusions. The conclusions are, we're, we're in New York City, which Long Island Railroad and Metro North do run. And yes, there are times that bridge does get delays the trains, but it's it's a further down, not far from between New Haven and Stanford. But at the same time, we do need to make sure that safety of all our customers is the number one priority. Second, it's called, if you want something to be done, put it in to the MyMTA app. That's the main thing. But I hope and I agree with our for my uh, other colleagues that Mets Wills Point will be soon be ADA accessible so people can go to see the Mets and go to tennis and go to the New York Hall of Science as well or the Queens Museum. We need to make sure a lot of things are accomplished and I hope our elected officials are hearing me when I'm saying this, that we need the funding for accessibility for Long Island Railroad, Metro North, across the board. Thank you, everyone. The next speaker is Andrew Pollock, followed by Sally Wolf. Hello, Kathy. Can you hear me? Well, we can hear you. All right, perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, a couple things I'm going to discuss. So I'm very glad to hear that starting today, Mets Wallets Point is officially a full-time station. This has been something that I have been requesting the MTA personally for many years now off the record because I like to, I'm a big person who likes to take long hikes in the parks, of course. And now this is going to make it a lot easier for me to take my 20-minute hike through Cushing Meadows Park that I would normally do with the seven trains. So I'm very glad that now I have another option to get over to Flushing Meadows Corona Park now starting today. But I, I do agree with what the previous speaker said. We do need that station to become ADA compliant, especially because I work in a nursing home and I feel that, you know, our closest station is Auburndale and it would be a lot easier for my residents to have that privilege to use the Long Island Railroad to get over to the park as well. Okay, uh, next thing I wanna discuss is Mineola. So I was, I was at the Mineola station a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I'll go to the specific date. I was there back on April 4th. And the only disturbing thing besides the benches not being addressed is the narrow eastbound platform at Mineola. Guys, it is so narrow. You know, you could literally get pushed onto the tracks very easily. I don't know whose idea it was to put that gate there. All right, so that's got to be addressed. And one more thing before I wrap up my time. The central branch has got to be utilized more because I'm getting a lot of complaints from people in Mineola and Hicksville that they don't want to go to the South Shore just to head where they need to go out east. So hopefully the central branch schedules can be adjusted to the summer months. So that's pretty much it, guys. Once again, my name is Andy Pollock, and I'm from Passengers United, and I expect to speak at New York City Transit. The next speaker is Sally Wolf, followed by Alita Dupree. 
Hello again, I'm Sally Wolf, a resident of Flatiron. I always leave my thank yous to the end only to run short on time. So today I'm starting with my appreciation for your ear over the past eight months. Well, I know you didn't necessarily have a choice about whether I would speak. I do believe you have made the choice to hear me, some of you deeply, both with your minds and hearts. The times I could attend in person, I saw nods of understanding and empathy. And at other months, I've heard my comments occasionally referenced in your conversations after public comments. I first ended up here after sharing my idea with one board member, Neil Zuckerman, on LinkedIn last September. Neil immediately replied and invited me to sign up to speak. Kindled an already growing light in me, one in which I am certain that my path and purpose is meant to be one of advocacy not only for my needs, but also, and more importantly, for the countless others who desperately need accommodation and accessibility. My everlasting gratitude for your invitation and ongoing kindness. Lastly, my request, it remains the same for masked cars or areas of cars. I recognize big changes in this world usually occur after consistent small steps, and I'm committed to coming here to see this through. Since we last met, I went to Connecticut twice for Passover and for my nine-year-old nephew's stage debut in The Little Mermaid. While this auntie refuses to miss those life moments, my anxiety was higher on that train to Westport than ever before, and I almost had a complete emotional breakdown after Stamford. It wasn't rush hour, but it was unexpectedly crowded, and I had folks next to me in every direction. Even when I layered a surgical mask above my N95, I felt overwhelmed. The day before my blood work showed, my white blood cells were so low, my oncologist paused my medicine for an extra week. I could walk home from MSK, but not to Connecticut. You have had campaigns about not boarding trains feeling ill, but what about when it's the ride itself that makes us feel unwell? This isn't just about physical well being, it's emotional and mental well being too. Accessibility along all those dimensions matters. Surely we can do better so we can all feel safe. Thank you. The next speaker is Alita Dupree, followed by Yuki Endo. Um, thanks again to the chair, uh, Alita Dupree, for the record. She and her are going to talk about railroad today. Um, I'm learning all kinds of new things. Um, I'm looking to see what Omni will look like on the railroads. Well, maybe I have an idea. You know, I've been riding on this system called Capital Corridor it's in uh, Northern California. It's the longest commuter rail line in the country. And um, they have a pilot going on uh, with these tap to pay readers uh, in the cab cars. So I'm looking to see that um, come into its uh, full operation. Uh, and uh, so maybe that's what I'm gonna look like. It's gonna be on the trains and maybe not on the platforms. So uh, let's continue working on that. And uh, I did uh, hear about a new uh, climate plan coming out. I think the railroads are essential to it. Uh, with uh, more electrification, we can do that uh, because in California, uh, there's a system called Caltrain that's uh, finishing up their uh, 25 kV uh, electrified uh, railroad, uh, but also renewable diesel. Uh, Capital Corridor um, did a presentation about that at their uh, meeting last week, which I attended on Zoom. Uh, Capital Corridor is the Joint Powers Authority, so they have a board and, and they have meetings where people like myself can speak. Um, and I hope to get to Grand Central Madison soon and ride the long escalators and ride trains and practice uh, using these different uh, services. Uh, because I believe you can never have enough Grand, Sol Grand Central Terminal, a place where answers await those who ask the questions and people discover things bigger than themselves. Thank you. Chair, that concludes the public speakers for today. Thank you to all the public speakers. Uh, at this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Zuckerman. Second by uh, Lop uh, my co-chair, Lopez. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. Uh, now I hand it off to uh, President Rinaldi 
Uh, do we have any updates on the work plans? There are no changes to either work plan. Uh, and now uh, agency reports. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to the public speakers. Month two of the Grand Central Madison full service rollout brought calmer seas than the first month of the new schedules. The program stabilized considerably compared to the first month, and as promised, Long Island Railroad continued its comprehensive ridership and performance analysis with a focus on improving the overall customer experience through enhanced wayfinding in key areas, as well as adjustments to schedules and consist sizes where it made the most sense. Beginning April 10th, the Long Island Railroad made schedule adjustments on five branches based on ridership data. The changes ranged from moving station stops from one train to another to ease crowding to altering the run times of certain trains to help with overall logistics. Just want to call out some new adjustments. The 507 train from Penn Station to Port Washington was made to run express from Bayside to Great Neck, and Douglaston and Little Net stops were added to a train leaving Penn three minutes earlier. We also added cars to a morning pink Ronkonkoma train that needed relief. The following Monday, we removed the Hicksville stop from a pair of Montauk branch trains, added, added a pair of cars to a Babylon train in the early PM rush, and added a Seaford stop to the 530 from Grand Central Madison. And beginning today, we're adding cars to the 546 PM peak train from Penn to Huntington. With these adjustments, the incidence of trains operating beyond 90% seating capacity is way down from what it was during the first few days of the new schedules, and there's certainly much less overall crowding than there was pre-pandemic. But we want our customers to know that we hear them and that we never stop analyzing our service. Thanks to modern technology, we don't need a crystal ball, and nor do we have to wait weeks to be able to conduct in-person train counts to get our train loading information. Real-time train capacity data is at our fingertips, which means that we can get down to the business of analyzing data and finding solutions quicker than ever, relieving crowded trains when we have the equi available equipment to do so. Customers are indeed using this new service, and ridership is inching ever upward. Grand Central Madison welcomed its one millionth customer on April 7th, and Long Island Railroad across the board regularly surpasses the 200,000 customer mark, especially on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. After reaching that mark only twice between the first of the year and February 27th, we've done it 19 times since the new schedule went into effect. And in the week ending April 16th, the Long Island Railroad saw its highest seven-day average since March of 2020, topping the previous record that had been set just the week before. In fact, the four best post-pandemic weeks we've had have all taken place since March 13th. I want to take this opportunity again to thank our frontline employees. They've been helpful, they've been compassionate, and they've been patient throughout the rollout. They're a source of strength for our customers and for executive staff alike. And those employees behind the scenes are also inspiring and more than up to the task of turning ridership data and customer feedback into immediate fixes as well as long-term fixes, which is not an easy task if you consider how tight our train choreography has to be to keep our on-time performance what it is. With summer fast approaching, it'll be interesting to see how warm weather trends affect overall ridership and the splits between Penn and GCM. But true to the theme today, we'll be watching. Freeport is about to get a spiffy new canopy roof. Work to demolish and replace the roof began on April 3rd. Construction activity will be performed primarily during off-peak hours and is expected to last through the summer. As part of the same contract, the canopy roof at Massapequa Park Station is also being replaced. That work is scheduled to begin in July and continue through the end of the year. We're pleased to note that the lead contractor on both of these projects is a graduate of the MTA Small Business Mentoring Program, which aims to develop and grow New York State certified minority and women owned businesses, disadvantaged business enterprises, and service disabled veteran owned businesses. This creates a larger pool of diverse and qualified contractors who can compete for MTA construction contracts. Northport Station is also getting ready for its close-up as construction work on a new 12-car platform is well underway. Dating back to 1873, believe it or not, Northport featured a platform that, while not quite that old, was deteriorating nonetheless. This new project will blend the old and the new uh, as a new ADA ramp, aluminum railings, platform shelters, and a boiler house are part of the new amenities customers will enjoy. So you may ask, why a boiler house? Because the new platform will come equipped with an automatic snow and ice melting system 
that will help North, Northport customers for years to come. Substantial completion of this project is scheduled for the third quarter of this year. Early this morning, we wrapped up the second of two consecutive weekends of power, signal, and track support for the DOT project to replace our mainline one and three bridge over the Van Wyck Expressway. With this key span out of service, several branches ran on adjusted timetables both weekends. Work to widen the Van Wyck is ongoing, and the project involving our bridge involved one weekend to prep and another to push in the new bridge. This portion of the program resulted in the replacement of the western half of the span. The eastern half is scheduled to be replaced over two weekends in October. Opening day always has a special place in the hearts of baseball fans, but the Mets home opener on Friday, April 7th was anything but ordinary, as fans of the Amazons from across the region got a taste of Long Island Railroad service to City Field from GCM for the very first time. Fans on the inaugural train were treated to commemorative golden tickets, T-shirts, and some even got a chance to pal around with Mr. and Mrs. Met en route to Met's Willet Point. The fun never stops on the Long Island Railroad. I'm telling you. And more good news for folks who need to get to City Field and the surrounding area. Some of our uh, public speakers noted this today. Beginning today, Metz Willits Point becomes a permanent Long Island Railroad station stop with year-round daily service. We really hope that both Mets and Yankees fans make Long Island Railroad a Metro North train to the game options their go-to when they want to catch a ball game. It's cheaper, more convenient, and more comfortable to getting uh, to the station, uh, getting to the stadiums, excuse me, than sitting in traffic. Our government and community relations team has more on Yankees opening day festivities in our key performance metrics book. Of course, we certainly hope to provide service to both stadiums well into October and even November for a subway series, which we may have to rename the commuter rail series given all of the new train options available to fans. I'm telling you, see, I'm, I'm telling you, one right after the other, Neil, right? Got to keep things moving here, right? Okay. Um, it's, we strive for fresh around here. No. All right. In March of 2023, let's talk a little bit about ridership, speaking about fresh. In March of 2023, Long Island Railroad served 5.2 million customers, a ridership increase of 19.8 from last March, 19.8, percent from last March, and representing 69.7% of March 2019's ridership, which is the closest we've come to 70% of a corresponding pre-pandemic month. Turning to Metro North, Metro North served 4.87 million customers in March of 23, a ridership increase of 22.3% from last March and representing 68.6% .6 of March 2019's ridership. Just like its sister agency, Metro North has also been hitting high water marks in COVID era ridership with the weekend average record set on April 15th and 16th and the highest Tuesday through Thursday average set just last week surpassing the previous mark, which was broken only the week before. That three-day average is almost 74% of the pre-pandemic baseline. Total ridership last Wednesday, April 19th, was 195,086 riders, the biggest daily number on Metro North since the dawn of COVID, breaking the previous record, which had been sent just, on, just last Tuesday, the day before. More detailed analysis can be found in the ridership narratives for each railroad in the Key Performance Metrics book. So Metro North personnel did some mighty heavy lifting to keep trains and customers moving after a northbound debris hauling CSX train suffered severe mechanical issues in the wee hours of uh, Thursday, March 30th. A broken truck frame and axle on one of the freight carrier's cars call, caused more than two miles of track, damages, track damage excuse me, along the Hudson Line north of Beacon Station. Crews from multiple departments sprang into action after receiving the initial alert at 2.30 a.m working tirelessly around the clock to replace damaged ties, rails, clips, and switches and minimize customer impact. Thankfully, we never suspended service, but we were forced into a single track operation for 14 miles and modified upper Hudson service for Thursday and Friday. The damage began on the middle line of a three track segment extended through an interlocking a couple miles north of Beacon and then for another mile in two track territory. Unexpected track outages affecting service are never a good thing but in this case, the timing was uncanny as we had reopened the Track 3 platform at Beacon only three days before. Once the damage switch within the interlocking was replaced over the weekend, we were able to restore a two-track operation through Beacon, nearly eliminating the service effects to our customers. 
After roughly two decades of non-use, the Beacon Track 3 platform was restored to support the coming Upper Hudson Platform Edge Replacement Project and other state of good repair and emergency track outages. It took virtually no time at all to stop bearing, start bearing dividends and normal service resumed on Monday, April 10th. With the most significant damage occurring along the middle of the three tracks south of the interlocking, approximately eight-tenths of a mile worth of damaged ties still need to be replaced. However, in the true spirit of teamwork between the railroads, Metro North will be using the Long Island Railroad's track laying machine, the TLM, to install some 2,200 new concrete ties at the location to restore the track and expedite its return to service. The teams are currently coordinating with CSX and the vendor from whom the TLM is leased to move it on up to Metro North Territory for the replacement program to take place, which is expected to take place this coming weekend. Once the ties are replaced, ballast, surfacing, and commissioning will be required to restore the track to service by the middle of May. While the incident itself was beyond our control, I couldn't be happier with the response. Kudos to all those involved for their hard work and swift reaction. I want to spe uh, specifically recognize Mike Loney, whose MOW forces have been really active out there and doing a great job. And while I'm looking at like Mike Loney, I'm looking now at Anthony Gardner. Uh, this, month, uh, this month marks the final board cycle for our retiring Assistant Deputy Chief Procurement Officer, Anthony Gardner. Anthony leaves the railroad after 34 plus years of service, all of which have been spent supporting Metro North procurement. Anthony is a past Metro North President's Award winner, and he's been a fixture for so long, and he's done amazing work for us, not just in program administration, but in procurement policy and strategy. His trademark professionalism and affable and unflappable demeanor will be missed by all of us, and we wish him a long and healthy retirement filled with world travel, lots of excitement, and we'll, we'll miss you terribly, Anthony, and we want to thank you for your service. And if you would just come up. And now I'd like to end this month with the story of bravery and an unbelievably positive outcome to an incident that could very easily have ended in tragedy. In the mid-afternoon hours of April 6th, locomotive engineer William Kennedy was operating southbound Hudson Line train 2766 north of Terrytown when he noticed an object on the right-of-way that did not belong there. As he got closer, he realized that it was a very young boy on the tracks and he immediately sent out an emergency radio communication to all crews in the vicinity. Receiving uh, locomotive engineer Kennedy's alert was locomotive engineer Sean Lochran, who at the time was aboard northbound train 737, fast approaching the vicinity on the same track alongside an engineer trainee. He proceeded at restricted speed until the child was spotted on the track in very close proximity to the third rail. Once the train came to a safe stop, assistant conductor Marcus Higgins climbed down to track level, picked up the child, and carried him to safety on board the equipment. The crew of train 737 was then instructed to proceed back to Terrytown Station where they were met by the PD and EMS. As all of this was going on, Metro North signal maintainers Max Chong and Christopher Freina were headed to the area to see if they could help. En route, they happened upon who turned out to be the boy's mother and sister on a street corner crying. They stopped to ask if they needed help and realized that they only spoke Spanish. One of the two signal maintainers spoke Spanish and after a sleepy hollow police officer pulled up and spoke of a missing child report, it didn't take long to put two and two together, that they were all looking for the same child. They drove back to Tarrytown with the police officer and took the family to the platform where they were reunited. The boy's very relieved mother tells us that her son has autism, was nonverbal, and is only three years old. She was grateful beyond words for the actions of everyone involved. These fine Metro North team members embody the qualities we want our employees to exhibit while on duty. They were alert, they were responsive, they were knowledgeable, they were helpful, they saved a child's life. For removing this child from imminent peril and assisting his worried family, they are true Metro North superheroes. We salute all that they did to keep this child safe, and I heartily thank them for their dedication to the region, their dedication to their customers and the people that we serve. Unfortunately, the signal maintainers are not able to make it here today. I'd like to ask our hero train crew members to come forward this time to be recognized.
and that concludes my report. Thank you, President Rinaldi. Uh, and thank you for uh, the bravery of those workers and, um, and the fast thinking. Just goes to, it's another reminder of how much our uh, workforce does and how much we rely upon them every day. And I'm sure there's a lot of incidents that we don't hear about where, um, where our, our workforce is helping with public safety. And, uh, and now I'd like to ask uh, for our, our operations report from Rob Free. Good morning. Total on-time performance for the month of March was 94.1% and year-to-date as of March was 94.4%, both above goal of 94%. Five branches operated at or above goal for the month of March and nine branches year-to-date as of March. Major events which result in 10 or more lead trains, there were 23 incidents for the month of March, the most significant of which was a disabled train west of Jamaica on March 30th during the AM commission hour. This incident negatively impacted on-time performance by 0.1%. For our fleet performance, our MDBF for the month of February was 122,948 miles, and year-to-date as of February was 164,596 miles, unfortunately both under goal of 170,000 miles. For the month of March, uh, performing an analysis, we realized a, a, an increase in delays associated with our diesel fleet. Um, while during that analysis, we didn't identify anything systemic, our maintenance group is meeting with our planning group, trying to identify uh, maximization of our uh, contact time for the MV group. In addition, they're implementing a high-tech response group that will go out during the day to various yards, performing downloads, uh, performing thorough inspections and making repairs as necessary. For our service delivery, we completed 99.8% of our trips for both a month to date and year to date. Uh, and upcoming on May 22nd, we'll have a new timetable in effect, which will accommodate various maintenance activities in addition for our summer schedule. And upcoming work that will impact service uh, during the weekends of April 29th and 30th, May 6th and 7th, and May 20th and 21st. There'll be rare replacement and other maintenance activities in the vicinity of Valley Stream, which will be on the Long Beach and Far Rockaway branches. <clears throat> on the Far Rockaway branch, buses will replace train service. And on Saturday, May 13th, um, waterproofing work will take place on a bridge. Um, buses, again, will replace train service on the Hempstead branch. Uh, uh, please advise customers to look at the train time app and our website for updated schedule information. And that concludes my report, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to preface my question by saying um, I had I had a couple of people reached out to me to share their very wonderful experience using um, the new station to get to the Bruce Springsteen concert uh, at UBS. Um, so that's the positive. Um, but there was an article last week about some of the um, uh, you know some of the delays for the new gating procedure, which this is something we've talked about. Uh, so this is something you know and. and I, I, want, I want to say I appreciate very much that we're, as an agency, trying new and innovative ways to, to make the experience better and more efficient. Um, but I think it would uh, be a good time for, for you to give us an update on wh how that ha what happened and, and uh, you know, how the rollout was and how it's going to progress and what to expect. Okay. Um, as Elmont opened up, we went through various stages of our service, right? We were under old service plan. Half the platform was open, and then as we migrated into the new service plan, trying to see the dynamic of how that played out with the robust service and how customers would disperse getting to the arena and coming, uh, leaving the arena rather. So we, we needed to figure out how that would work and um, working with our labor partners who you know, felt strongly that we should implement the gating program, working with them, working with the arena partners. Uh, we implemented on the Bruce Springsteen concert a gating program. And again, while being new, it's, it's a new facility trying to understand exactly where we should put the gating, how many gators we should have there. It, it, it's kind of a new experience, right? What percentage of, of, the, of the total uh, attendance would the railroad hold? So these are things that are, we've been working through with the various parties. 
So in our lessons learned from the, the Bruce Springsteen concert, um, I'm happy to say this Friday night, we uh, expanded the gating program. We added more gate collectors there, more lanes for the customers to go through, uh, more people to sell tickets on site, actually also, uh, implementing a lane just for westbound customers because it's kind of the same way up to the platform. So um, we, it went very smoothly, I believe. We haven't really heard any negative impacts on it. We were able to communicate it probably a little bit better than we should have the first time. And we accommodated about a little over 4,000 customers for the playoff game on Friday, which represented about 25% of the total attendance, which really, if you look at other events, it's pretty significant. You don't really accommodate that many customers for events. So uh, overall, Elmont's been a huge success for both us and we believe for Elmont as well. Thank you so much for that. Anyone else? Jerry? Who's first? Don't fight. You pick. <laughs> Yeah, Rob, I just want to say that I do appreciate everything that you and Kathy have been doing to try and tweak the schedules the best you can, uh, play railroad car Jenga to try and get the concert sizes properly. But there's one thing that I think we really need to try and do, and that's try and reinstitute timed connections, if only in the evening peak coming home. Um, I've just been getting too many complaints about people, particularly on the Oyster Bay branch for some reason, um, they miss their connections and they have to wait in Jamaica for an hour. You know, after working a long, hard day, waiting in Jamaica for an hour is no joy. And uh, even if it happens once a week, it's, it's difficult. And you mentioned something about a new schedule coming out May 22nd, which I believe is going to be encompassing additional services or whatever for the East End. Um, if you miss a connection coming out of Grand Central, from Montauk, you're going to know about it. <laughs> you're not going to want those people wandering around Penn Station, I mean, Jamaica Station. So anything you can do to get PM peak service with timed connections so that people don't have to wait a half an hour or an hour in some cases for a connecting train would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, just Randy and I. Jerry, just some, I'd like to add to that. Um, understood. I think when the uh, the service plan was initially rolled out. Everyone was learning, adapting, even our own employees. And I think to a certain extent what was happening is that <clears throat> what, what we have on the, the app and, and on the boards is, right, transfer opportunities. What we, and we'll look at it. Maybe we can communicate this a little bit better. Um, I think what people really need to pay attention to is those transfer opportunities. There is a lot of time b baked into the schedule for customers to make those trains, and particularly on those branches that you're mentioning out east and Oyster Bay branch. The employees uh, within the Jamaica Station, the control center, uh, hold those trains if the train is operating a little bit late. You know, prior to that, even if it was a, a planned connection, if the train was, you know, a certain amount of minutes late, they would kick that connection out, so to speak, is what it was called. So now what they're doing is they're holding the train. So I think people need to, and again, we'll, we'll work on communicating a little better, is identifying those trains of w what to get on to know that there's an opportunity to get that train. And on those longer trip trains, the Jamaica Station Master is holding those trains so the customers could get them. So we'll work on uh, identifying those a little more. I think what happens a little bit, um, people may take a train that gets closer to the train that's due out or even a couple of minutes after it or even the same time, right? It's not, it's not a connection anymore, so to speak. So even if it gets in at the same time, it's not something that's identified. We need a little bit of room because we operate so many trains with trains departing Jamaica every two minutes that it becomes problematic if we start holding, you know, X amount of trains. But it's something that we could look at further and that we'll, we'll work on communicating better as well. Okay. Actually, I'm... I'm thrilled that you said exactly that because the regular commuters are starting to make the adjustments. Um, but the complaint that I'm getting is we don't have a schedule anymore. We have suggested times. And um, one case in point, someone, another Royce Bay person, um, the suggested time for her to leave Grand Central Madison to get to Royce Bay was 425. Her opinion was you didn't have enough time built into the schedule there happens to be a 418. So she grabs the 418. Now, the regular riders are making those kind of adjustments, but your once or twice a week rider who's coming in is going to grab a train, he might not know to do that, or he or she might not know to do that. So at, at least you have the right mindset, and I appreciate it. Just keep moving forward in that regard, I'd greatly thank you. Mr. McLaughlin? 
And then I'll come to you, and then I'm Mac. And yeah. Thank you. Um, is there any way we could get a breakdown of the uh, ridership percentage that goes to Grand Central Madison, New York Penn, Hunters Point, and Atlantic? Just like on a general average? Are you talking overall or peak? Yeah, yeah. I don't have overall, but generally speaking, okay. what we're seeing is, and, and which is exciting to see, right? We originally started off about a 70-30 split between the Manhattan destinations, but we're sl seeing increasingly uh, ridership to Grand Central Madison where we're seeing a 66-34 split. This is Manhattan destinations. 66-34? Um, yes. As particularly on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays when our ridership mm -hmm. is even greater, so it's nice to see, but it's been holding pretty steady. So um, I think customers are getting acclimated to the new service and seeing that Grand Central is a better And how is uh, the Atlantic option. and Hunters Point? Uh, Atlantic that? Terminal is about 11% of ridership, which is, in, in terms of percentage, that's what we were experiencing pre-COVID. While the numbers may be lower, percentage-wise, we're right where we were pre-COVID. There's days where it spikes. We and some particular days we accommodated as many as 9,000 customers on the Atlantic shuttle. And how about Hunters Point? Hunters Point uh, is probably around one two percent. It's it's lower. I, I, I don't quote well, me on that. Well, that's fine. Just an idea. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Uh, to echo what was going, uh, what was said before uh, regarding people missing the train, long waits. Uh, uh, the uh, legislators have reached out to me as well and complained about that. Uh, your program about <clears throat> delaying trains, look at what the airlines do regarding in-flights to hold flights as well. And that uh, will help solve some of the problems. Member Valdivia. Hi, thank you. So, so first, I'm excited to hear that you know board members. I think we all care about wait times, and that's important in the commuter railroads, and it's important in um, our subway and bus system as well. Um, so, congratulations on hitting a million. I just wanted to check because I didn't want to do the raw division myself. Um, so, what is the daily ridership count today at Grand Central Madison? What are we seeing? It's approximately about, weekday is approximately about 52,000. Okay, 52,000 passengers. And this is based on, not ticket sales, loadway, that what we're reporting on. We'd have to... I'm sorry, it's based on what? Loadway, the, the data we're getting from okay. the trains on people on board the trains. Oh, and that that's the system that helps, like, understand crowding and how many people Absolutely. are on the trains. So that's great. So that's, like, a really accurate count, fit, or maybe an accurate count, 52,000 passengers. So just taking a step back, you know, I just can't help to, like, notice that the M15, which is one bus, um, going down the east side uh, serves, at least in 2019, it served 46,000 people a day. So it's, like, really interesting to just, like, just taking a step back, really understanding, like, the, the size of the terminal, all the activity, all of the work it takes to deliver service for 52,000 people a day. And I'm just thinking of all the investment we make to deliver the M15 for 46,000 people a day. Um, so, so that's really interesting. And I also really appreciate you've been so on top of the Brooklyn shuttle um, in my perspective. So thank you, the, the Atlantic. And you said at one point it hit 9,000 people. Um, so that's more than what you typically experience, right? Yeah, so on average, yes, we're, okay. we're probably around 7,000 daily. And again, in terms of percentage, we're yeah. right where we were pre-COVID, so. Okay. okay, no, that's super interesting. So thank you. So um, what defines success in terms of um, the operational success of Grand Central Madison? Like how, what is the standard by which we're saying, oh, we're doing a really good job? Is it? on time performance? Is it, do we have a passenger goal count? Do we have that split um, that we're aiming for? I think you talked about the 66-34 split. So it's, an interesting, whoops, hello. so it's an interesting question, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, at a macro level, you, you know, I think overall, we want our customers to have a safe and reliable experience, right? So we want, you know, to, to, to be able to continue to deliver, you know, consistently strong on-time performance. Uh, we want conditions on trains to be comfortable for our customers. I mean, there's been a lot of conversation with respect to, you know, what they were used to pre-COVID versus post-COVID. Um, but we, you know, we want a comfortable experience for our customers. Um, and, you know, I think we want them to be uh, 
you know, comfortable with their options and understand what their options are. I mean, I think one of the things that we've been talking about with respect to this new service is the flexibility that it gives the railroad from an operations perspective, right? You've got that redundancy, and that's really important for the operators. But we want our customers to understand and appreciate that flexibility as well um, and to become accustomed to, you know, the optionality that having that second east side terminal gives them. Uh, and I also think just, you know, making sure that the schedule that we put out there kind of reflects the reality of how people are traveling. And I think, you know, Jerry spoke to that a little while ago. Rob has spoken to that. You know, we want the schedule to kind of give customers the service that they're using, right? Uh, and it's been a bit of a work in progress since the end of February. And, you know, we have other schedule changes as the, as the year goes on. And, you know, we want the data that we're getting with respect to how people are riding and when they are riding to, you know, kind of be an input into a schedule that, that, that is, you know, sort of successful and gives people the, the experience that they're looking for. I don't know if you have anything to add, Rob. No, and, and I appreciate that, and I just think for, I'm interested, like, are we shooting for a 50-50 split, or is it more we want to... We want to really monitor, and the 6634 is okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, so back, back, I don't even know how many years ago, I think 2014 or something, uh, the estimate was 60-40. Uh, and then we refreshed that. We did a little bit of work to refresh that in the 2021-ish time frame, and it remained 60-40. So that was kind of the expectation going in. And as Rob indicated, day one, we weren't seeing 60-40, and I think that that resulted in you know, some of the conditions that we saw in those early days of the service plan. Um, so you know, I don't know that I necessarily am looking to a percentage to define success, uh, because a lot has changed in the world over the last however many years. But uh, you know, we want whoever's riding with us, we want them to have a safe and comfortable experience. Experience. And I see Vinny over there, and we want our, our employees to have a safe and comfortable yes. experience as well, right? I mean, we right. want them to, you know, be out there and, and you know, able to provide the, the best possible service in, in an environment that's safe and comfortable for them as well. And I think, you know, us sitting here, you know, we know at the end of the day, um, the workers are the ones who face that customer frustration and, you know, what's going on. So I'm really appreciative of everybody here working pretty hard to make it happen. So thank you. Can, just, I just want to add to that, right? What's, <clears throat> what's important to remember is that the East River Tunnel rehabilitation work that's taken place and, you know, the, the benefit of having Grand Central to accommodate those customers. So while it's difficult to measure percentages right now, at the end of the day, we're able to accommodate those uh, customers into Manhattan. So I think once that work takes place, then we'll see the real success of building this terminal in, in the short term uh, of the, you know, people are able still to get to work into Manhattan. So I think that's, you know, in terms of short term, that's a tremendous benefit to it. So uh, briefly, I want to compliment Rob on a lot of the detail that he just gave us on multiple things because he's really spot on with it and it's factual and, and kudos. We, we appreciate. Uh, I just want to double back to the gating for one, one more thing. You know, w w that was a pilot, really, that Bruce Springsteen concert. So we fixed it immediately. And we really owe a great deal of thanks to UBS Arena because they helped us with some infrastructural stuff, busing at the, at the location. And the biggest thing was them posting on that big, beautiful scoreboard, in addition to train times at the end of an event, to remind everybody to purchase and activate the tickets. That Bruce Springsteen contest uh, concert, you know, People showed up, got to the arena, got to their final destination, and they hadn't purchased tickets yet or activated them. So they don't get through without that. And that's the key to it, and that's the, you know, the fiduciary part of it. And the, the two Islander playoff games after that, very smooth, very smooth. We had people there, so it, it'll be, it's the right thing. Great. Thank you. And it was, a, I was at the, one of the concerts. It was a great concert. And I did make note of the announcement. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the only complaints I got about the concert was, uh, and I, it's a good thing you compliment UBS was on the price of the food at UBS Arena. So, uh, and I have been, uh, Rob. Thank you for that. I have commuting, been commuting actually quite a few times into Grand Central, and I, I do have to say how nice it is to be able to get off the train and go to a beautiful, well-maintained restroom. Um, and at the risk of sharing too much, that has full-bodied partitions. <laughs> Uh, that, that I can actually fit into. So it's it's been a wonderful ex it's been a re it's been a really nice experience, and and I do appreciate the 90 second meditation I get going up the the long escalator. Um, with that, uh, Grand Central is a perfect way to pivot to uh, to Justin's report uh, for Metro North. All right. Good morning. The operations report begins on page 25. 
System-wide on-time performance for the month of March was 97.9%, above goal of 94%. Year-to-date OTP through March remains above goal at 97.8%. There were two major incidents that negatively impacted on-time performance during the month of March. On March 4th, a tree fell on overhead wires on the New Canaan branch, which resulted in 41 late trains. And on March 31st, as President Rinaldi mentioned, a CSX freight train derailed on the Upper Hudson Line, causing severe track damage, which resulted in 37 delays. The extensive track outages required to facilitate repairs will also impact April's on-time performance. Regarding the fleet, the MDBF for the month of February was over 363,000 miles, above the monthly goal of 175,000 miles. And not included in this month's performance report was the incident that occurred on Thursday, April 13th. During the afternoon rush, the battery charger power supply at CP106 in Mod Haven failed. When the voltage dropped below the operating limits, it shut down and stopped communicating with the office server. As a result, we lost all signals controlled by CP106. This required the RTC to talk all trains by the signals at 106. Given the time and location of the incident, over 140 trains were impacted. At this time, the exact cause of why the battery charger power supply failed is under investigation. We are also reviewing how much the temperatures for the day contributed to the failure. To mitigate any future issues, we change the battery charger power supply and monitor it daily to ensure no further issues exist. We are also working to install air conditioning to the unit by early May. We will have maintainers on site for any hot days prior to the AC being installed. This concludes the report, unless there's any questions. Any questions? Hey, thank you so much, Justin. Oh, oh, wait. Norman? Yeah. Um, regarding the uh, CSX incident, I'm, I'm, I mean, congratulations on all the work we've done here. Our people have done a wonderful job getting things back together. Um, however, I'm curious as to how the expenses for the thing were shared. Um, who's taking responsibility for it? I mean, I, you know, there's a value exchange, too. You're getting, in the end, we're getting new ties, so we get something out of it in, the, in that sense. But, you know, how are the, how are the uh, financial responsibilities for that incident shared? So all, all I can say, Norm, is we opened, we opened up a work order number and claims as involved in terms of uh, seeking reimbursement from CSX. So the accountants are going to fight it out later? Yes, exactly. And the lawyers, too. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Justin. Now we move on to the Long Island Railroad Safety Report. Good morning. Our safety report can be found on page 18 in your book, and we are pleased to report that our customer injury rate decreased from 3.03 .03 down to 2 per 1 million customers, um, and our employee reportable lost time injury has essentially remained flat, and we are at 4.16 per 200,000 hours worked. Also want to acknowledge, in addition to the um, accomplishments that were highlighted in the safety uh, report, uh, the safety book this morning, um, our highlight for this month is that we continue to partner um, to ensure that our emergency responder community receives the training that they need in order to respond to events. We have unique hazards on the railroad, um, in, you know, in the railroad environment. So we continue to work with the volunteer departments as well as FDNY to ensure that the responders get the training that they need. And happy to answer any questions anyone may have. I actually had a question related to we had uh, men made mention at our last uh, last meeting uh, that for the second time, uh, in this case it was a uh, Queens District Attorney uh, had exercised the ban, the system ban, uh, following you know Suffolk County DA retiring. So that's two times, um, and one I had a question, and this is I'm glad the chief is with us today on how how that's being you know enforced. Yeah, it's um, it's not an immediate arrestable offense if they are encountered within the system, which I would identify as problematic. Other people may have different opinions on that. Um, at this point, we're just being instructed by counsel to notify the respective DA's office that the person was uh, identified being banned and then being found on the train. Okay. So it's a bit of a circuitous process. One would say so. so I, I would say so. That, so that this is because this, this has been on my mind, this, and this was a big topic last uh, our last meeting about the safety of, of, of the conductors on the railroad and all of our MTA workforce. Uh, you know, the, the it begs the question about 
and it's great that we have this this ban, but it begs the question if there could be more effective tools, if, if there's everything, if there's more that can be done, you know, in my, you know, and I know it's been a big debate, and I'm, I'm you know, it's, it's our job, even if it's uh, opening a can of worms in the discussion, to bring it up because it is for safety. Uh, is there potential, you know, I don't think we could legislate this, but perhaps ask our legislators to consider if there could be, a, you know, a, a pre, you know, a pre-conviction ban, and 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 you know that because it, we know we, I think we're all familiar enough with the criminal justice system to know from the time, you know, someone gets charged with a crime, it can be many years, you know, before someone gets convicted, and in the cases where there's can be a clear, you know, threat to to our, our workforce, it seems that you know there's 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 definitely room for 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 more uh, for more aggressive policies. Yeah, I think, Mr. Chu, at the at the bare minimum, we'd want to um, assess what these bans look like and how many times we find people that have been banned, been notified by the court that they're not allowed to be in the system, are found in the system, because these bans are so new, um, it is uh, it's it's early to tell. Um, but based on one of the earlier bans that we had, I think the first ban, um, that individual was found repeatedly uh, on the system again. Um, so it, it is an issue, but I think the longer we have, we're to see, you know, how much efficacy do we have with these bans? Are they staying off the, the trains? Because um, the one thing we don't want to do, especially when the ban has resulted in an assault of one of the MTA family a conductor, is to have them see them on the, on the train and then uh, us just taking, making note of it and then, you know, uh, waiting till later to notify probation or trying to get uh, an appearance before the judge. Commissioner Lopez? Thank you, Co-Chair Chu. Um, just a general question. Have you had any conversations with the Westchester County DA, um, Mimi Roca, with respect to these bans? Uh, we talk to every single district attorney about uh, all the issues, so not specifically about the bans, but I can say the Westchester County DA has been outstanding when um, it comes to us, what I've referred to in the past is prosecutorial advocacy, where we see someone who has repeated bad behavior on the system, uh, a, a lengthy criminal history, um, a failure to appear counts that are high, which means they never come to court. So when those those issues come up and it would be similar to the ban, we reach out right away. We have one li liaison designated from the MTA PD for DA's Roca's office, um, and then she has a counterpart there. So we're constantly working cases, but um, we're going to be speaking with her shortly, so we'll probably bring that up. Thank you. Any other questions on this? I, I would just say on this topic, you know, it's a it's a robust you know debate. Public safety has been a robust debate in the state. Um, you know, we were very involved, in, and we're still very involved in this legislative process when it comes to our budget. Uh, I would say that we need to treat this as importantly as that, um, because it, even if we're well funded, even if we're operating at a surplus, if we can't take care of our workforce, you know, we're not very good at what we do. Um, so, Mr. Brown, Commissioner Brown. Yeah, and for the chief, really. Um, you know, over the years, the legislature passes, you know, what I consider kind of feel-good legislation where they're, you know, set out a special discipline, you know, uh, punishment standard in the event it's a, um, a railroad person or a, or a uh, uh, first responder that's, that's attacked. But have you noticed those? I mean, I always thought you pass it, but, you know, you really, everybody sh should not be attacked. But has, if you felt any sort of bump from that law or is or are these people that commit these crimes like this such fringe people you can't really put a put a you know a, a marker on them it's a great question mr brown it, it is such a vast system that it is often fringe people that that's the truth we do a very good job in the mta pd of really focusing in in our precision policing model with our top offenders throughout the system so we have you know when we see someone with and, and there are those people that have 60 and 70 contacts they may be quality of life contacts but they're still on our radar because we just don't think that these folks are using our system for what it was intended which is to transport people. And that's people, you know, being disorderly in waiting rooms and things like that. So between um, us, you know, staying in touch with the prosecutors, looking at people's criminal history, past history, what is the history in our system, what is their criminal history, um, it gives us a pretty good snapshot of, of who we should be focusing on. With all those metrics, it allows us to have uh, evidence-based data to say, 
you know, we're not asking for mass incarceration. We're not asking for everyone to go to jail. But when we do go to a DA asking for a jail sentence or a ban, uh, we have all the facts uh, at our disposal to, to be able to prove why that should happen. Beautiful. Thanks. Any other questions? Th thank, thank you so much, Chief. Um, and thank you, Lori, for your report. Uh, and that, well, now we'll pivot to Shelley for the Metro North uh, Safety Report. Good morning. So Metro North Safety Report is on page 28 of the committee book. And to summarize where Metro North stands with the customer employee injury rates, this compares the rates for the current 12-month reporting period ending February 2023 to the rates for the prior 12 months ending February 2022. The reportable customer injury rate increased from 1.94 to 2.17 per 1 million customers. And I do want to note that the more recent trend, the 12-month rolling rate has been dropping over the past five months. The reportable employee lost time injury rate over the two periods has increased from 2.07 to 2.22 per 200,000 working hours. For the recent trend there, that 12-month rate ticked up slightly in February after trending down for the prior four months. So at this morning's Safety and Security Committee meeting, I spoke on some of the procedures and initiatives that we have in place to prevent recurrence of incidents and to drive down these rates. I, I won't go over that here, but I just wanted to note that that presentation is in the Safety and Security Committee book this month. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? No, I pulled you a little out of order, uh, Chief. But Chief, uh, no, I'll pass it off to thank you, Shelley. I'll pass it off to Chief for his report. Thank you, Mr. Chu. President Rinaldi, good morning. Um, we had in the system for the month of uh, March 23, we had 22 major felonies. Um, the major driver of our felonies within the system continues to be grand larcenies. Uh, fully 59% or 13 out of the 22 were grand larcenies. Um, interesting to note that all of our grand larcenies were unattended property, every single one of them. Uh, 13 of those occurred in stations. Uh, or on platforms, and three occurred on the on the trains. The next closest major crime category was felonies, which there were five. We had uh, three assaults against police officers, one against a conductor, and then one against an EMT uh, personnel. So, but again, the, the the larcenies continues to drive our numbers. Still remarkably low, considering you know the the, the millions of customers that use our system every day. Uh, however, the unattended property is the issue. All 13 this month out of 22 total major larcenies were unattended property. you have any questions for Chief? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, Long Island Railroad. Oh, yes, Mr. Glass. How about some announcements about not leaving your property unattended? So are we doing that? Sure, I think we. I think we. St I think they're still in rotation, but uh, yeah, I think they're in rotation on both railroads. Yeah. Uh, yep. And now we move on to Long Island Railroad information items. Okay. So there are three Long Island Railroad information items: the 2022 annual ridership report, the May timetable change in track work programs, and, and Rob already spoke a little bit about that in the operations report, and the diversity and EEO report. Uh, there are two Metro North information items, uh, the 2022 annual ridership report for Metro North, as well as the diversity and EEO report. Uh, these are all in the books. Any questions on any of these? I, I have a comment. Yes. If that's okay. Um, so I, I just wanted to, uh, I, well, first of all, I appreciate the diversity EEO report that is uh, shared with us um, every couple of months. And I just wanted to reference to the incident that Kathy mentioned in her comments uh, with respect to the incident in Terrytown. I think that truly exemplifies how important it is for us, for the MTA to hire, not only bilingual, but bicultural um, MTA employees. Um, having someone who spoke Spanish, who was able to help that family who was under um, horrible crisis, uh, and being able to to reunite that, that the family with the child in their native language is such an example of, of how valuable bilingual and bicultural workers are. So I just wanted to uh, point that out, so thank you. And if I may, I just want to second that. I think it's so critical, and especially as it comes to the railroads, you know, the, there has been a journey as it relates to making sure that the workforce is diversified. Here we have a case where that diversity um, really was make or break. And so impressive, amazing, and would love to um, talk more about um, specific strategies to bring folks of color, folks with different language experiences into the space. Thank you. 
Excellent. Now we move on to the finance report. So the finance report for both railroads is in the book. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions on that. Um, and then we have no action items and neither railroad has any procurements. Unless anyone wants to introduce anything else, I'd like to entertain a motion to close the meeting. Motion. Uh, Glucksman, seconded by Mr. Bringerman. All in favor? Aye. So moved. What does an electronic equipment maintainer do? Paul Julian, electronic equipment maintainer. I've been in transit for five years. I work in the department of RSS, radio and security systems. Our responsibility is to ensure that the radio system is functioning very efficiently for that provides communication to the trains. It also provides crucial and important communication for the police in the system, the EMS in the system, and the fire department in the transit system. Also, the surveillance system must be maintained Therefore, we can have proper security and proper recording of activities in the subway system. The intrusion alarm system must also be maintained. These security systems are responsible for preventing and if it happens, to alert any breach, whether it's the breach of a door that has sensitive equipment beyond it, or whether someone enters the tunnel beyond the platform without permission. A key motivator in what we do is to know how important communication, surveillance, and security is to New York City Transit and New York City as a whole. That gives you a sense of duty and pride in doing what we do. What I do. This is my 18th year on the railroad. I love instructing, which is what I'm doing now. I'm instructing student engineers. I love operating as well, so when I can, I still do operate trains, and um, it's just a great job to have. My name is Inade Maruga Sr. I'm uh, currently a locomotive engineer special duty instructor. I've been with Metro North for five years now. My name is Robert Sapari, and I'm a training officer, locomotive engineer for Metro North Railroad, and I've been with the MTA for 10 years. My earliest train memory is being in the train with my dad as he was operating. Uh, I'm second generation of railroad. We actually operated around the same time uh, just before he retired, so that's probably one of my biggest memories. Responsibilities for a locomotive engineer are vast from dealing with your crews and having a job safety briefing to checking your equipment and making sure all your safety checks are complete. Safety plays a major role in what we do because of how many lives we are responsible for. One of the coolest things you get to see when you're up front operating as an engineer is you'll get the best views. If there's a 4th of July, you'll see all the fireworks up and down the Hudson. You'll see eagles fly in and dip in and grab fish and fly right next to your cab. It's cool to run the Yankees trains, especially when they win. See all those Yankee fans out there to be able to bring them to and from the game. To just be operating a train through Harlem, to look on both sides and see the buildings and everything, it's just, it's just a great scene. Knowing that my work is essential to keeping this city moving is a, a sense of great pride. It gives me great satisfaction knowing that I'm getting thousands of people to their destination safely and they're relying on me to get to work. I'm an engineer and I run trains as an essential employee, moving essential employee through the pandemic to be able to bring doctors and uh, food workers for us to be able to get them to and from their job safely, take a great sense of pride in being able to do that. I take pride in my job now and I really enjoy it. I am glad I became an engineer. It's an amazing job. You know, it's a lot of responsibility but at the end of the day, when I go home, you know, I'm happy with what I've done 
for the day at work. I know that I have a great job to come to, and I'm grateful for it. Hi, my name is Donna Charles. I am a station appearance maintainer. We basically maintain the appearance of restrooms, waiting rooms, platforms, sidewalks. We mop, sweep, dust, sanitize, salt. Ready to start, folks? We have quorum. We're good, right? Sharifa Sitan. Good morning. I'd like to call to order the New York City Transit Committee. Um, let's get started with our public safety announcements. Good morning and welcome to the uh, New York City Transit Committee meeting. Today we have 15 members of the public registered to speak. As a reminder, we ask all speakers to adhere to the MTA's conducts of rules and decorum. I'd also like to remind all speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to everyone, we will limit you to two minutes. Please be advised that there will be a warning beep when you have 30 seconds left to conclude your remarks. Our first speaker will be Lisa Daglian, who will be followed by Murray Bowden. Hi, good morning. I'm Lisa Daglian, Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. Today's book notes in March, overall subway satisfaction is 62%, down three percentage points from February. Service reliability decreased four percentage points, while waiting times, travel times, and overall line all decreased three percentage points. The correlation between reliability, wait, and travel times, and satisfaction is really telling. A real concern is that with, without reliable service, riders aren't going to keep coming back in the post-pandemic historic numbers we saw last week. Getting people where they need to go safely, reliably, efficiently, and affordably is key to getting riders back on board and keeping them coming back for more. We can't go backwards because platforms and trains are getting crowded again, not when we've all gotten used to the new model of on-time performance. I'm waiting 18 minutes for an F train won't cut it, but you know that. The strides that transit has made in the past year with the focus on the North Star of customer service and riders has been impressive, but not enough on their own. A concerted effort requires all the resources of the state and the city to bear as well. I had hoped that today we would be rehashing what the new state budget would bring. Call me optimistic, but I'll look forward to discussing that on Wednesday. The key to our region's future is ongoing, dedicated, and recurring operating funding for our transit network. You know it. The governor knows it. Our Senate and, and Assembly elected leaders Your know safety. it. Now we need them to bring it home in a way that none of us never had, in, in a way that we never have to have this conversation again. Reliability and frequency take funding. Consistent and targeted funding that comes off budget to the MTA and can't be siphoned off. And the city must contribute as well. Reliability and frequency also required equipment like the additional 640R211 subway cars and a system that has state-of-the-art signals and power, accessible and modern stations, and reaches everyone who needs it. Please That's why we need congestion pricing to come to be, to be put into effect where riders need it more today than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Get an extra second for the safety second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, our next speaker will be Murray Bowden, who will be followed by David Kupferberg. One moment. I'm here. I've been coming here since Virgil Conway was head of the MTA. Virgil on, didn't talk to me when he was here, but when he went to the thruway, he and I became uh, buddies up there. In all the times I've come here, today is probably the most important of all the meetings I've ever come to. 
the change that I've seen in the four meetings or three meetings I've before I got here and got to speak now has been spectacular. The way people in New York City have been treating each other, not just me but others as well, is in a positive way. So after all of these years, I have to, I say, not I have to say, I want to say that the change that has happened and is happening at the MTA is leadership for the country. I go to the, a lot of meetings, but what happened here this morning changes society. And you all need to be aware of the changes that are happening in the leadership for society that's happening here. I had things I were gonna talk about, but nothing is as important as you should all be aware that the people working for change here are succeeding. People have tried before and failed, but the people who are moving this place forward now are succeeding. It was incredible the changes I've seen this morning. Thank you all for moving the country forward. For me and for everybody of my generation and my grandchildren, we thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, our next speaker will be David Kupferberg, who will be followed by Charlton D'Souza. The service planners admit that Brooklyn has a dense core network of services that people have trusted for decades. Those service gaps remain. Therefore, there should be three objectives for the redesign. Close service gaps, expand service to transit deserts, and do both without negatively impacting the core network. To close service gaps is no easy task. This is where there has to be transparency and dialogue with the affected neighborhoods. There are a significant amount of people who live in the Sheepshead Bay houses and need access to the Downstate Medical Center and Kings County Hospital. Besides, the elimination of Bedford Avenue service south of Fulton Street would not be tolerated by the surrounding communities. Leave the B44 local alone and streamline the B49 via Ocean Avenue and Empire Boulevard instead. As that bus service is also needed on Bedford Avenue and Rogers Avenue, a new route has to be created. I will call it the B50. The B50 would mostly follow the B103 in central and eastern Brooklyn, but with more stops, whereas the B103 in central and eastern Brooklyn would only stop at transfer points and major intersections. The glut of bus service in central Brooklyn via Avenue H in the draft plan is confusing and cumbersome. The B5 is a great idea, but it should be linked with the B6 and operate instead via Glenwood Road and Farragut Road between Flatbush Avenue and Ralph Avenue. Doing what I propose for the B5, B6, B50, and B103 would make the network easy to understand. Despite its poor service at every 74 minutes between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., the B25 has the second highest ridership in Brooklyn during this time segment, according to the documents provided during the June 2010 budget crisis. Service should be increased. The MTA, however, is proposing the opposite. It wants to operate overnight B25 service solely between Fulton Street, Franklin Avenue, and East New York. This service cut is being done with the hope that riders would use other alternatives. If riders wish to use other alternatives, they would have already done so. Please continue. If the your MTA remarks. could spend money on customer service centers, it could spend money on implementing all the ideas I have proposed. Please conclude your remarks. Um, Please. There will be a rally this Wednesday. Please conclude Saturday. your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Charlton D'Souza, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me? This is uh, Charlton D'Souza, president of Passengers United. And I have to say, I am just outraged with what's going on because it says it's two minutes, but it feels like it's a minute and 50 seconds. And that is unacceptable, guys. And I've noticed when you talk about things controversial, your time gets limited. And I was not happy about what transpired at the last board meeting. But let me just talk about what's going on with these bus redesigns. A lot of community boards, I would say all of the community boards in Brooklyn have rejected the Brooklyn bus redesign. And I wonder why that is. 
So we've been very involved on the ground at Passengers United, as David Kufferberg, my vice president, just spoke. But on this weekend, you know, the 7 train was messed up, the N train was messed up, the Q train was messed up, and the F as in fish train was messed up. And on the Queens Boulevard line, you have the new signal system, right? Communication-based train control. And billions were spent on that. Well, guess what? It's breaking down. It's called network communication issues. And when that happens, everyone in Queens gets affected by it. Was the Long Island Railroad cross-honoring? No, it was not cross-honoring. Why? Because the MT has told the Rail Control Center only issue LIR cross-honoring in extreme circumstance, circumstances. And that is outrageous and ridiculous. And, you know, our commutes are horrible. Last night, I saw two homeless individuals stretched out. The trains are dangerous. I almost got uh, robbed and beaten up on Saturday, uh, Sunday overnight. A guy tried to come up to me and the subways are not safe. This is why we're having a rally this coming Wednesday um, between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Uh, you know, to say something to the MTA. A lot of commuters have had it up to year. I don't know the leadership, the board members. It seems like Transportation Alternatives, Riders Alliance, and all the other groups are now running the MTA. That's what seems like is going on. So commuters have had enough. And I tell all the people listening to the stream, contact your elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, please keep your comments focused on MTA leadership as in our rules of decorum. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jesse Figueroa, who will be followed by Deborah Greif. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes. Hi, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm calling on you guys from Fort Hamilton. Um, there's some problems I need to address. But basically, um, a bus driver from uh, Michael Quill Depot got negatively exposed on social media, saying that he was dead on Holy Saturday. So I went to uh, file a complaint with the police. So there was no action taken. So I went to see the bus driver on Easter Sunday and I told him what happened. He was very disappointed and he still is. That's number one. Number two, subway surface is still rampant and and, and uh, now on 4th Avenue and on the R train and then there's still uh, garbage on some buses system wide. The, the only thing I'm asking the board to do is reinforce no eat, uh, to enforce no eating, no drinking, no smoking because if people have been smoking on the subways and now on buses lately and that's serious so I'm ashamed because I was on the Staten Island Railway yesterday and their entity is spotless at the stations, everything. I mean, please, I mean, do something, please. I'm, I'm urging you because I almost got harassed too on the subway the other day. So Charlton is not alone. I never got robbed. I was just harassed on the subway. And this is very serious. So I, I so our, our MTA opera uh, staff alone doesn't need to take such bad rap. They're just doing the job as we do. And that's, uh, that's all I gotta say. Thank you guys and gals. God bless. Thank you. The next speaker will be Deborah Greif, who will be followed by Betsy Plum. Good, after good morning. My name is Deborah Greif. I'm a longtime bus and subway rider. I'm also a longtime community board member. One speaker made a major error and lie. Not one community board yet has voted on the bus redesign. We are studying it. We are meeting with the MT, but none of us have said we're against it. So I, you know, it's illegal to say false things about what boards have voted on. It's public record. Not one community board in Brooklyn has done that. I want proof. And if you don't have the proof, I'm going to ask the MTA to say something or do something because I'm finding this totally disgusting. I am very annoyed and very upset because we community board members take it very seriously. We know it's the first draft. What you're hearing is we may not like how the buses may be rerouted, but we realize it is first a draft. We're also not happy with New York City DOT 
because they don't listen to us when we talk about bus stops that need to be accessible. For the bus redesign, we have met with many of the MTA government relations and we thank you for hearing and listening to us. So in the future, please be careful what you're saying about how community boards vote. We didn't vote for anything and we're not against the bus redesign. We just wanna keep our routes, the certain routes the way we would like it to be. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Betsy Plum, followed by Danny Perlstein. Good morning, my name is Betsy Plum. I am Executive Director of Riders Alliance, New York's grassroots organization of subway and bus riders. We are here again today as we wait patiently on the final state budget to stress the importance of not only ensuring that the MTA's fiscal cliff is resolved and averted in the state budget, but also ensuring that riders are invested in with more frequent service this year. A budget that fails to invest in more frequent service is a budget that fails riders, but it also fails transit. We have to ensure that transit is better than ever before with more frequency, more affordability, more reliability. All of these are at our collective fingertips right now. The governor can deliver frequency with the stroke of a pen in the state budget. The state legislature can advance automated bus lane enforcement legislation. We have already joined the MTA alongside the Community Service Society in demanding the New York City Fair Fares program be expanded in the city budget. And we are hopeful that we are just days out from a final federal approval of congestion pricing. The question is, Will we seize these opportunities ahead or will we fall victim to the same status quo? We need to see investment in more frequency in the budget, all the more so given the $300 million already invested in Long Island railroad riders, despite subway and bus riders forming a community 24 times as large, 72 times as large if we look at just the Grand Central Madison ridership. We deserve investment too. This year, we must see riders and our New York City transit workers invested in. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Danny Perlstein, who will be followed by Jason Anthony. Good morning. My name is Danny Perlstein. I'm the Policy and Communications Director for the Riders Alliance. I'm here to talk about bus service this morning. There are roughly a million and a half bus rides taken to New York City every day, the most in any city in the country, yet New York riders suffer the worst service. We suffer slow and unreliable service. We have some of the longest and, and most frustrating commutes. When we need and deserve fast, frequent, and reliable bus service, and this budget is an op opportunity to do that. In this budget, we have the opportunity to fund more frequent bus service to you know, augment what's happening in the redesigns, to target equity areas of the city, and to make the buses work better for everybody. And there's also the opportunity to make permanent automated bus lane enforcement and to pilot bus camera enforcement outside of bus lanes. We know that a bus lane without enforcement is a parking lot. And too often that's true of bus routes throughout, even areas that don't have bus lanes. You know, I ride the bus on Fordham Road, I ride the bus on Broadway in Kingsbridge and in Inwood. And you know, I'm often moving at less than three miles an hour. And you know, we have a million and a half rides every single day and, and all too often this is what people are experiencing it. So we need that automated enforcement, we need that frequency. And we need an acknowledgement I think from the assembly in particular that this is a budget matter, right? That Slow and unreliable bus service is costing the MTA an estimated $300 million a year. That's money certainly that should be reinvested in the service that riders need. Um, and it's also something where the city has a big role to play. We saw this week the mayor came out in favor of a free bus pilot. And of course, we know that the mayor could pilot free buses anytime he likes um, on the city subsidized routes operated by the MTA bus company. But we also know the city has an enormous role to play in speeding up service and implementing new bus ways and bus lanes throughout the city and that the mayor is behind on that. So we need a full scale effort coordinated by the governor and the mayor, the city and the state, the MTA and the DOT to speed up the nation's slowest buses and deliver far better for a million and a half riders a day. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jason Anthony, who will be followed by Alita Dupree. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, Helda. And good morning to the rest of the committee board. Jason Anthony, uh, pretty fresh coming back from Orlando, uh, enjoying my spring break vacation. A uh, couple of things that I want to bring. On April 4th, uh, right the day before I was going to spring break, I saw two teenagers while I was getting dinner on a fast food joint 
on Queens Boulevard and 37th Street, they were, guess what? Subway surfing on a 7 Express train going towards Flushing. This is the first time, Rich, that I see this with my own two eyes. I couldn't believe this. And on my home station, Atlantic Avenue Barclay Center, an 18 year old got stabbed. This past weekend, another person got stabbed at 42nd Street Port Authority bus terminal. While we see police officers at stations, some of them are distracted on their phones. Yes, we could uh, appreciate them being there, but we should do multitasking like I usually do. Uh, we can appreciate the police commissioner, uh, Kishan Su, to be here and hearing testimonies like mine because I'm a daily commuter who uses the subway and bus. We should love to see her here instead of seeing her subordinates uh, here. So please conclude your remarks. Uh, that's all I have to say for this month. Thank you. The next speaker will be Alita Dupree, followed by Christopher Greif. Um, thanks again, uh, Chair Ida Mahalsis uh, and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her, as I speak generally about transit. Hopefully I'll be able to see you all in person soon and uh, ride on buses and this legendary and historic system that is the subway. Um, I'm getting homesick for New York and uh, I wanna be able to participate. Uh, ADA is absolutely essential, as I've said before. Now that we have a settlement, uh, it's important that we uh, get the work going to make the system fully accessible. And hopefully I'll see a lot of change coming on this year. And in reading a news report about, a, about the climate plan, um, as much as I like our all electric subway, uh, it's still producing emissions. And uh, how can we build ourselves a 100% renewable powered subway? Um, other systems are getting there, but I believe that we can do it and it is reasonable to do so. It's not gonna happen today, but I think within the next few years, uh, we, we can do that. And uh, Omni is, is essential and I'm looking forward to using uh, Omni for reduced fare, which I've signed up for it. But along with that, we have to have a sunset on the, on the paper metro cards. Uh, it, it's time to work uh, toward that day uh, because Omni is a, a more inclusive, user-friendly and safe system. It has more opportunities for people to add uh, money to their Omni cards and accounts, including payment of cash in communities. So I look forward to seeing you all soon and riding on this system that holds the ideals that are legendary and stately. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Christopher Greif, followed by Andy Pollock. And good morning, everyone. Christopher D. Greif, hope everyone's doing well. Sorry, I'm not there. Uh, first, I do want, I'm, want to thank, I uh, want to appreciate a lot of things as we got this settlement done. It's a big day, a big celebration. So a round of applause for that. Um, also, it will be nice to see that as we're doing a lot of outreaching out here in the community with the bus redesign, it is extremely important to get the facts correct before you jump to conclusion. A lot of things that we've been advocating is to getting better buses, better safety for working with MTA and DOT. But if we're not gonna work together, we're, we're our worst enemies ourselves. How can we advocate but it's not just going after the MTA, it's not just going after DOT, is our communities need to put their comments and questions in. Just an example, how to get a proper bus stop, how to make sure it's truly ADA accessible. How can we make anything ADA accessible if we don't hear that, if we're gonna fight on this, fight on that, and not getting things done? It is really upsetting to hear that facts are going out, but the information is not correct. MTA has been putting out the information and they always put in the right. 
We're not in the 90s. We're not in the 80s. We're in the 21st century. Check your facts before we jump to conclusions. These occlusions, we need, we need to make sure. Like, that's why there's an app. You see something is messed up, put it in there already. But the thing is, is we want to make sure that everything is safety, lighting is better. Please always have make sure officers are around and make sure more cameras are there. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Andy Pollock, followed by Robert S. Whitaker. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, Hayda. Good morning, Richard, and good morning, everyone. So a couple of things that I'm going to discuss regarding safety overall. Um, number one, we're going back to a very dirty pre-pandemic habit. What is this dirty pre-pandemic habit? You all may be wondering and what I gave gratitude about two years ago and even during the worst of COVID three years ago. Oh, that was making sure the buses were staying clean. I, I said on the record, I've never seen buses so clean before, but guys, it, it's starting to become that. What's going on with the bus cleaners? Where are they? Because I was on the Q12 last month, uh, two weeks ago, all right, two weeks ago, and I noticed that, actually, no, this was last week, yeah. Last week, I noticed flowers on the accordion part of the Q12 bus. And then also regarding safety, uh, we need a crowd control policy because I'm, I'm telling you, I've never seen passengers so hostile towards overcrowded buses ever in my lifetime. I've been riding buses since 2009, and this is the craziness I, I have seen, right? It's bad enough seeing Village Bus Depot has yet to address the operator availability issues. And I'm really grateful Jamaica Depot has been sending out a lot of Q17 buses lately, but we need crowd control. And you know what, the, the kids who already have their, their student Metro cards, let them board on the back of the bus. That, that needs to change. And the drivers, if you're listening to this, you need to start enforcing the next bus please sign, even if there's operator availability, because my buses are getting completely overcrowded and this needs to stop. And also subway safety. Somebody got us all to the to Port Authority this weekend. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Please I'm done remarks. talking for now. And I'm gonna speak again in May if something else comes up from that. Oh, please Thank conclude you very remarks. much for hearing me out this morning. Thank you. The next speaker will be Robert Whitaker, who will be followed by Caitlin Pierce. Hi. Good morning. My name is Robert Whitaker. I am a local 100 bus operator out of Brooklyn. I live and work out of Brooklyn. I am also a local community board member. And I'm here to talk about the bus redesign and bus operator safety and policies of the MTA. Now, while we have an extension of four additional pop-up sites for the bus redesign, nothing was ever done out of my community board. It seems like the MTA isn't listening even to begin when those pop-ups come. At the recent Coney Island pop-up, only 100 people were allowed or were either known that they were there to talk to or express their concerns. So you know what? You need to extend the process and put more pop-ups into more communities to get more feedback. Bus operator safety, good, oh, big thing. We, we hear so much about subway safety and that all oh, the police and the police and police. What happened to bus operator safety? We don't get checked on very much. And the radio, the new radio system, which is down far more than it is up, leaves us as bus operators vulnerable. Can we pilot a program here to have the police check on bus operators along their routes more often than not? And this isn't fair evasion, which we do need a lot of that too. But enough is enough when it comes to bus operators. Safety. We're tired of being hung off the dry. Now, recently, workers' comp, I'm sorry, workers' place violence has been taking a regular share of the MTA. While the response time has gotten better, the policies are still wrong. Informing the person that's trying to make a workers' place violence complaint or an OEEO complaint is wrong and needs Please to be reformed. Please conclude your remarks. 
thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Caitlin Pierce, who will be followed by Derek Holmes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the time today. My name is Caitlin Pierce. I'm Deputy Director at Riders Alliance. Um, and as many have said, we're at such a critical moment today uh, while our governor or our state leaders are negotiating how we're going to balance the MTA's budget. And the thing we really want to know is what our rider is going to get. Um, in the course of running our campaign uh, for more frequent bus and subway service, for six-minute service, we talk to over 5,000 riders. And the resounding thing that we hear from them that they want to see is more frequent service that makes their lives more convenient that they can rely on. And, you know, as we talk to riders at bus stops and subway platforms, our biggest challenge as organizers isn't getting people excited about um, a campaign for more service. It's, it's that riders in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Queens, um, just often feel very skeptical that there's not the political will to get this done. They don't see enough positive change in their communities. And they frankly don't feel like, you know, the, govern the government cares enough uh, to invest the $300 million that it would take to make their lives better. And these are MTA customers. These are New York City voters. Their lives would be absolutely transformed. Our lives in the city would be transformed uh, by more frequent service. Um, and it's the governor's job to make it happen uh, here in the city, just as she did for commuters in Long Island. Uh, we know that there's political will at the MTA uh, to run more frequent service, so let's get it done this year. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Derek Holmes, and our final speaker will be Omar Vera. Cool. Uh, hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Derek Holmes. I'm the uh, digital strategist at Riders Alliance. Uh, so I do want to say I'm sure everyone in this room is very proud that uh, last Thursday we hit 4 million subway riders, uh, which, uh, again, is like what is hovering around 70 percent of pre-pandemic levels. But still, riders are back. They're coming back. And the question that I want to pose is that as we continue winning back riders, what is it that these riders can expect? You know, is it service cuts? Is it fare hikes? Is it MTA worker layoffs? Uh, because if so, you know, that would just be so very counterproductive to all of the progress that has been made to win back riders and really has the potential to undo a lot of that progress. Uh, which is to say, right now, our governor really does have an opportunity to, you know, not just applaud these ridership milestones from the sidelines, but to be making the kind of investments that are necessary to produce these kinds of ridership milestones. And that's by investing in more frequent bus and subway service, hashtag six minute service. So uh, as we remain optimistic about the state budget, we just wanna say that we're really looking forward to seeing MTA receive the resources that are necessary to avoid service cuts, to avoid new emergency fare hikes, uh, so we can focus on providing the kind of reliable service that is necessary for us to continue winning back riders uh, so we can continue celebrating our return to pre-pandemic levels and, of course, continue to rise beyond those. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our final speaker today will be Omar Vera. Good morning, MTA Board's Transit and Bus Committee. Greetings. Well, um, I have to mention, a couple times since the R211 was introduced in service, I've ridden it. And it's, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Now, uh, that's the R211A model. We're waiting for the um, open um, gangway, which is the R211T, coming later this year. But can't wait to see how it is. The one criticism I have of it is that there's lack of Wi-Fi. I I thought, like in the introduction, it said there was supposed to be Wi-Fi, like free Wi-Fi on the train. But the only Wi-Fi I've seen is basically when we go through station to station, and that and that's if you're underground. Fortunately, I just use my um, my iPhone, which does has cellular signal when it's underground, and then of course, which doesn't need it when it's above ground since we have the regular service. But um, but I think that's something you need to fix. Um, like we've been waiting for years to see when we will have the free Wi-Fi on the, um, on the subway trains. And this is finally the chance to do it. Um, by the way, I like the new Omni um, vending machine you have there. I don't need it because I, I already use Reduce Fair Omni, but it's very useful for, um, for when MetroCars finally phased out with Omni. 
like for those who prefer using Omni cards. And um, like I said, the the neighboring um, bus systems in in um, Nassau and Westchester, uh, I've heard, are, are going to start using Omni, which is good. But um, that said, I, um, I don't have much to say, but um, but that, that's pretty much about it. That's pretty much all I have to say this week. So take care. Thank you. Madam Chair, that concludes the public comment session. Great. Thank you to all our speakers. Before we move on to uh, today's business, just two announcements. I, too, want to congratulate Transit for hitting 4 million um, riders last week. Truly uh, a new milestone. I guess that's what happens when we work together and get um, cleaner, faster, and safer service, right, in one day. Right, exactly, Andrew, one day. And then, uh, secondly, I'd like to um, wish Rich a very, very happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> in the words of Jack Benny, you're 39 today, Rich. Uh, I got an AARP invitation in the mail <laughs> last week, if that gives you any indication of how old I am. Uh, what humbling. Okay. I, so before we do that, I just have to um, make a motion for the minutes of last month's. Second. Randy, Lisa, all those in favor? Aye. Motion passed. Um, changes to the work plan, Rich? Uh, no changes to the work plan. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Go Thank ahead. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate that. So uh, good morning, everyone. Recognizing Earth Day was this past Saturday, the realities of climate change, uh, sustainability have become obviously critical consideration in all aspects of our lives. Transportation has been identified as an industry as a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, leading, as we all know, to the cause of global warming. But fortunately, enhancements and advancements in technology and innovation have led to the emergence of sustainable transportation options that promise a greener future. New York City Transit, as we know, has been the most sustainable transportation option in the city since 1904. But it's 2023, and we're expected to become even more sustainable. Our faster, cleaner, safer plan works to attract more riders into our system to take advantage of that green technology and our improving efficiency by reducing emissions. New York City Transit's initiative become even greener and realize the MTA's commitment to a zero emissions bus fleet by 2040, which will avoid 520,000 metric ton of carbon emissions annually, was recently recognized by the Federal Transit Administration. Last Thursday, the MTA, one of four agencies across the country, received an FTA Champion of the Challenge Award for our Zero Emission Transit Plan. Transition Plan, excuse me. This plan details the framework that prioritizes the deployment of zero emission buses in at-risk communities. It highlights our aims to transition to 100% zero emission bus service by 2040, while also training all of our workers in that new technology and maintaining great service and, as I said, prioritizing those communities that have been impacted by poor air quality and climate change. Behind every plan are people who have dedicated themselves to this success. We have a strong, talented team with the Department of Buses, but I particularly want to mention Sunil Nair, the Chief Officer for Zero Emissions, who put together, with a number of other folks, that he will always say teamwork, uh, to put together that award-winning plan. So congratulations to Sunil and the entire bus team. We also have focused our attention from our colleagues in C&D, ops planning, sustainability and procurement, each of whom are working hard uh, to turn this plan into a reality. And with the focus, overall focus, to improve the customer experience and attract more frequency for bus and riders, let me turn now to our March satisfaction numbers. I was excited uh, to see that the overall bus satisfaction numbers for March, which includes local, limited, select, and express bus, maintained its 69% historic high, identical to last month, and a 5 percentage point increase since December. Local bus service overall experience is 68%. Our express bus customers are even more satisfied at 76%. Bus cleanliness was uh, the highest rated indicator. Obviously, we heard from comments from at least one customer. We have some work to do there, but uh, I think overall in the fleet, uh, we're doing good work. Uh, and shorter wait times and weekends and weekdays remain the most common mention of what would encourage you to ride more frequently. The bus team continues to focus on moving the needle by deploying a multi-pronged strategy to improve bus service. This includes, as was mentioned, more than doubling the number of buses with our automated bus lane enforcement cameras from 423 to over 1,000 this year. Beginning next week, May 1st, the BX35 will join the ranks of ABLE routes to increase performance and reliability. 27 additional bus routes will be activated uh, with the, uh, with the uh, BX25 in the Bronx, which also shares a fleet with the BX19, which was activated last year. 
The program to date has resulted across, this, uh, across New York City in over 220,000 violations. Now, I'd prefer to have no violations, but what we know is 80% of violators uh, don't reoffend. It changes the behavior that we wish. The new routes will expand coverage to over 80% of our existing bus lanes, so well-enforced bus priority is the best way to keep our buses moving, delivering on our faster, cleaner, and safer plan. We'll hear from the buses team uh, shortly about their efforts also to focus on the 28 least performing routes. So we look forward to hearing from Safira and Jimmy in a moment. I should also say Frank uh, uh, Inacaro is actually on the line. We dispatched him to a national bus conference uh, in the exotic uh, city of St. Paul. Uh, so, but he is on and uh, is also available to answer questions as well. For anyone from St. Paul, I'm sure I'm gonna hear from you, I'm sorry. Um, as we turn our attention to subways, Service reliability is the best it's been in a decade with record on-time performance for st three straight months. This month, on-time performance in April for weekday is 85.1%, and weekend service is just shy of 87%. Our overall on-time performance in subways is 84.5%, the highest it's ever been. To give you a sense, last year at this time, or the entire year was 81.6%, and 2019, when things were going pretty well, by the way, it was just over 80%. So the subways team continues to hit operations out of the park. Overall subway uh, reliability uh, did take a, a, a slight dip in March. Uh, we saw a three percentage point uh, drop in satisfaction to 62%, but still up 10 points since last summer. So more work to do. Uh, but as mentioned, ridership is also returning in record fashion. March was the first time we had 100 million subway customers uh, since COVID. And last Thursday, as mentioned, uh, we hit the 4 million mark uh, for the first time since COVID as well. So folks are returning. Now, our last speaker, Omar, mentioned the R211 cars. I'm glad to hear that uh, you're enjoying those. Wi-Fi does not come with those cars, by the way. Transit Wireless will be wiring our, uh, our transit tunnels in the coming uh, years. Uh, so that's where you'll get your Wi-Fi. But the R211s have been forming, the R211 has been performing quite well. And as I've said before, the critical piece there is not only the customer amenities that we've discussed, but the R211s are expected to be three times more reliable than the R46s, which they are replacing. A huge part of our overall capital plan that we're investing over $6 billion in new train cars as part of our historic $55 billion capital plan. Again, so important to get things like congestion pricing done and the budget done to fund these important capital initiatives. And kudos to Chair Lieber for continuing to push uh, to ensure that we're investing uh, critical capital across the board. Overall customer satisfaction uh, in subways with safety and security on trains and stations remains at about 60%, up from 45 a year ago, indicating that our initiatives like station renovations, our improved cleaning efforts, and the partnerships like COPS, Cameras, and CARE are in fact moving and improving the overall customer experience. On March 30th, customer service in the transit system was further enhanced as our station agents began to support customers outside the station booths. Station agents are assisting riders outside the booths by helping customers wherever they are located, answering questions, providing directional support, look, being around the turnstile areas and platforms, helping customers our fair vending machines, monitoring the cleanliness and safety of um, the stations, and reporting any issues to management or the police. I want to give a shout out in particular to the IT team who has been helping distribute cell phones to our 2,200 station agents. Someone told me it was going to take two years. They're doing it in two weeks. So I appreciate their uh, effort to get that done. We also opened three additional customer service centers in the subway, newly opened centers at Fulton and Street in Manhattan, Myrtle Wyckoff, and 74th Street in Jackson Heights uh, and Roosevelt Ave in Queens. All three centers are repurposed station booths and feature enhanced lighting, canopy, wrapping signage so customers can identify that, and they'll be able to um, also uh, get more transactions done. I also want to call out the subway's team and thank them for their accelerated opening of 12 more uh, stations of bathrooms. Uh, we had committed last month to this board that we would open them by the beginning of May. Well, as usual, Demetrius and team over-delivered and it opened the last, I think, four this morning. Correct, Demetrius? Yes. So, so, how many do you have total now? so for bathrooms, that makes about 40, as I recall, and stations about 22. But Demetrius, you will know better than I. I'm quite sure I made those numbers up. 
<laughs> they were directionally correct, but right. not exactly accurate. We opened uh, nine stations, 18 bathrooms, the first tranche. And the second tranche was uh, 12 stations with 24 bathrooms, so 44, 42 total. Got it, great. And working on our third uh, tranche uh, as we speak. So, so far, so good. Uh, and we appreciate bringing that amenity to our customers. Um, you know, as, as more employees are delivering high levels of satisfaction, and I do hear often from our customers that our bus operators and our station agents and the, the train conductors and, you know, go down the list of all of our employees are just delivering excellent customer service, I do want to share just a little reaction to the recent acts of violence um, in our system and, more importantly, on our employees. You know, public service is more than just a policy here in New York City. Transit represents the men and women who serve others. While carrying out that service, no one's job description should include looking over their shoulder in fear of being assaulted. The assault of a transit worker is outrageous and continues to be completely unacceptable. We take the safety of our colleagues at New York City Transit very seriously, um, and I know uh, I speak for all of management as we do and think about ways we continue to, to improve that. We'll hear from Chief Grand Staff shortly. Chief, thanks for joining us. And his report about how we continue to work with law enforcement and we will not stand by any assault. Um, we continue to work closely with law enforcement agencies and continue to help bring uh, these perpetrators uh, to justice with our extensive camera network, both on our buses and our subway system. Turning to paratransit for the month of February, Accessor Ride realized an increased demand year over year of 25%. So you talk about subway ridership and bus ridership increasing. We're basically back uh, to pre-pandemic levels on paratransit. The on-time performance of our primary carrier service completed 97% of its trips within the 30-minute pickup window from the promised time. And on broker service, it was 96. Uh, we continue to see improved service in both primary and broker respectively. And we continue to uh, push both uh, entities or both uh, groups to uh, continue to improve service as well. And as I mentioned, you know, in a moment, we'll hear from Deputy of Buses, uh, excuse me, Department of Buses Chief of Staff and VP of Business Strategy. Safira, you have a long title. You have an equally long uh, business card. Um, and the Deputy General Manager, uh, Jimmy Coyle, will highlight an initiative where we are improving the performance of 28 routes, which affect almost 20% of our ridership across the system. Customers riding these routes represent a disproportional amount of our least satisfied customers. And our focus is to improve their experience and deliver them faster, cleaner, and safer service. Lastly, before I turn it over to Safir, I just wanted to say that, as you know, I am a fan of April birthdays. Uh, and I wanted to wish uh, both Christopher Greif and his mother, Deborah Greif, who testified earlier, staunch trans transit advocates and uh, you know, true partners of ours, a happy birthday as well, as April was their birthday month. That's all I have, Chair. Actually, I'll turn it over to, to Safir unless there are questions. Any questions before we turn over to Safir? Madura. Hi, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Rich. So I had some questions about um, the operating performance, and I don't. I'm, I want to make sure this is the right time. So first of all, in your report, I really appreciate how you called out the lines that were experiencing decreased OTP. I think that's that's the direction we need to go in, line by line, station by station. So I think that's really important. Um, I saw overall in subway delays, crew availability, um, that used to be a big driver of delays that's increased substantially. Do you feel like you've all solved the availability issue? Just wanted to check in on that. I mean, it's decreased substantially. Decreased, yes, sorry, yes, yes, it has you have decreased, a decrease. It has decreased yeah. substantially. I mean, I, okay. I think, you know, so two things. We've obviously gone on a, a pretty robust hiring spree the last uh, 12 months. Uh, now it's about ensuring employees who are uh, here are available uh, for work, and that's an initiative that Demetrius and team, I'll, okay. I'll let Demetrius talk a little bit about. Um, but it, I, I think it's it's probably never solved. It always needs to be managed. Maybe I'll just say that. Yeah, but Demetrius, yeah. why don't you talk a little bit about uh, a few of the things that you and the team are doing? So we still we are still um, hiring at peak levels um, as we did during the pandemic. So we're still bringing in people. We're still um, we still had uh, TSS that we brought back. Well, we're retirees. Um, the classes have been increased in size. Um, the the shortened time for hiring for both train operators and conductors. Uh, but just wanted to reiterate that the, this month still represents the highest on-time performance, higher than anything we had last year at all. So um, I, I said to Rich, you know, we, we create these high expectations and then it, we have to live by them. But it's still, it's still um, magnificent performance compared to what we were doing before. 
Thank you. And on the performance side, on the bus front, um, I think this is not the first time I've seen that for buses, the Brooklyn customer journey time it is not meeting the system-wide average goal. And so just wanted to check on buses. What are we doing specifically in Brooklyn to improve? And maybe that's the Zafira presentation, so I'll leave it there. But I just wanted yeah. to highlight that that is something that I'm thinking about. Yeah, that's it. She's shaking, she's shaking her hair, head, yes. Yeah. So why don't we hear from Safir? Yeah, I think we'll go through, can you hear? We'll go through the presentation and we can talk about the reference. So as you know, our North Star is to improve customer satisfaction by 10 percentage points. Um, in the case of buses, 73% by June of next year. It's a lofty goal, but one we're sort of laser focused as a team on achieving. As Rich mentioned, our current overall satisfaction rate for March, which includes local, limited, select, and express service, is 69%. It's unchanged from last month, but as he said, a full five percentage point increase since the end of last year. And our customer satisfaction rate remains at the highest level since we started our surveys last year. As an example of how focused the entire bus organization is, customers have told us overall that they are very satisfied with how clean our buses are. It's at 75%. And how helpful our drivers are. It's at 70% of satisfaction. These two indicators directly reflect on our customer focus. However, they've also indicated that shorter wait times and improved service reliability would encourage them to ride the system more frequently. Indicators that show we need to do more both internally and with our city partners. As you can see from this chart, customer satisfaction with travel times has trended upward since we began the survey. And while we took a slight dip from last month at 70%, we're still at one of the highest levels of satisfaction that we know there's room for improvement. Satisfaction with wait times is currently at 53%, which is a 5%, 5 percentage point increase from where we first started the survey in June. We have been addressing this on multiple fronts. I think Rich mentioned this as well, where this includes network redesigns, coordinating with our partners at DOT to add bus lanes and busways, expanding our automated bus lane enforcement program and working to get legislation passed to expand our ability to enforce bus stop and double parking violations. While these major initiatives are crucial to improving speeds and reliability, we have also taken a more granular approach, focusing with our city partners on more targeted strategies to move the needle at a local level. Specifically, this year our team identified the lowest performing routes, in some cases reviewing these block by block, and have developed tactical action plans to improve their performance, which we're in the process of implementing now. Just a bit of background um, on the methodology. Our intent here was to cover all five boroughs and focus on routes with above average ridership to ensure that our efforts benefited the greatest number of customers. We then looked at some important indicators, including customer journey time performance, service delivery, our customer satisfaction surveys, and weekend service. Routes were then weighted using these indicators, and we came up with 29, actually, priority, <laughs> priority routes to target, with the goal of increasing performance up to or beyond the borough average. This slide shows the routes that were identified across all boroughs. Interestingly, while these 29 routes represent slightly less than 10% of our total bus routes, they account for approximately 20% of our ridership. Not surprisingly, our road operations team immediately recognized these routes as the ones our customers need us to prioritize even more. Focusing on just these 20 right, 29 routes will benefit not only the 20% of our customers who ride them, but thousands of other daily customers who ride other routes that travel through the same corridors, including a disproportionate number of our least satisfied customers. The intent of this intensified focus is to make critical performance improvements and then 
next year move on to another tranche of routes, taking on board the lessons we've learned from this set of routes and this initiative. As part of this process, we have profiled the priority routes to identify deficiencies and have begun to implement strategies to produce sustainable improvements. This included reviewing specific locations that are bringing down performance, reviewing where we might be getting to the stop too early or too late, evaluating how effectively we've deployed our on-street and mobile dispatchers, and we're now working with the entire team in collaboration with our city partners to target pre, um, key problem locations on these routes. What we quickly realized is that it really does take a village to make an impact. As you will see from the next several slides, while there's much we can do on our end, the success of this initiative also hinges on the strength of our partnerships with our city agencies, I'm working closely with NYPD to go on joint blitzes and target those routes for illegal driver behavior or working with our city partners to prioritize street level changes. Additionally, some of the problems on these routes will require some of the larger fixes mentioned earlier, such as new or augmented bus lanes. I will now pass this on to my colleague, Jimmy Coyle. Jimmy is a Deputy General Manager of Road Operations. He has almost 30 years of experience in operations, and he started off as a bus operator in the system. He'll, he's going to go through some of the hard work that's been done and the progress of the team on, our, on two of our priority routes, the Q66 and the M101. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, as was said before, uh, we have identified our lowest performing routes and we're using a comprehensive full court press approach to elevate the performance of those routes and, and happy to report that the needle has already begun to move. Uh, these routes have been historically low performers mostly and they've been stubbornly resistant to improvement. Uh, not so much a low hanging fruit approach uh, as these routes are, are not easy targets. This is more like low hanging iron because these have been the, the difficult ones, and uh, if this was easy to fix, it would have been fixed years ago. But our goal is to make sustainable, cost-neutral improvements, the kind that stay fixed when we take our hand away from it, not the kind that backslide when we take our focus off of it. So, and on our stretch goal on top of that is to have fixes that will become a template to elevate the performance of other routes so that we can build off of that. All right, we're just going to showcase a couple of those routes today, and the first is the Q66. The Q66 is an east-west route that runs from Main Street Flushing to Queens Plaza, mostly on Northern Boulevard. Uh, there's challenges on the route, uh, bus bunching, delays in the Queens Plaza terminal. That's the 59th Street bridge traffic over there. That's where the, the bridge comes into Queens. Uh, that's mostly a rush hour issue. Blocked bus stops and sidewalks. Main Street and Roosevelt is the main culprit over there. Uh, the that picture on the top right you can see is the sidewalks are so blocked with vendors that the pedestrians often have to walk in the street. The street is a bus lane. Uh, it's actually a bus way uh, on Main Street. And those pedestrians walking in the street come in conflict with our buses. And obviously, a safety issue is there. And we don't want that. But also, it negates the benefits of having a bus lane if we have people walking in and our bus operators have to take extra care and go slower because of the presence of the pedestrians. So actions taken to improve the Q66 performance, enforcing traffic and safety violations more aggressively. We have begun an initiative uh, in working with the Traffic Enforcement Division and local precincts. Uh, that just started at the beginning of March, and uh, we've been writing summons with them. And so far, in just under two months, we've written over 2,000 summonses. So uh, as I said before, we'd prefer that there weren't violations, but this is the way uh, that we have available to us to, uh, to get compliance. And uh, we've seen some benefit from that already. Deploying mobile dispatchers more strategically. In the case of the Q66, we're deploying our mobile dispatchers at Northern Boulevard and 81st Street in the AM, and at Northern Boulevard and Woodside in the PM. And that's to adjust and monitor during peak, uh, peak hours. And uh, it also has the benefit of reducing bunching, which adds up to a positive way in our metrics. Uh, coordinating with New York City DOT on removal of impediments to the roadway. That's the dining sheds that we see in the streets, as well as some of the uh, vendor structures that are, are pop up on the sidewalks. And coordinating with DOT to implement new bus lane uh, is something that we uh, would anticipate hoping to get up to 4.6 miles. Uh, and also mentioned that the, uh, 
the network redesign for Queens, we're hoping to extend the Q66 route so that it will go to Borden Avenue and uh, keep that layover away from the crowded Queens Plaza area and uh, bring service to a new burgeoning community mm -hmm. in Hunter's Point. Uh, at least that's the way it stands in a current iteration. Nothing's written in stone, but we're very hopeful that that's going to get done uh, going into the near future. So these are some of the positive statistical results so far. Uh, on the weight assessment, we see it's gone up by 5.1 percent March over March. As I said, we've only recently begun this initiative. Not everything is fully deployed in all areas, uh, but we're already yielding some results. Uh, though still it's below the division average there in northern Queens, uh, it is a substantial increase in the percentage. Uh, it's a sharp positive trend in the right direction for us so far. And then service delivered is up by 5.7 percent, which again is a sharp increase uh, in a short time that we've been working on this so far. Still not at the, uh, the division level, but it's uh, you know, room to improve, but there's been a lot of progress to this point. Uh, customer journey time, we're seeing an increase of 3.3 percent, and where we were at the division average a year ago, now we're above the division average in northern Queens. Uh, Q66 uh, also has significantly improved with regard to bunching. It should be noted that the Q66 has greater frequency than the division average, and it's at greater exposure to bunching because the buses are scheduled closer together out of necessity because of the ridership. Uh, we do still have room to improve. Uh, there is a 4.5 minute headway, four and a half minute headway, uh, so that is going to lend itself more to bunching than a route that had buses scheduled, say, every 20 minutes. Uh, but while there is room to improve, we have made some improvement and we're on our way with the trend in the right direction. On to the M101. The M101 runs in Manhattan northbound on 3rd Avenue and southbound on Lexington Avenue and runs east and west on 125th Street, north and south on Amsterdam Avenue. It runs from 6th Street and 3rd Avenue, Cooper Union, to 193rd Street, Fort George. It is the longest local or limited route in Manhattan. It's over two hours running time by schedule from one end to the other. Uh, it is also interlined with the M102 and M103. And challenges that we have on the route, uh, bus bunching, it's a very long route, and uh, traffic enforcement is any number of uh, pinch points that we can run into there with traffic issues on a route so lengthy. Bus operator availability, that's continually improving picture over the last two years, and it's just about resolved now. Uh, we're just about where we need to be with that. Limited dispatcher staff resources, uh, no route has unlimited dispatcher and staff resources, but we're trying to apply those more efficiently. Actions taken to improve the performance, reallocate resources. Uh, in this case, we were able to take a dispatcher from one point on the M10 route, 101 route, and we were able to place that dispatcher at the northern terminus where previously there had been uh, no supervision. Uh, there had previously been no supervision from 125th Street in Amsterdam all the way up to 193rd Street, nearly 70 blocks in Manhattan, and then 70 blocks south again. So that was a long time for a bus route to go without being monitored, other than our eye in the sky of bus track. So now we have rectified that problem, we've reallocated that from within the route. So again, that's a cost neutral change that we've made. Uh, regulating headways, adopting bunching mitigations, that's uh, also governed by that that I just mentioned, and as well as some of the uh, changes we're making with the supervision on the route and bus track. Analyze and improve dispatcher service adjustments. Monitor driver's performance, and uh, we've begun doing that, and already we've observed increased compliance from operators, and uh, they're uh, more on board with the fact that we're out there and watching. Uh, by keeping them on time at the terminal, by having somebody there at that northern terminal, uh, when they leave on time, they have a greater tendency to, uh, to stay on time. It reduces our lates throughout the route, and it helps with bunching by keeping them uh, leaving on regular intervals. Next steps, uh, continuously address the traffic enforcement and safety initiatives. We have expanded that traffic initiative with traffic enforcement to three divisions so far. Uh, Manhattan is not yet one of them, but that is forthcoming and should be shortly. So that should bring uh, benefits to the M101, coordinating with DOT to implement a new implement the new bus lane on 3rd Avenue. That's eagerly anticipated and exploring further bus lane extensions, which again would be eagerly anticipated. Uh, here we have some of the substantial results, statistical results for the M101. Weight assessment has increased by 1% from year over year from March. Uh, it doesn't seem like a big move, 1%, uh, but this is a very large route. And it has been historically very resistant to improvement in any of the key performance indicators. 
the route is now almost at the division average. Uh, improvement on the 101, because it's such a large route, it elevates the corridor that it's on, which that corridor, having the 102s, 103s, the M98s, and other buses, uh, that so many buses are affected by that, that this has substantial gravity in the division aggregate, and it helps elevate the overall numbers of not just this corridor, but the division and our, our overall numbers as a whole, and that uh, has a direct impact that is experienced by our customers. Uh, service delivered actually dipped slightly uh, over month over month there for of course the year it went down by half a percent and uh, although there was a slight dip it is still at the division average and uh, even with the reduced service delivered the route still made gains across other key performance indicators as shown with the weight assessment uh, customer journey time performance was up two percent and uh, made it up to the division average, up and over the division average. Uh, went from slightly below the division average to now just above. Uh, and that's despite having a small decrease in the service delivered, we we're able to, to have a benefit there on the customer journey time. Bunching, though there's still some room to improve and it's still above the division average, but like the Q66, the M101 is a route that with frequent service and it is more susceptible to bunching. It has a four minute headway uh, during the AM rush hour. This is a significant improvement, and it's indicative of what can be gained going forward. Coordination with external partners. Uh, you can see in that first picture on the left there, that's AGM Jason McShane from Queens North Road Operations. He's participating in a joint initiative with NYPD Community Affairs uh, as far as the removal of sidewalk vendors at Main Street and Flushing. We've had a lot of progress with that. It's an ongoing effort. They do tend to come back, but we're working with the community and community affairs to see if we can get them relocated. Uh, and that will be uh, an ongoing battle for us to go forward. Uh, it is critical that we obtain assistance from our partner agencies. DOT and NYPD are our partners and stakeholders, and they've helped a lot. We do require more help still. We're looking to reach out for MTAPD and sanitation and other groups, uh, and we anticipate partnering with them. Uh, but in closing, there's a lot to be said for equity and improving these routes and because a lot of people just don't have other options. So we feel it's necessary to uh, start somewhere. Thank you. Uh, Jim, thank you. Um, just in a couple of presentations you mentioned that we need to work with city DOT. Where are we with getting them to move on bus lanes? Yeah, I, maybe I'll take it first. Maybe Judy can speak to it as well. So Judy and, and, Fr and Frank, you popped on as well. So Judy and Frank have been meeting. Hi, Frank. Um, regularly with with our dot partners in a whole host of areas so it's bus lanes uh, even some of the dining structures that uh, might be creeping out into the roadway for example um, has been a bit of a, a a challenge transit signal prioritization um, but we have provided dot with i think our um, wish list of uh, of bus lanes in particular um, i'll let maybe judy or frank take that about where we are but you know, suffice to say, I think, um, you know, the city's made progress, but we're ready, willing, and able to support them to, to even, you know, do more. So we have been, you know, for many years, we've been working very closely with DOT, but right now we're even trying to step up even more. We've been, um, we have a consultant um, assisting them with the traffic analysis. We also are using some of our traffic checkers to put up signage to discourage people from parking so that when they get their markings equipment out there, there are no cars there and they can utilize it and move through. So we're kind of doing everything we can to assist DOT to try to get them to get more miles. Um, you know, they had a lot of projects that were kind of ready to go at the end of the year. So we're hoping, you know, this spring they can really jump in and get some key projects done in this year. Thank you. Andrew Midori. So a couple of the buses that were on the list uh, were the M7 and the M11. Uh, they use Columbus and Amsterdam avenues on the Upper West Side, which are consistently choked with traffic, with uh, delivery vehicles who, if you ticket them, will just consider that a cost of doing business and will not change their, their habits. So we really, and the outdoor dining structures have crept into the street, as you said, Rich, and we really need dedicated bus lanes on those avenues if we're going to see a difference there. 
Um, I would also recommend uh, on the traffic checkers that you also check the bus destination signs. I'm often reporting an incorrect destination sign, which, as you know, affects transfers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, that's good feedback. Thank you. Matori. All right, thank you, thank you. So really appreciate the presentation, Zafira and team. Um, I guess I just wanna take a moment to step back and connect You know, um, the higher level discussions that are happening outside of these rooms regarding the state budget. Um, and you know, whether, you know, what actions the MTA will have to take next regarding a fare increase. You know, you're doing all so much work on bus improvements and I really appreciate the focus and I think one of you said, you know, other people don't have options, right? And so we know bus passengers, I think it was a 2017 study that said bus passengers make about, I think, $30,000 a year on average and 75% of bus passengers are people of color. Um, so, so, we, so I really appreciate the focus and from an equity standpoint, it's really important to put more investment in it. But that makes me a little wary, right? Because that brings me to what will the MTA do regarding potential fare increases, regarding a potential adopted budget? Um, I just think that if there were to be any fare increase, it will have a huge impact on the population that you're working towards making sure they're on the buses, they're getting good service. Um, so, so that's just what I'm reflecting on right now. The, the work is really important. My hope is that um, the folks at the decision-making table really understand you know, the ridership that you're all focused on and thinking about the weight of any potential fare increases, especially if it has an increase on the transit-based fare for subways and buses. So that's just something I'm just taking to heart as I think about, you know, you're doing a specific bus by bus route, but that, you know, a potential fare increase for people making $30,000 a year, they're gonna decide, like, should I still take the bus? You know, is that still gonna be an issue for us? So um, yeah, just thinking about that, but I really appreciate the work, thank you. David. Yeah, along the same lines, uh, obviously in our surveys that we do every year, um, uh, penetration of fair fares in terms of people knowing it exists is lowest in the outer boroughs and, and places we're talking about. And this is not only your problem, city problem, uh, but clearly a, a major effort along those bus routes uh, to have, you know, everyone be aware that in this income range that they can have, uh, access fair fares is going to be important. Right. I think, you know, I was just thinking, I saw something over the weekend, New York One did something, and I'm like, you should reach out to those council people that, that represent those areas, and when people walk into their offices, or maybe they don't walk into their offices, maybe they can stand on the corner and give out information to say, you know what, you're el if you're eligible for fair fares, please apply. It's just getting everybody out there. Anyway, thank you. Um, should we move on? Okay, thank you. Um, Safira, Jim, thank you very much. That was great, and keep up the great work. Um, I think we're gonna move on to Q for an accessibility update. Thank you so much, Commissioner. We're making great progress on many projects that enhance the subway, bus, and access ride experience for a diverse rider base, especially as post-pandemic ridership rebound continue. I am thrilled to report that last month within subways, we officially began to pilot our very first wide out fare gates as an alternative to the auto gate for customers traveling with mobility disabilities, service animals, strollers, luggage, or anyone else who has trouble with our standard turnstile. The first two wide out gates are in service at Atlantic Barclays, uh, uh, the entrance uh, uh, to the Manhattan bound two or three platform near the Long Island Railroad concourse on Ashland and Hanson Place and this, at Sutphin Boulevard Archer Avenue, the JFK Airport Station on the EJZ lines. As with the turnstiles or auto gates, you can use any metro card or omni payment device other than pay for single rides to pay for entries at the wide aisle gates. We are closely monitoring the customer experience with the gate, counting passenger floats, tracking maintenance needs, and monitoring fare evasions concerns at these gates. With the recognizable saloon style paddles, as you can see here behind me, that many other major transit systems use, we are excited about the new opportunities that these gates offer to welcome customers into the transit systems with ease and comfort. Finally, we are excited to be partnering with Accessoride Paratransit Team to educate customers about the new and improved My AAR app, which allows customers to quickly and easily book their trips online or in the My MTA app without needing to make a phone call. We hope customers will take advantage of this fast, convenient, and always available trip booking tool and look forward to continuing efforts to improve 
the My AAR experience. As you heard from some of the speakers earlier, today is a historic day for us as we are right now in the courts uh, 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 on our federal case, which will hopefully approve our settlement with the disability advocates to forever change the history of how the MTA delivers on accessibility and setting a floor on a financial commitment in the billions of dollars for accessibility in the years to come. We are very excited uh, about this uh, uh, agreement and, and hope that the court will agree that the advocates and our team got it right. Thank you. Good work, Q. Thank you. Any questions for Q? Um, if not, before I before I turn it over to the chief, I just oh okay. I just want to recognize Frankie Midori, who's been here. Miranda, excuse me. Midori, hold on a second. I want to I want to um, acknowledge Frank. Thank you, Frank, for being there. I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge you sooner. Go ahead, Midori. Let's see. I just had a question about um, timeline on these kind of exciting um, new gates um, that you're putting up. What are the next stations slated to be? Um, how can we all work together to make sure that they get deployed? Thank you for that question, Commissioner. As you may recall from when I first presented on this, we do have a $25 million in this capital plan for these pilots. These are the very first two stations to get these type of gates, and we're monitoring them. Within the next couple of months, we'll be changing those paddles that you saw there, adding some that are higher, uh, uh, again, to try and curb fair evasions. Uh, um, and we're looking at other enhancements that we'd like to see. So for, the, for us, this is an iterative process. We, we, we hope we'll be seeing more of these, and, and so far, we're, we're monitoring fair evasion, and, and the numbers are very promising. So we're all very excited about that, and hopefully that'll move us towards an expansion of this pilot. Great, thank you, Q. Again, um, we're now going to move on to Chief no Deputy Chief Norman Grandstaff for our crime report. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Lieber, Chair Mahaltzis, President Davey, and members of the board. Uh, Chief Kemper asked me to uh, update the committee on his behalf while he's at the uh, recent, uh, well, today's uh, Police Academy uh, graduation for our newest officers. So uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming uh, a substantial number of those officers to uh, the Transit Bureau. Um, you have before you the latest monthly crime stats. Uh, they showed the subway system experienced 213 major felonies in the month of March, compared to last year's 187, an increase of 26 crimes. This was driven mainly by a rise in property-related incidents, accounting for an increase of uh, eight robberies um, and 26 grand larcenies, 104 grand larcenies versus 78 the previous uh, March. Even with the small uptick in March, we are still below 2022's figures when we look at the year-to-date crime numbers. We're currently showing an 8.3 reduction in 2023. We've taken steps and deployment measures utilizing resources from throughout the NYPD to address this recent uptick. So we continue that, that downward uh, year-end trend a year-to-date trend, rather. Um, as I stated last month, grand larcenies make up nearly half of the crime in our subway system, and we continue to see grand larceny recidivists offend and reoffend, repeatedly preying on our ridership. Several weeks ago, on the morning of uh, March 29th, transit officers patrolling in Queens interrupted a live pickpocket theft uh, while uh, on board a moving seven train. Additional property uh, recovered from this 32-year-old uh, thief tied him to three un unknowing subway riders who had also had their property stolen. This one man within a, a one-hour span was responsible for four incidents of grand larceny. If you add that to the uh, one other grand larceny he committed just several weeks before that, we have a very busy mon month of March with this prolific thief tallying five felony thefts in our subway system that we know of. When I say offend and reoffend, I'm 100% serious. The same theft, the same thief was arrested by transit officers just last Thursday and now faces charges in connection with two more uh, cases of theft from the subway passengers. This man is just one example of the recidivists who see a packed subway system with more and more riders as a place of opportunity. Transit officers, including some of our most skilled plainclothes officers, are committed to curbing exactly this type of criminal activity. As is the case with these prolific offenders, conferrals with our district attorney partners take place at the highest levels to ensure a strong and consequential uh, prosecution. Um, earlier in the meeting, uh, assaults on MTA workers was uh, brought up, were brought up. Um, just uh, to comment on that, uh, for the year we're down actually in assaults on uh, MTA workers, 16 versus 21, down nearly 24%. Um, that is all I have for you this month. I thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions you may have. Okay, Chief, thank you. Any questions for Chief? Okay. If not, thank, thank you. you, Chief. Hopefully things will start uh, getting better. Antalou? Yes, thank you. 
Uh, the New York City Transit Procurement Package includes one item this month. This item is the exercise of option one of the federally funded contract for post-award consulting services for the R34211 subway car contract to C2K Partners, a joint venture between LTK Engineering Services of New York and CH2M Hill, New York Incorporated. In October 2022, the board approved the award of option one to the base R34211 contract with Kawasaki for the design, manufacturing, and delivery of 640 additional R211A cars. The consulting services to, pre to be provided under this option will take place during the production phase and primarily cover inspection support, testing, and other engineering support that may be required for these 640 additional cars. C2K submitted its proposal in the amount of 23.9 million. This price was based on estimated annual labor rate adjustment formulas that says, as set forth in the base contract and includes overhead and travel expenses. Negotiations resulted in the final price of 23.6 million, a reduction of 326,000. I submit this procurement for board approval. Any questions for Lou? If not, do I hear him? Um, oh, Randy, do you have a question? Okay. All right. If not, can I have a motion to amend the procurement? To accept the procurement, excuse me. Motion second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against. Motion, pro motion passed. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew has a question. Yeah, this might be late since the vote is taking place, but it wasn't going to affect the vote anyway. Um, is Kawasaki clear with us on the de on the delivery schedule of the additional fleet? There's a clear delivery schedule in terms of the base, and there's a schedule associated with this option. So I, I would, Demetrius, I would say yes. We have a revised schedule, which will be enacted as soon as we complete the 30-day test. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, no further business. Can I have a motion to adjourn? For oh, ma excuse me. Ma Madam Chair, before we adjourn, I just wanted to be here to <laughs> note that Mr. Davey, in celebration of his own birthday, right. hit the $4 million number. We got right. to give a little extra you shout missed, out for that. You missed this I morning. mean, just so that we, would, that we would, you know, really appreciate him on his 50th birthday. He hit $4 million last week. <laughs> well, let me just say it's part, of a broader, it's part of a broader pattern, maybe not as self-interested as I'm suggesting. Oh, well. Um, when I took the job a year ago, I was only 42 <laughs> years old, by the way. <laughs> but, 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 but I just got to say, and, and Demetrius is here, so he'll, he'll share in the glory. We really have made tremendous strides. Um, at the same time, we're growing ridership. And usually yes. people think that you know, more riders mean more dwell time issues and more rider illness issues, and that impacts on performance. But simultaneously driving ridership up and driving performance up in all the different ways that we measure it is no small accomplishment. So because it happens to fall on your birthday, I just need to be here and say we are all very grateful that you, with your amazing team, Demetrius, Frank, I see Judy here, and everybody who is working at Transit to make this uh, system everything we want and expect, and New Yorkers are, are thrilled. I think I speak for all of them thrilled with your leadership. So thank you. Okay. That, then you can adjourn. I'll okay. make the motion to adjourn. Okay. Make a second. <laughs> All those in favor? All right. Thank you. What does a system operator do? My name is Sajan Nehdi, BMT Chief System Operator. I have 27 years with New York City Transit. As a Chief System Operator, I'm in charge of the supplying of DC power, traction power. The system operator's responsibility is to oversee all the third rail power that we provide to run the trains in the New York City Transit system. The way that we power up the, uh, the third rail is we get electricity from Con Edison, 
will go to our substation, which is converting the AC from Con Edison's high voltage into 650 volt DC, and then from there going into the third rail, which power the trains. A typical day for system up involves general order. General order, or GO, uh, it's a planned uh, work outage. Uh, normally they're working next to the third rail or nearby, so they want power off, so they can work safely. Any emergency happens on the field, RCC give us a call to have a power off on a certain line, certain track. The power control center controls remotely all the equipment out on the field. Uh, this equipment that we control is called the MTU, which is the master terminal unit. We take power off instantly uh, by operating these buttons on the board. As for uh, RCC requests, we normally take power off from gap to gap for emergencies. Red means power is on. When it goes green, that means the power is off to that track. It's good to know that the work I do help to keep the employees safe and the system moving. Hi, my name is Ryan Motley. I'm a stock worker here at East New York Depot. I've been with MTA Bus for one year, four months. As a stock worker, typical day in the job is uh, issue parts to the maintenance facility. I process uh, transactions. I do express issues, inter-unit transfers. I also help restock parts. We receive parts from different manufacturers, give them their respective locations. We do cycle counts to find any discrepancies within our inventory also. Here at the East New York Depot, which is the central maintenance facility, we actually process a lot of parts for various depots. Here in this stock room, it's a CMF, central maintenance facility. Buses come in for major work. So we store bigger items, high dollar value items, engines, radiators, transmissions, generators, motors. Because when the buses come here, they're here for an extended period of time to get a complete overhaul. So whatever buses that are active in our fleet right now, we have the parts for it. We also store cleaning products for our cleaners that are located in the depot to help them get their job done. We help the maintainers get the correct parts needed for the buses to make service. You know, we have our regular chores of making sure that the stock room is clean, no tripping hazards on the floor. That's one of our daily chores as stock workers to ensure the safety of the operation in the stock room itself. In order to be a good stock worker, one of the best qualities you need to have, the top ones are good retention, safety, responsibility. You know, you want to have that kind of characteristic in you to try to do your best in everything you do and deliver the best. You know, it makes me smile. It makes me feel good knowing that I work for a company where it has a lot to offer. We all play a different role in what we do to keep the buses rolling out. Without these parts, these buses will be out of service and the customers uh, would be upset. MTA basically moves New York and that feels great to know that I work for a company like that. Sometimes the public may call us train drivers. Honestly, it doesn't bother me because I know they don't know. My name is Keisha Cole. I'm a train operator and I've been with MTA for six years. I work on the 7 line. It's approximately 21 stops from Main Street to 34th Street, and it takes about 36 minutes from end to end. My name is Jim Van Name. I'm a train operator for New York City Transit. I've been here about three and a half years. I operate the train on the Q line, which end to end is approximately 44 stops, and it takes me about an hour to complete. My earliest train memory is I was a kid. I got on the F train with my mom. The first time I was on the train, I was excited. It was fun. I was raised on Staten Island, and my friends and I used to take the Staten Island Ferry over to the city, and we used to ride the train all over the place. Uh, that's probably where I got my first love of the subways. As a train operator, there are two different ways you can pick up your train. You can pick up your train in the yard as a put-in, which means you okay your train for service and bring it into the terminal station, which is the last stop on the train line or you can actually pick it up from the terminal station. When preparing my train for service, I do various checks to make sure it's safe for myself and for the public. Once my day starts, I have about three round trips. I take passengers from Main Street to 34th Street and back to Main Street. That's one round trip. I start over at the yard and then I have to do what we call a put-in. I have to prep the train for service and then they send me out over to Stillwell Terminal and then I go into service. I do my two trips up to 96th Street and back, and that pretty much completes my day. It usually takes anywhere from eight to eight and a half hours. At the end of the day, the two ways of finishing the job is to just walk off the train at the terminal station at the last stop and just sign out and go home, or to do a layup, take the train from the terminal station back to the yard, lay it up, clear the way for the evening, and go home from there. 
I love the fact that I'm moving this big machine by myself. There have been times when I'm operating the train and I think that this is the greatest job ever. The things that I get to see when I'm going down the line and I'm seeing the sun come up, it's just so beautiful. This is my dream job. I love this job. And some of the amazing moments I see in this job is when I'm going over the Manhattan Good afternoon, everybody. We'd like to call the meeting of the Diversity Committee to order, please. My name is Elizabeth Velez, Chair of the Diversity Committee. And at this time, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Frankie Miranda, who is uh, virtual, uh, Midori Valdivia, Neil Zuckerman, and Jerry Bringman. Thank you for coming. Tracy, are there any public speakers? Yes. Good afternoon. There are two virtual speakers. First, we have Christopher Greith, followed by Charlton D'Souza. Uh, good afternoon. It's Christopher D. Greif. As I said before, I will cause grief, but as a joke. That I, anyway, as a advocate, and I want to say on the diversity, I want to thank the MTA. To, even with COVID or no COVID, the accessibility has been working even better than it was years past. You know, we, when we had certain things that had to be done, it's getting done little by little. So it's not just one division, it's everything. So I want to thank on a diversity part, thank to the MTA because accessibility has been getting done, not fast, but it will get done on this time in need, especially during with COVID, hurricanes, storms, anything goes wrong, at least, you know, accessibility is getting the necessary help. But as I said before, and I will say this anytime, if we see something, we're supposed to say something to any, cus any of the fellow MTA. If we see NYPD, we must let them know as well. So I want to thank the MTA. And I hope in the future, we do celebrate a great ADA 33, which is coming up this summer. Thank you so much. And please know it's G-R-E-I-F. I am grief, not grief. Thank you. Our, our next and final speaker is Charlton D'Souza. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Charlton D'Souza, president of Passengers United. And I want to talk about diversity. Um, we as advocates at Passengers United are all volunteers and we help passengers every day in the MT region. And why is it that a certain individual at the MT has ordered all agencies and ordered all people not to communicate with us? And quote unquote, because we communicate with the press. Let me make something clear. 
We have never compromised any information that we've received at any of the meetings and given it to the press or anything like that. This is about issues like the bus redesigns, and this is issues about subway crime, which the MTA refuses to talk about. And at the last board meeting, everyone with disabilities who were affected by the Long Island Railroad, Brooklyn Shuttle, all came first. But what happened? Special interest groups that are affiliated with the MTA and get preferential treatment who haven't been attending MTA board and committee meetings shows up and gets bumped first to speak. So yeah, when y'all wanna talk about diversity, fix your own issues in-house, okay? And the board members need to be very sensitive because Passengers United, we serve people of color. We are minority organizers and leaders. And the other organizations are all white, or, you know, run by mostly affluent white people. So yeah, I am going to speak about this. I am outraged. And that's why on Wednesday, we're having a rally between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. outside to Broadway to express our frustration with this agency. And, you know, I'm not happy. And look at the discrimination with the LIRR. I mean, the people are paying the same fares as Grand Central and Penn Station customers, yet they have a 45 minute trip from Rosedale to Atlantic Terminal. How is that acceptable, guys? Fix Thank your own you. house. Thank you to the public speakers. Next, we have approval of the September 19th, 2022 and the December 19th, 2022 Diversity Committee meeting minutes. They are in our board book. May I have a motion for approval? So moved. Thank you, Midori. Second. S second by Neil. N-E-A-L. All in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Are there any updates, Tracy, to the 2023 work plan? Yes. Uh, a request for resolution of the Title VI program will be presented today by Dr. Green. And we've also added the following items for the June meeting. Updates of the EEO program, which is due every four years, DBE program and DBE goal, um, that's annually. We've also moved the annual 2023 policy statements from today's meeting to the June diversity meeting. That includes EEO, ADA, sexual and other discriminatory harassment and Title VI. Um, we also moved, there's a lot going on, Chair Velez. Uh, we also moved the review of the diversity committee charter to the September meeting. The updated 2023 work plan is on page 10 of the diversity committee book for your review. Chair Velez. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the work plan changes. There's a motion on the floor. Midori and seconded. Second. Neil. Thank you. The work plan is approved. Tracy, can you take us through the executive summary, please? Excuse me. Yes, mic on. Uh, this presentation is normally given in February or March uh, for the first diversity committee meeting of the new year, but it was moved uh, due to the uh, adequate time to review the Title VI program. Um, the presentation will focus on the accomplishments and uh, challenges of our EEO programs during fiscal year 2022. Um, so some of the highlights we're gonna talk about are on the screen for the D and M and SDVO programs, uh, certification activity, small business development program, and EEO and workplace uh, statistics. Um, we'll talk about the departmental milestones for 2023, and then we'll also have a discussion and a presentation from Dr. Green on the Title VI program update. Next slide, please.
Next slide. Great. And this is just to show you that the program that we represent here today, we promote equity and opportunity in historically disadvantaged and marginalized communities, you know, with the hopes of them getting contracts and increasing job creation and home ownership, better educational opportunities. Um, that's what we seek to accomplish through these programs. Next slide, please. All right, so these are some of the numbers that we have attained for 2022. And I have to bring to your attention that in some of these programs, when it comes to the state or the federal uh, programs, the years end differently. So for example, for the state, uh, the year end is March 30, 30th. So when you look at the screen, the numbers did not change from last year's numbers, uh, from the December numbers, because we still have three months to go. So we report out on March 30th, which concludes that fiscal year. So we're still getting the numbers together, so we'll go up. Uh, for the fiscal year, for the federal program, it's a different year time. So you can't compare apples to apples on the federal and state. Right now on the state goal, we're as still at 32 percent. I'm sure we will do better than that once we have the last three months of uh, their fiscal year. And for the DBE goal, we're trending still at the 17 percent, which is lower than our 20 percent goal. Um, but overall, we still drive the state for uh, most utilization on MWBE. Next slide. So these are some of the stats from the DBE certification. And just to highlight a couple, um, applications received from 2021 to 2022 is approximately four applications received less. However, for firms certified in 2021 versus 2022, uh, we certified two more at 59. Um, I wanna bring your attention down to the last line on that. Um, and it talks about the turnaround time it takes for us to certify firms. In 2021, it was approximately 28 days. In 2022, it was 43. Why is that, right? Um, and I can say that looking at why that happened, last year we had a, a total of, I think, about four, four new staff which needed to be trained. So we hope for 2023 that we'll go back down to the average time frame of 28 days. Next slide. This is for the Small Business Development Program. And to date, um, we have awarded 596 contracts, totaling $619 million. Uh, for last year's fiscal year, we awarded 73 contracts, totaling $63.1 million. Um, we continue to look at the program and, um, and certainly capitalize on the great things that it does. Next slide. And now I'm gonna have Dr. Green talk about the hiring. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. The complete report on the workforce activities can be found in the diversity committee book on page 92 through 105. Now as of 12-31-22, the MTA workforce was comprised of 71,563 employees of which 18.5% were female and 72% were minority. Page 96 of the, uh, the Diversity Committee uh, book gives a complete breakdown by agency of all the demographics of the workforce by agency. 
during 2022, so as of uh, December 31st, 2022, MTA had hired 6,926 employees. In that number, there were 5,644 minorities and 1,066 females. When we look at our new employees coming in that were female versus the ones uh, female employees that separated from the agency, we had a net increase of 650 female employees. And as we look at the same statistics for males, we had a net increase of 1,444 male employees. And we have also indicated how that breakdown looks by ethnicity. Great, thank you, Dr. Green. And here are some of our 2023 departmental milestones. Um, it's just um, fortunate, I gather, that all of these plans were due at the same time. We have uh, five-year plans, four-year plans, annual, and in addition to all the work that the staff does, um, they have to meet these deadlines. So the MTA annual goal management for the MWBE and SDVOB programs, um, which began uh, for the budget for the next state fiscal year, which began April 1, 2023, um, programs and updates and submissions to the federal government, EEL, DBE program, DBE goal, Title VI, they're all due at the same time. Quite busy here. Uh, some of our targeted strategies are to recruit certified firms and assist the state with certification of MWBE firms qualified to work on the upcoming capital projects in targeted areas that lack MWBE present. Number two, strengthening processes and participation and benefits received from the Small Business Development Program. Next slide. Dr. Green. So we're going to turn our, our attention now back to Title VI. The Title VI, Title VI ensures that organizations receiving federal funding, like the MTA, does not discriminate uh, under any program or activity that it administers. It also encourages, ensures that our environmental justice population, which are the low income and minority and our LEP customers are afforded equitable access to our services and programs. Next slide, please. Now we gave a full briefing, a pre-briefing on Title VI, so this is an abbreviated briefing on Title VI. Um, each of our operating agencies have their own Title VI plans, which are administered by the agency EO officers. Those plans are reviewed by DDCR annually to uh, ensure that our compliance ob obligations have been attended to. Now, every three years, we're required to consolidate that, those plans into one MTA-wide Title VI program, obtain board approval, and submit it to FTA for approval. And that's the point that we are at right now. The plan is required to be submitted uh, by June 1st, 2023. Next slide, please. So we're here at the committee briefing now, we did update the uh, full Title VI program and all related exhibits to the director's desk. So at this time, if there's any questions about the Title VI program or any of those exhibits, we would open uh, the floor up now to any questions that you may have. Hi, Dr. Green, thank you um, for this briefing. So I just wanted to touch base on a presentation that we had in Transit Committee. So Transit Committee, they were talking about um, improving bus ridership and selecting certain bus routes to focus on improvement. So to what extent does your office or this plan tie in and give support to that work to ensure that um, you know, from a Title VI perspective, but even beyond that, just from like an equity service perspective, we're focusing on the right bus routes 
It, it, does it just happen on their team? Do you, do you get to weigh in? I think I just want to understand the connections. Yes, uh, so any um, major service change, whether it's a bus route or a major service change or a fare change, there is a Title VI analysis that must be done. The analysis is completed and it is routed to DDCR for review and approval of those analyses at the same time that it's routed to uh, legal uh, for Lua for Lou Oliva to also review it as well. So we do get a chance to weigh in. Now, recently we have been meeting with uh, the three groups, uh, CND and operations and DDCR to kind of talk about how we can strengthen some of those uh, conversations and some of those reviews uh, and then go out with a uh, coordinated voice on what we think uh, would be you know, most advantageous are, are the best way or best approach to address some of the changes that we are recommending. Thank you, Dr. Green. And um, I just want to clarify. So in, in the last presentation, it wasn't necessarily, I, I don't think it would be considered like major service changes. It would be, okay, let's look at the street network or let's look at these cross intersections to make sure that the buses are moving more quickly. But I guess my question is about the choice of the routes where, where um, the bus team is going to make impact. Do, do you all have kind of be maybe this is beyond Title VI, right? So it's not based on the regulatory requirements, but do you all have input on saying, oh, yes, these bus routes make sense from a Title VI or from an equity perspective? That is a collaborated approach. We have quarterly Title VI meetings where everyone across the agency that have any type of inputs into service or it includes uh, government relations, operations, and all of the agencies. We come together and talk quarterly about what is going on and what are the uh, uh, the activities that are taking place at, at the moment. We did have a conversation about Bronx redesign prior to that going out. Um, again, it is quarterly. We have been having more frequent conversations. Okay, thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, the board resolution is on page 15 of our board book. Uh, we need a motion to recommend the Title VI program to the full board for approval. So moved. Thank you. And seconded? Thank you, Midori. All in favor? Aye. Perfect. I think we've moved through very quickly. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Tracy Mitchell. Tracy has stepped into big shoes to come in as the interim MTA Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. You said it. You're coming in at a very, very busy time, and we appreciate you for hitting the ground running expeditiously and efficiently um, to help keep the MTA and this very important program moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Now we need a motion to adjourn. Oh, absolutely, Midori. So apologies, Chair, I have one more question. And so maybe this is for next time. So I'm looking through the data. Thank you for the tremendous amount of data you've provided. Um, something that sticks out to me, and it shouldn't be a surprise to any of you that I'll, I'll highlight this again. Um, as you know, you know more, you tell me what the rates of women are in terms of employment at the MTA. At some point, it was 19%. This, this round, it looks like it's 18.5%. I see specifically, again, no surprise, Metro North and Long Island Railroad. Um, those numbers are significantly lower. Um, um, and that's not like the ro those raw numbers aren't as much of a concern mm -hmm. to me. I think what's a concern is there, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are more women leaving those organizations than being hired in those organizations. And so this is more about, you know, maybe next time thinking more about what is that articulated strategy on the retention of women in this workforce? What data are you all hearing about, you know, mm -hmm. why women are leaving um, the workforce? You know, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been a national discourse on women. And I just mm -hmm. know that, you know, those rates in the transportation industry, it's, it's you know, it's, it's difficult. It's usually 20% mm -hmm. women anyway, right? So it's not just an MTA specific issue. So I would just love to learn more about that next time and kind of what we can do seeing so much very impressive female mm -hmm. leadership here mm -hmm. on the committee. So thank you. So what I would say to that is the next um, meeting we will have an update on the, we will have a briefing on the updated EEO program. In that program, we will have areas of underutilization for each agency. So we will be looking at the female um, population at that point within the female statistics in, in each of the agencies and where we uh, can do better. 
Um, then we are, we round our numbers up. And I didn't want it to look like we were fudging anything, so I actually put the 18.5, which would round up to 19%. But when we look at the number of females overall, as of December 31st, we have 650 more females than we did before. So we do have um, more females coming in. Um, one of the other things that would uh, I would bring to the board's, I mean the committee's attention is that during transformation there was a lot of movement. And some of that movement was some of the positions that were females in the railroads that moved over to headquarters. So that would have caused a shift of the numbers. Uh, we have pretty much um, settled with all the movement, and so we can get a better picture of what's going on in, work, in the workplace. The updated EEO program is a snapshot as of December 31st. So we take a snapshot at that, that time and we do an analysis of what has happened. Uh, this time it'll be an analysis over what has happened over the last year because uh, the FTA has allowed us to not go back for the three years because you wouldn't be comparing apples to apples because all of the agencies shifted and changed so much. So it'll be a, like a new organization and we'll take a snapshot and see where we are and talk about the areas of unutilization and the plan also requires us to have strategies to correct any areas of underutilization. So you will get that briefing uh, in June. Thank you. And I appreciate your perspective on like the overall agency. I guess I was looking at some specific agencies because we, we still have mm -hmm. ways to go. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight, I think I saw the MWBE goal, although our agency goal is 30%. We hit 32.5%. That is, ex that is extremely impressive, <laughs> and um, and we should just celebrate that. So really, kudos to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. My name is Winnie Estrada. I'm a car appearance maintainer, and I've been doing this job for 10 years. I work out of Shea Yard. I was interested in helping the community, the public, so when our passengers get on the train, they'll see that I cleaned it. I'll feel good that I did the job, that they're comfortable, and they don't have to worry about the mess because we took care of it. Well, I always had a background in cleaning uh, with uh, janitorial work and also car detailing. Uh, so I came to the railroad and used my skills that I learned from there to help clean the train. I like uh, working on the train, uh, working with the equipment. I always enjoy cleaning, so uh, that's really it. <laughs> a typical day is uh, thorough cleaning here in the EIC dock where we take the seats apart, make sure the sides of the seats are clean from garbage. Any newspaper cans that are left uh, behind, we clean that up. Clean the windows, we take care of the doors. We make sure that the engineer's cab is clean and ready for him to go for the day. So we take pride in um, making sure we sanitize everything from the bathrooms itself and everything the customer put their hands on. You know, it's very important to make sure we take care of our customers here, we sanitize everything. My work is important because we have to make sure the trains are clean, especially in the times of the pandemic. We have to make sure the trains are disinfected and ready for all riders to be comfortable getting onto the trains. There's a lot of anxiety going on right now with passengers and customers getting onto dirty trains. So our job is to keep everybody safe and keep everybody's head in the right place. Hi, my name is Ryan Motley. I'm a stock worker here at East New York Depot. I've been with MTA Bus for one year, four months. As a stock worker, a typical day in the job is uh, issue parts to the maintenance facility. I process uh, transactions. I do express issues, inter-unit transfers. I also help restock parts. We receive parts from different manufacturers, give them their respective locations. We do cycle counts to find any discrepancies within our inventory also. Here at the East New York Depot, which is the central maintenance facility, we actually process a lot of parts for various depots. Here 
here in this stock room, it's a CMF, Central Maintenance Facility. Buses come in for major work, so we store bigger items, high dollar value items, engines, radiators, transmissions, generators, motors, because when the buses come here, they're here for an extended period of time to get a complete overhaul. So whatever buses that are active in our fleet right now, we have the parts for it. We also store cleaning products for our cleaners that are located in the depot to help them get their job done. We help the maintainers get the correct parts needed for the buses to make service. You know, we have our regular chores of making sure that the stock room is clean, no tripping hazards on the floor. That's one of our daily chores as stock workers to ensure the safety of the operation in the stock room itself. In order to be a good stock worker, one of the best qualities you need to have, the top ones are good retention, safety, responsibility. You know, you want to have that kind of characteristic in you to try to do your best in everything you do and deliver the best. You know, it makes me smile. It makes me feel good knowing that I work for a company where it has a lot to offer. We all play a different role in what we do to keep the buses rolling out. Without these parts, these buses will be out of service and the customers uh, would be upset. MTA basically moves New York and that feels great to know that I work for a company like that. What does a system operator do? My name is Sejan Nedi, BMT Chief System Operator. I have 27 years with New York City Transit. As a Chief System Operator, I'm in charge of the supplying of DC power, traction power. The system operator's responsibility is to oversee all the third rail power that we provide to run the trains in the New York City Transit system. The way that we power up the, uh, the third rail is we get electricity from Con Edison, we we'll go to our substation, which is converting the AC from Con Edison's high voltage into 650 volt DC, and then from there going into the third rail, which power the trains. A typical day for system operator involves general order. General order, or GO, uh, it's a planned uh, work outage. Uh, normally they're working next to the third rail or nearby, so they want power off. Uh, Apital, uh, Apital, April Capital Program Committee, come to order, ladies and gentlemen. Do we have members of the public who wish to speak? Ms. King. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. We have three members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers please adhere to MTA's conduct and decorum rules. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. 
please be aware there will be a warning beep letting you know you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Bruce Hain. Following him will be Jason Anthony in that order. Thank you. Well, good morning, uh, Capital uh, Committee. Capital Projects Committee, what is it called? Boy, that's the way I speak. I don't know why it is that way. Okay, so I'm going to keep grinding my axe. How do you get more capacity at Jamaica? Well, one way is to have, and, and this is a way that is, was sort of the conventional wisdom for about 70 years or 80, is to have eight tracks to uh, destinations west of uh, Jamaica going uh, uh, so so four sets of two tracks and the way you get the extra one is uh, you go on to the uh, lower Montauk branch and the first stop is Richmond Hill and then you have a, an interesting junction at um, uh, uh, well, uh, Parkside, anyway, that's the same thing. Uh, 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 and I've, I've finished drawing that now, and I'm going to make a video so you can look at it, including the, uh, the East Side Access Mitigation Project. <laughs> I'll do them both in one video, because uh, both are about as likely. Um, uh, then I've, I've arranged a, a four-track connection at a White Pot Junction, that is Rego Park, and it's easy to do. It works nicely. It was foreseen, except somebody's put that um, sheet piles right up to the abutment and girder, and they're taking away the sixth track, so you can't have four, uh, six, eight tracks uh, going west from Jamaica. And you need that. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony. Hey, Jano. Hey, Amy. Uh, Jason Anthony here. Uh, returning from Orlando, where we have tap on, tap off. I w uh, it is good that we have Omni time, like our beloved Al Potre will say. Um, the current, um, the proposed Omni machine, to be honest, I don't like the design, to be honest, Jano, but uh, we could leave the current uh, metric card machine, but we could, with our partners of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, since that they have the smart card, since that they are ahead, they have their own readers. They, they could adapt that to the Omni machine. And since that I've been attending their meetings, and I've been in conversations with them, and I'm trying to convince them to jump on board with Omni. Why not keep the current MetroCard vending machines and adapt the readers for Omni instead? Instead of spending millions of dollars to, uh, to get a contractor to buy a, a machine that could be potentially with graffiti, vandalized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's be more creative and think outside the box, Jano and Jamie. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments. Our final speaker is Christopher Greif. And good afternoon, everyone. It is still good afternoon. I'm sorry I'm not there. I'm, I'm one thing I'm going to add is is as we are working a lot of capital stuff. I just hope that since Met Stadium for the Long Island Railroad is done, 
it's time to build an elevator there because people like me or my mother or whoever uh, who wants to get to a Met game cannot. They have to go all the way to mainstream flushing to come back to get on the bus if that bus ever runs to Q48. But at the same time also, I hope that we can work on Jamaica Station. As you know, platform, the new platform for the Brooklyn side only has one elevator, which is not ours, it's the Poe Authority. I hope we can get an elevator there to put on there so we can go connecting from the other entrance from 11, from 11 and 12 all the way to track one. So therefore we can get it done. And I hope that more, and regarding the Omni machine, we do need an easier access to the machines to make sure it's truly ADA accessible and it's easier and explains how to energize the card. And we hope that you guys will also work with the Poe Authority to remind them if you're gonna use our Omni cards or our Metro cards, please remind them that reduced fear for seniors are there, but not for disability. We need to make that very clear to them that this is the 21st century and by the ADA federal regulations, they must follow that law, which I hope they will do soon in the future or I don't know anymore. But I hope that we continue working on more projects for the accessibility and because ADA 33 is a couple of months away. Thank you. Thank you. Tia, that concludes the public comment session. Thank you, Liz, <laughs> and thank you to our commenters. Uh, copies of the March Capital Program Committee minutes have been distributed and are available on the website. Changes or comments, board members? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second, Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. Jones, sorry. Um, all in favor? Any Aye. opposition? The minutes are approved. Uh, changes to the work plan, any? Mr. Chair, we have two changes to the work plan. Today's briefing on security was provided in the safety committee book presented this morning. And the systems program scheduled for this month is rescheduled for May. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the changes to the work plan? It's moved, second. Uh, any opposition or abstentions? The changes to the work plan are approved. So the same thing. Uh, all right, with that, let me turn it over to Jamie Torres Springer with the President's Report. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, and lots of, uh, lots of folks from MTA Construction and Development here today as well. Uh, this month, we have an update on Omni as well as from our Infrastructure Business Unit. Let me give you a couple of updates before we get to those regular items. Last Thursday, we announced the MTA's Climate Framework. In addition to quantify, quantifying the extraordinarily positive impact that the MTA already has on greenhouse gas reduction, which we quantified uh, in an updated number of 20 million tons of avoided greenhouse gas emissions every single year as the result of MTA's activities, we also laid out an ambitious plan to reduce our own uh, operating emissions by 85% by 2040. We're going to make a full presentation to the board on Wednesday about that, but I wanted to note it today because a lot of that is driven through our capital program, including our 20-year needs assessment, uh, which you'll hear more about in the coming months, and uh, our next capital program coming uh, next year. Since our last meeting, we hit a few major construction milestones. At the end of March, we reached substantial completion on the Penn Station Long Island Railroad concourse. I won't go on at too much length because our chair does a better job of describing just the transformative uh, power of that doubly wide and doubly high uh, concourse uh, um, and, uh, and the impact that it's having on our riders. It's great and look forward to spending some more time there in the coming months celebrating uh, and moving forward into Penn Reconstruction to, um, to bring that forward into the rest of the station. Also, at the end of last month, we reopened the escalator at the 181st Street A train station. That's one of our deepest stations. The escalators were past their useful life and needed replacement. This is a picture showing the first customer on the new escalator helping us cut the ribbon. Uh, work is continuing at 181st Street with another project to make the station fully ADA accessible, continuing with opening set for later this year. I wanted to emphasize this. This was, no question, taking out the escalators, which unfortunately we had to do all at once. They were all connected in the machine room uh, to rebuild them at a deep station 
was not an easy decision that we made, not an easy thing that we did, but we're proud that we were able to get this done on schedule to get it reopened and that we're headed towards full ADA accessibility at that station. It's a really important station. Out on Long Island, we replaced the Cherry Valley Bridge with a new higher clearance dealing once and for all with the challenge of frequent bridge strikes in that location. As we discussed last month, this was done through an innovative approach in which the new bridge was fabricated off-site and then rolled over the, rolled in over the course of a single weekend. Uh, so another big accomplishment on Long Island as part of the, the major suite of investments that we've made there over recent years. Uh, this month, I wanted to do the report to the committee on the status of the Omni program because uh, we've been conducting a strategic review of Omni implementation at C&D, and I've been pretty involved in that, uh, and some of the decisions that we've made as a result. Uh, so I'd like to give you that update. I do want to note, I'll introduce them further, but we, uh, part of uh, the, the, uh, the moves we've made to set the program up for success, we have our two project and program executives, Tim Kaiser and Amy Linden, uh, here with us today and will, of course, uh, help, help me uh, to uh, respond to questions after the presentation. So let me walk you through the findings of the review and steps that we're taking to keep the program moving. But before we do that, let's put Omni in context. And for me, uh, it's really that Omni has put the MTA well ahead of the curve. In the last decade, a number of transit systems moved to contactless payment systems for their fares. In general, these systems worked pretty much like MetroCard. It's what's called a closed loop system, a proprietary card like Oyster or Charlie or SmartTrib that has value loaded onto it that's only usable for paying fares. And if you lose it, it's lost. With Omni, the MTA made a bold decision to leapfrog ahead to a so-called open loop system. Rather than a transit issued card that you can tap, Omni allows customers the choice to pay with their own bank card or their digital wallet, or indeed, as we're moving forward and now available at retail locations, an Omni card. This gives customers more choice in terms of how to pay the fare, and with more online features available, it means that the system is largely self-service, which has great benefits for both riders and for the MTA. And we've reaped the benefits of that decision. Um, it, you know, it's, and so of our customers, we started conceiving of this new generation of fare collection in 2009, five years before Apple Pay was even introduced. And now more than two thirds of our Omni customers are using digital wallets. So we were really um, well positioned to take advantage of the leaps forward that technology have, mobile technology have made in recent years. And as a result of that, we have a lot of success to emphasize. Adoption continues to grow steadily with more than 40% of bus and, subway, bus and subway customers now using Omni to pay their fare, resulting in approximately 2 million Omni taps each weekday. March 2023 is now reported here. It was the first month where 50 million customers used Omni to pay their fare. This has been made possible by a remarkably rapid rollout for a system of our size, from the pilot in 2019 to the full rollout in late 2020 to subways and buses in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we installed readers in every subway station and bus, and just as critically stood up a technology system that was the first of its kind for a major transit system. Since then, we've added functionality for customers like the Lucky 13 fare capping pilot and the introduction of the reduced fare program. One of the bigger challenges that's ahead is omni adoption. Our five million transit riders a day are highly diverse in how they use the system, and we're going to accommodate them so that they can continue to access our system. That's a bedrock principle of how omni is being deployed. And I just want to emphasize, making it easy to pay fares is a great solution to fare evasion. So we need to make sure through this, we are continuing to make it easy to pay fares, make it easier to pay fares, which is what Omni is really about. But that requires coordination across the MTA to take advantage of all the enhancements Omni will provide. You see some of the marketing activities to date, which have helped regular fare and some reduced fare customers to switch to Omni so far, but this is just the beginning. In conjunction with the overhaul of the schedule, which I'm gonna to talk to you about in a second, we're refining our plans to steadily onboard all MTA customers onto Omni 
through a combination of marketing, fair payment structuring, customer education, and even advocacy to pre-tax benefit providers, who many of whom need to switch and start issuing contactless cards. Um, so the tons of effort, it's all getting teed up. As I'll describe in a minute, we're now getting organized across the entire MTA uh, to be able to drive that, uh, the build out of the capital project and the adoption. So to our review and how we move forward, it's great that Omni is available to so many riders and is being adopted, but I would say the completion of the project is at something of a crossroads. The budget and schedule are uncertain as we move to fully transition to Omni across the whole MTA portfolio. We want to acknowledge today that there have been challenges on the project that we will be addressing as we move forward. So we've categorized them into three groups here. Number one, maybe most important, controlling the scope. And this is really, you know, again, bedrock delivery of a capital project is you have to lock in scope and then not change the scope. We, we all uh, down at uh, MTA Construction and Development look at the, the word scope creep as uh, our biggest risk and concern. But with complex technology projects that are being rolled out in an operating system in an environment where technological change is just a, a reality, it's always hard to keep scope under control. And there have been constant demands, very positive, uh, you know, useful demands for new features and modified functionality as Omni has been built out. This is no surprise for a project that began to be scoped years before digital wallets were created and now is two-thirds dependent on digital wallets, just to give one example of the complexity that we've kept up here. One important example is the integration between Omni and our railroads, which has taken longer than anyone would have liked because there are so many good uses that Omni can be put to on the railroads, from it being a great way to pay tickets online and at new vending machines, even uh, on, on a train if someone hasn't purchased the ticket previously, to a whole different efficient approach to fare payment. We needed to take the time and put the structures in place to lock down the scope and then ensure that we can stick with the scope in order to finish the project. This scope issue has been exacerbated by res resource issues, especially as the project has progressed and we now need to operate the system and build up core functions. There have been insufficient resources at our contractor, Cubic, have not provided sufficient resources. And also internally within the MTA, we have struggled to properly staff the project, leading to milestones being missed. One further uh, resource issue that I would mention is that we have, as we always do on major projects like this, uh, outside program management support, and we needed to find a way to better structure that support so that we have more resources coming from them. We hadn't done that previously. So as an example of the impact of this, there's been frustration that we've been able to support, we haven't been able to support more rapid rollout to our affiliates and partners like AirTrain, uh, some of the, the suburban bus lines, uh, Roosevelt Island Operating Corp, Roosevelt Island Tram, who have been increasingly anxious to get into on the Omni system because of how successful it's been. We just haven't had the resources to be able to respond to those concerns. And underpinning all of this is the complexity of the stakeholders across this entire organization, which means that our project management and governance have not been able to always prioritize our issues properly. Fortunately, this is exactly the set of challenges that MTA construction and development was created to address. At the core, we needed to address the project management issues that I described. That's why we're bringing Omni into CND with a structure that treats it like the mega project that it is. It means establishing dedicated teams to deliver the project on the one hand and to operate the Omni system on the other. We've done that in the last few weeks. <coughs> Excuse me with Omni project delivery, you see on the left, responsible for the rest of the capital project delivery that's led by Tim Kaiser as our project CEO, and with Omni operations and services, 
led by Amy Linden, who's really been carrying both sides of this effort uh, for the last couple of years and beyond, and has the most expertise within uh, the entire MTA on how we operate this program and bring this to a closure. So Amy will continue uh, to ensure we operate the program coherently on behalf of the various MTA stakeholders that we've shown at Wright, who really are the ones that have to make key decisions about what we're trying to do here. With that reorganization, we'll also add additional resources so that we can fulfill both of those roles at once and ensure that the contractor and commercial management team can do so too. And as I've mentioned, on top of all this, we've established clearer governance, and, and I'm grateful to MTA uh, strategic initiatives here at headquarters for the work on this uh, across the MTA to ensure that decisions can be made quickly and efficiently. So we've set this project up as a real model for a mega project and how we deliver it. And with stronger project management strategy and the resources in place to execute it, that allows us to tackle the scope uncertainty issues that I described. We have the team undertaking what's called a full rebaselining of the remaining schedule. It means we are looking again at the whole schedule, figuring out how the different pieces of it fit together, and then coming up with a new schedule for project completion to finalize the major deliverables. I expect this to wrap up in June, and then we will have a revised program schedule that includes, thanks Tim for writing, writing making a note of that, with June, June, June completion day. Um, that includes the rollout of full omni functionality to all our services and online, the availability of omni to our so-called bulk users like Department of Education, Fair Fares, the pre-tax benefit providers, the broader availability of omni card services in the subway and retail outlets, and only then will we start to look at the opportunity to retire legacy systems. I'll note this also includes a review of the Omni scope for the railroads. While the railroads were not fully scoped at the outset of the Omni project, that has provided us with an opportunity to take a fresh look at requirements for our railroad customers as well as business needs for Long Island Railroad and Metro North to ensure that we are facilitating efficient fare collection. And so what that means in effect is we are moving forward full speed with the plan to ensure that Omni is available as a way of paying for tickets uh, in train time, at uh, vending machines, uh, at railroad stations, and on board. And because of all the new features that are available, we're also taking a step back and taking a look at what more than that can Omni accomplish for the railroads. That is all proceeding uh, in our revised scope. A couple of key upcoming activities um, that I think are, are really, um, really important here. Uh, we're excited that we have the, uh, the prototype of the Omni vending machine uh, sitting in the back of the boardroom today. Um, the vending machines are finishing up their, their pre-testing, uh, and our intention is to start rolling them out to all 472 subway stations beginning in uh, this summer. Um, and that's exciting as we begin to deploy that. It means so many more people have access to the Omni card who need it, who aren't able to just uh, use it electronically or use a digital wallet to tap and go. And also I wanna note that we have um, solved some dicey issues um, related to uh, the air train deployment uh, and the Roosevelt Island tram. Um, I won't sort of get into them in too much details, a lot of sort of intergovernmental uh, stuff um, and, te and technology and software stuff. Um, but um, basically, by the end of the third quarter, uh, at the latest, we will have Omni uh, tap and go in place at the JFK Air Train at both stations. Um, it'll be an interim function where um, basically people will be tapping and then go through and we'll still have MetroCard available uh, at, at some of the other uh, turnstiles and then we'll be moving to the full deployment after that. But we have figured out a way to get that interim solution out, you know, before Thanksgiving so that um, for the, the next, you know, the end of the year rush, um, we're in a much better position with our partners from the Port Authority. And the same thing with Roosevelt Island Tram. Uh, we've sorted that out and are deploying that uh, by the end of the third quarter. Um, so that's our uh, sort of the summary of the assessment. Um, big next steps, transitioning to C&D, manage as a mega project, bring on the additional resources to augment our team, both internal and external, and we'll be finalizing that new project schedule in the next couple months, and that will take us forward to full Omni implementation. And uh, with that, Chair, I'll turn it over to you. And yeah, I just yeah. wanted to underscore, I, you know, when this all began about four months ago when 
um, in di dialogue with Amy, who has done so much to carry the weight of this project in, in the last couple of years, um, we were, you know, took the, I, I took the position that, like many moons ago, our old friend Eastside Access, it was time for this project to be re-examined and subjected to um, a reevaluation of how it, 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 it's proceeding, because the scope issues and the, techn the changing technology issues uh, and, frankly, contractor delivery issues were creating a bit of a backlog. And uh, the, this is what, you know, I, I think the board, this board knows it by, by this point. This is what you got to do when you have a project that is not getting everything at once done. With the proviso that this, you know, the acceptance of Omni by our riders has been extraordinary. So, you know, credit to the project team for getting us to the point where basically half of subway riders at this point are using Omni and pretty successfully. So that's not to be um, waved away. But the remaining issues are serious enough that we had to re-baseline the schedule fully. We had to resolve once and for all, honestly, lingering scope issues, especially as pertains to the railroads. What do we want this Omni thing to do for the railroads in an environment where we have a very successful ticketing, uh, a ticketing application that the, the riders are using? Um, and when we're not using Omni at this time for gating or anything like that? Uh, in the railroad environment, um, so to to, uh, to resolve those issues and to to give the support to this project team, which has eroded over time. The, pro the 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 staffing of this project has eroded. It's not surprising in an environment where technology expertise was highly sought uh, that we were having more and more trouble staffing these key functions. So the first thing you got to do when you have a project that's not succeeding is be honest with yourselves. That's what we did. Um, but I don't want to undersell the success that Omni has already achieved, and particularly the way it's enabled us to give additional discounts in the future as we move, uh, as we continue to examine our payment, our fair payment structure. So the project schedule is going to be torn apart. The staffing is torn apart and put back together. And the, uh, and the management structure that Jamie has now uh, explained to the board is being put in place. This is the way you deal with projects that are having some challenges. So questions, so Mr. IEC, the IEC is going to comment. I, I, I got ahead of my IEC friends, but they're used to that. Um, I, I do, I, I, I do want to let, since I just started us off, let a couple back and forth before we hear from the IEC. Mr. Jones. Go ahead, David. No, it's good. So you say 40% take up. If you laid a geographic grid over that, which communities are taking it up most, and where do we really see the lack of take up? Um, I, I, you know, it, it may be a, a longer discussion we should have in the future, but um, but it's it's the the grid looks the way you would anticipate that yeah. that it looks, um, yeah. which is you know people who are let's say you know very well banked who have access to. Uh, digital wallets, Apple Pay, and so on. You know they're yeah. using it. Um, you know people in you know outer borough uh, subway stations and on buses uh, using it less. And so, uh, and that's partly that's just it's the deployment. It's that you know it's easy to use it for those things now. But what I've described, all of these different pieces of the program, being able to get an Omni card at a subway station. Um, having for, you know, bulk fulfillment for different user groups that right. have card discounts, um, introducing some of the fare modifications that Jana was describing, all of that will get us to the point where Omni should be universally uh, accessible. And, da yeah. and David, I mean, and Mr. Jones, just obviously part of this is being honest about the fact that we're not setting a drop dead date for pulling back on That's MetroCard. True. We're going to continue right. to work with every aspect of New York's transit ridership to make sure it's accepted, it becomes standard, and people get it, and they have full information. But we're not going to pull the plug on MetroCard uh, at any uh, date that we've set at this yeah. time. And you mentioned, obviously, the, the notion of uh, fair fares and seniors and the rest. How is that? Is that going to be integrated soon? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yes, sir, it is. I'll just... Um, you know, I could ask one um, one of our executives to, to mention, but I, I'll just say the 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 touching off point is something called the business to business portal that we have is a software improvement that we have to make, which is due next month. Yes, um, 
but that doesn't mean that all those groups will be available next month. Then each of those each of those groups has their own rules for how their fares are managed. I know. So they will then have access to the portal and will need to be able to establish their rules and we'll be working with them so that over the coming months, they'll be able to get those groups onto Omni. But it's the, we're putting in place the most important improvement in the next month. Is and I just want to yeah. emphasize again what you know and you've been so involved with fares, which is that Omni enables us to give people at the low end of the income scale real advantages. They don't have to decide when they walk up, do I right. buy a monthly Metro card or a weekly Metro card? We can, uh, we can arrange we can it so aggregate. the system gives it to them uh, the best deal automatically. Yep. So we are going to work our tails off to make sure that folks understand it. That's why those Lucky 13 ads you've seen have been in so many languages. We've done it in literally, I think, a, you know, between you know, 10 and a dozen different languages so that everybody understands the benefits, especially people who are transit dependent. So everything, Omni now moves over to CND, um, and it's fully funded. Do we have any budget issues? Is it too early to tell? We 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 don't have we don't have budget concerns to raise today. Today. Well, we're you know as I say we're we we are in the middle of looking at the whole schedule and the whole program. Okay. So I I can't make a guarantee right now, but okay. you know at the moment the project's on budget. Okay, and the budget now, what is the Omni budget? Do it's uh, seven hundred and seventy-two million dollars. Okay. okay. So, Mr. Albert, Mr. Solomon, Jano, you uh, actually touched on what I was going to raise, which is Omni will absolutely explode when somebody doesn't have to lay out for a weekly or a monthly. There's a rolling. If you start it on a Wednesday, it goes for the next seven days as opposed to must be Monday through Sunday. Um, the fact that you can just get the benefit of the best deal will cause everybody to move to Omni. Um, obviously, the removal of MetroCard will also cause that, but I think this will happen. And I'm, I'm wondering, since Cubic was the maker of Paths turnstiles, Will the PATH system be also getting Omni, do you think, or is that just up to the Port Authority it's to make really that decision? It's really up to the Port Authority. Let's, let's, we have, a, you know, a half a dozen major affiliates, as they're called, that yep. we got to square with. We want it to be successful and, and maybe that. But one thing not to be underestimated is also the value of having our station agents out of the booths. Yeah. Because that's really going to be key to helping people who, who are new to Omni make sure they get it. You know, you, you see tourists standing there scratching their heads at a Metro card machine. I, I just tell them now, just use your credit card, and they're thrilled. I thought they were doing that because of dandruff. Um, the, the, um, the, the benefit of the station agents out of booze is key to this, and it makes sense to, to, uh, to take full advantage of that. Other at a point from, I think Mr. Solomon was next, and then we'll, Mr. Glucksman and Ms. Lopez. I'll start where, where you left off, Jano, which is in terms of when the machines roll out, which is when do we expect, by the way? The S starting this summer. Starting this summer. So in terms of training the teams to be able to, if, you're, if they're scratching their head, hopefully the teams will be trained ahead of time. That's to, happening now. This is, that's uh, happening uh, now. Okay. It, I, I don't know who can speak for transit on this issue, but literally that training is happening at a fast pace right now. Um, literally, they there were... There were signs up in the lobby of this building last week that all the station aid, directing the station agents where they pick up their phones as part of their training and adaptation to the new uh, station agents out of booth system. So it's going on. It's going to take a couple months because there are lots and lots of them, but it's very much underway. This is part of it. Um, and in terms of the machine maintenance, in terms of the, the current staff who are working on that, is that, is that, training, is that training going on as well? That, it, that one I'm not it, sure I can answer. Uh, go, go ahead, Dan. We'll get done as part of the work. But. Uh, yeah, we'll be starting that shortly. Uh, we're currently testing the machines in the CRF out in Queens, so all of that will be considered and planned for. Okay. Then in terms of just scope and the modified functionality, um, and I know obviously the project's being re-baselined, et cetera, are we reasonably confident that scope's going to be locked? I mean, I think, are we talking about, you know, we're going from wish list to actually knowing what we want to emerging technology that's evolved over the time. So, I mean, are we reasonably confident? We know what we want. We know where we're going. We're not going to have further scope changes and or modified functionality that we have to address. 
I, well, I, I guess for, you know, the answer is yes. I mean, I, I, I think, um, I don't think we really had a wish list. Um, you know, we really, you know, honestly, as I've dug into this, I just have been extremely impressed with how well worked out this very complex web of technology improvements has been. And so, um, you know, there are some lingering questions uh, that we need to resolve over the next couple months, but I'm very confident that we will lock in the scope and we will lock in the scope. And I've been clear, you know, this is part of the function of capital project delivery is I have to be clear with our various stakeholders. You know, people call them clients or sponsors or owners. Um, but, you know, I'm somewhat indifferent to that. Um, we're locking in the scope and then that's the scope. And uh, unless perhaps the chair orders me to change the scope after that, um, we, we ain't changing the scope. Um, so, uh, so a lot's getting done in the next couple months to make sure that, that, that we're all, uh, that everyone's comfortable with where things are headed. Remember, I mean, truth. Part of the challenge is this was not a capital, a conventional capital project yeah. in the sense that it was actually operating at full at full bore, while complex technological issues remain to be resolved. So that's that's why you see there's a, a the, the split that Jamie has proposed and is effectuating between the management of the forward-looking job that remains to be done, and the actual operation of the system which is a full, I mean, this is the big, by far the biggest system of its kind operating in the United States and North America. And it's an open loop system, which is novelty. So um, that, that, it was that managerial challenge of, you know, flying the plane while you're building it that I think was, was the reason, the core reason why it made sense to kind of retool a little bit. Great, and then just quickly, last, last one in terms of Cubic, um, and I know that you know, staffing challenges abound uh, in lots of places, but you know, how are we, how are we approaching sort of working with Cubic to make sure we're getting the full and maximum potential out of the vendor? Um, so, you know, a, a couple, a couple of big things. Um, first, you know, getting scope locked down and clear, um, you know, makes things absolutely a hundred percent clear without any uncertainty about it. Um, you know, there, we certainly reserve our rights related to anything that's happened thus far, and we've made that clear to them. Um, I will say, you know, this again, it's it's it has been a very impressive build out. I mean, to get is, is it? Uh, I forget how many devices, uh, th th six, sixteen thousand validators rolled out to this system. Um, it is very impressive, and yet, you know, we haven't always had the full resources we've needed, and we've made that clear, and we'll continue to make that clear. Uh, in how we uh, in how we exercise our rights related to the contract, we also need a much better um, approach to program management, and <coughs> it's very impressive. <coughs> Sorry, Tim has put a full team in place. Um, you know that will that has really um, uh, you know been structured to manage the contract better. And of course, you know what we get out of rebaselining is not just the schedule itself, but a resource loaded schedule. So that makes clear what our expectations are and and uh, allows us to exercise our rights. Okay, coming back, uh, Mr. Glucksman, Ms. Lopez, I think Ms. Valdivia. So when I'm in a station and there's a big line for the Metro card machine, I approach and ask, do you have a credit card and get positive success? But I got stumped the other day, it was on Saturday. I said, well, yeah, we have credit cards. I said, but we need a seven day Metro card. And I started thinking, well, are we still doing Monday to Sunday or did we come past that, that hurdle already that I could have told her just go by the... Well, actually, why don't, why don't we ask Amy to respond to that? Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Um, are you asking if we're still on the fixed fare cap? Uh, we are, but uh, the plan is afoot uh, to roll out the floating version where the first time you tap within a certain period, that'll kick off your seven days. It, sorry. It's, it's well, this year. Worry, it's, yeah, this year. This, yeah. Is gonna, this is probably going to be effectuated associated with the fair actions that yes. we are expecting, you know, we may be taking after the, the budget locks down. Okay. Exactly. Um, we had Ms. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a couple of comments. Um, thank you for this presentation. I feel like this, uh, the information you've provided and incorporated um, the status of where the affiliates are, which I 
believe it lacked in the last presentation that we had a couple of months ago. Um, and we had, speaking for Westchester County, the Beeline system, um, we had a really good conversation with Tim Kaiser and his group last week. And I feel that for the first time we had, or my staff had a really good understanding uh, as to what the next steps would be in the implementation of, of Omni in the Beeline system. I think for Westchester County now we wrestle with policies with respect to whether or not to continue with uh, accepting cash for fares, the uh, number of validators that we will need, how to pay for them, but that's gonna be on uh, the county's responsibility to look at. But I appreciate the discussion. I think that we should, if possible, have a follow-up conversation on this, not just with design, but the actual operations. Um, and my question with respect to the Omni machines uh, for, the summer, for the summer, does that include rail as well, or is it just subways? Um, so can I just say on the um, the uh, the bus lines, we agree with you. You know, the conversations have been good. Um, <clears throat> Westchester be the nice bus, um, and we're we're looking to accelerate the the deployment of those. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I will also say now, you know, having sort of sorted out the first affiliate uh, agreement with the Port Authority for AirTrain, we've learned a lot there um, and have a pretty good template. So. Good. Uh, I'm I'm pretty confident that that's going to go smoothly. Um, I'm sorry, I blanked on what you're. That's other okay. Question. The railroad. machine. The oh, only, yeah. uh, no, the railroad uh, rollout a is a separate schedule. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Valdivia. Great. Thank you, um, everybody, for this presentation. Super comprehensive. Um, so feel really heartened by the progress or the progress that you're making on the affiliates. I think that's really exciting, and that can optimize the power of Omni. Um, I had a question about, um, and maybe this relates to the scope, and I think I might have missed a presentation in November or October, but what are we, what is our scope right now related to Omni and Accessoride and specifically related to paratransit is the idea that um, folks will also see a validator system in the blue and white vans or has that not been resolved? And then kind of thinking about how we have so many loyal customers in the student front, in the fair fares front, how are we thinking about Omni rollout there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me do the second one first and maybe uh, probably Amy will just give some detail on how it's going to work on paratransit. <clears throat> Although I should mention that we have, we have summer of this year for a pilot on paratransit teed up um, uh, before we do a full rollout. So I mentioned the, all of these special programs, um, each of them, the key is we have a portal we're creating that allows them to access it. And then each of those programs has to establish their business rules within that portal, right? So for example, you know, the DOE students can only use it a certain time of day. They only have a certain number of taps per per week, right? The, so, so each of those services is gonna have to step up and get their rules incorporated. And that's a cubic deliverable, or that's on the aff affiliate well, side. So, deliverable? so we, the program, will deliver the portal, okay. and then the you know the, these various businesses or organizations okay. will need to establish what their rules are to get incorporated onto the portal, okay. so that we can move forward. Do you want to just describe in more detail what par how Paratransit is going to work, Amy? <laughs> Hi. Um, Parent Transit, there are uh, last few software items that are being fixed and retested, and then Parent Transit needs to prepare for their pilot, which is 50 to 100 customers, and it's really just a soft launch of the entire rollout because they want to make sure their customer services are, um, you know, up to snuff and solid for rolling out to all of the Parent Transit customers. But their plan is to get going. Uh, definitely this summer. And you asked earlier about payments on the vehicles. There's no validators. Okay. It's a back office Omni account that the customer would have. Their AAR ID card is their, in essence, token, but it's online. Okay. They would load the account and they can either pay that way, but they would still have the choice uh, even after booking with Omni um, to pay with cash still. It's still a choice. Okay, and so so is there a spe specific plan about bridging the digital divide or unbanked issue with the paratransit community outside can, of cash? Uh, is there like outreach plans or anything like that? Uh, that I'm not okay. aware of in paratransit. Okay, would that's probably be best. Open question to I have. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and and one follow up. So I really 
appreciated what um, you all said about um, the, the project management um, uh, expertise that you're going to bring to the table. That's wonderful. This is a fair payment um, system, so I'm interested in, as you set up the project management team, who are, you know, CND typically builds stations, they build rail, they build, you know, very impressive bricks and mortar infrastructure, so I'm curious, like, what um, vendors or experts you're bringing on or you feel confident with the team right now? State the obvious, every, every what you would describe as a bricks and mortar project is really a systems project now. Yes. The reality of the project, the program we operate is, it's all software, it's all technology, it's all systems, so that has become you know, one of the, 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 the core functions in the C&D project management is to um, work through the, the, the technology issues m frequently in tandem with IT um, as you establish scope, but that's not foreign to the C&D operation. Jamie, you can take it away. That, that's the case, and yeah, actually we have the, the expertise of our systems business unit we recently created. Um, which is helpful in that too. But you know, then the connection to the users are, is the most important thing. And I mentioned that we have spent a bunch of time over the last couple months uh, clarifying with the help of strategic initiatives here uh, at headquarters, these various different user groups, the operating agencies, customer experience, IT, uh, the, uh, the, the finance function, um, all of those groups are, it's much more clear what their involvement is, um, where they have input, where they have decisions to make. Um, there's a whole system of decision making that's been put into place so we can make sure that we have all that expertise in, incorporated. I just, yeah. Mr. Jones. This is perhaps uh, because I grew up in the token era. How exposed, what are the risks here if this system fails? Does that mean the whole system goes down and suddenly, you know, we're in the position of no fares being able to be collected at all? Uh, as opposed to a you know a more, much more mechanical system, where one machine goes out. So what what what's the risk assessment here? Uh, I'll just say without getting into too much detail um, that it, there are redundancies built within the system and fail safes for exactly the the uh, the consideration you're describing. Having kept our friends from IEC waiting, Joe. I thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you for indulging us. Oh, of course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I see would like to just stop by saying they're, they're uh, really encouraged and uh, on this bold move of changing this management uh, organization around and believe it uh, at, this, at this time of the in the project. So I think that's a great move, and we're looking forward to all kinds of uh, improvements in the uh, in the rollout. Um, our report is on page 41 of your CPC book. Uh, the IEC is only reporting on the New York City transit portion of Omni while CND is rebaselining the project, which includes undertaking an assessment of the commuter railroad scope and strategy. They are also reevaluating and prioritizing change orders that affect customer usage and operations and the potential impact of the schedule. Regarding the New York City transit portion, subway and bus validator installations, open payment rollout, fare capping, development of paratransit, and reduced fare programs have all been completed or are under development. Next major element to be introduced is the New York City Transit configurable vending machine installation with a forecasted completion in fourth quarter of 2024, which the IEC believes uh, is achievable and is commending the MTA for not missing a step on getting that, com that completion data out there. Quality control issues, uh, commuter rail road scope, outstanding change orders, and resource availability risks we're all being managed through the new CND project man organization and are detailed in our report in your committee book. And that concludes my comments for today, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And, you know, whenever we do a project rebaselining of this um, of this kind, I, I, I just say that our friends at the IEC, we've actually you know, made it clear we welcome them keeping close tabs on our progress because an extra pair of eyes in you know, transition this, comp this complex is, is useful. So thank you in advance for the work that you're, you're going to do to help us along. Jamie? Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move on to uh, the presentation uh, update from our infrastructure business unit led by Dana Hecht. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to try and do this. 
I seem to be giving presentations during allergy season each time, so I apologize. Um, today, I'll be providing an overview of infrastructure's 2022 accomplishments, along with our 2023 goals. Uh, also be pro providing insight into our expansive structural repair and painting program and the recent techniques that we have incorporated for more effective delivery of this critical work. So infrastructure is responsible for a diverse and immense portfolio of assets. And as you can see, we have a very diverse and robust $9 billion program. We span the phases from scoping through construction, supporting our core infrastructure related to power, facilities, storm fortification for all of New York City transit, subways, buses, and Staten Island railways. And although it might not be the sexiest portion of MTA's portfolio, these improvements are critical to the safety and the reliability of the system. And thanks to our structural repairs, we don't need to slow down trains due to dangerous structural conditions. And thanks to the, for the work that we do in our shops and depots, we have the space we need to maintain our fleets and keep our trains and buses in service. Thanks to our power work, our wayside power work, there are fewer power disruptions. And of course, our resiliency work helps us prevent damage and recover faster when storms do hit. Customers may not see our work directly, but it's thanks to the work that's done by the infrastructure business unit that we can provide the service that our customers rely on. And in 2022, infrastructure delivered across our portfolio with almost $2.4 billion in commitments, and we completed 21 contracts with a total value of $655 million. As highlighted on this slide, among key projects awarded was the Jamaica Bus Depot Design Build Project. This project will replace the existing facility with a brand new facility, along with 60 new charging stations. Also awarded and addressing critical resiliency and system redundancy on the A-line in the Rockaways was the Rockaway Bundle Design Build. In addition to their benefits to the core infrastructure, these two projects contain 20% local hiring provisions. This demonstrates our commitment not only to our system, but to the communities that serve our systems, our systems serve. <clears throat> We also completed a number of resilience-focused projects last year, including this new state-of-the-art Clifton Shop, which is forms, uh, storm fortified on, it's on Staten Island, and the Harrison Canarsie Line substations, which support the CBTC for the L Line. And this year, we intend to keep up that pace. In 2023, we look forward to awarding $1.3 billion of awards. This includes our last two yard fortifying project, fortification projects from the Superstorm Sandy program. Those are the Westchester and Corona Yard projects. Along with other critical resiliency projects that will help keep water out of the system during heavy rain and other major weather events. On the completion side, we're also on pace to complete over $2 billion worth of projects, and most notably, the Coney Island Yard and the 207 Street Yard, which I will be providing brief updates on later in this presentation. Today, I'm going to focus on one of the critical elements in our program, and that's the structures. Elevated line structures are the infrastructure that are utilized by the subway trains to travel above ground. They're an iconic part of the Attleboro streetscape, and these structures keep our trains for New York City Transit's above ground lines and keep debris from reaching the street. Major investment is necessary to preserve the safe and efficient operation of our elevated lines constructed primarily of steel with concrete supports. They're constantly battered by atmospheric elements, de-icing chemicals, and water infiltration. All of these things can erode our structural elements. 
If left unaddressed, these defects can and will compromise the safety and reliability of the structure, which can lead to disruptions to service and expensive emergency repairs. Line structure painting is a means of pre preservation that when applied correctly <clears throat> and at the right time, it eliminates the need for rage, major rehabilitation and even replacement. This is also the means by which we deal with lead paint that may exist still on some of our structures by removing the old lead-based paint and applying a new environmentally friendly epoxy-based paint. In addition to the aforementioned benefits, these structural repairs also provide a benefit to the <clears throat> an aesthetic benefit for the communities as well. So we have been tackling this at an unprecedented rate. New York City Transit has 60 miles of elevated structure. Our current capital plan aims to repair nearly half at 26 and a half miles. This is more than six times the amount of the 2015 to 2019 capital plan. Currently, there's more than $1 billion worth of structural repair and paint projects that are in construction or due to be awarded this year. And in this picture, you can see in the forefront a currently renewed structure, an M line. This is in Brooklyn. And in the background, you see the J line that needs repair and paint. And this is part of a contract that was awarded in December of 2022. So is scheduled to be addressed shortly. So we're not just doing more of this work. We're doing it more effectively and we're doing it more efficiently. The creation of C&D has brought experts from across the MTA under one roof to share knowledge. This came to fruition with, through a collaboration with Bridges and Tunnels. Bridges and Tunnels having a proven track record for a successful structural repair and painting program along with strong industry relationships, brought lessons learned on keeping our bridges in good condition to all of C&D to apply across the entire agency. In late 2021, a pilot was conducted with infrastructure on a section of the Culver Line that utilized bridges and tunnels, means and methods for the abrasive blast, <clears throat> for the removal of paint through abrasive blasting, updated paint specifications that streamlined the approval process, and better techniques that protect the structure from water infiltration. And in this picture, you, see two, you can see an example of a beam prior to paint removal, the abrasive blast, the, sorry, the abrasive blasting was utilized to clean the paint from the structure. And an advantage of that as well is if there's defects in the element, it better identifies because as you see below, it's a very clean surface. That is not a painted beam. That's clean after the paint is removed. This new blasting methods and the materials extend the, uh, ex extend the expected painting cycle from every 15 years to every 30 years. And these benefits ultimately mean less work on the structures and therefore also less disruption for the riders. So completed in early 2022, the Culver pilot was a great success. And thanks to this success, we're taking this approach across our entire system. Bridges and Tunnels worked with the infrastructure project team to immediately implement this in our White Plains and Dyer Avenue line bridge painting contract that was awarded this past May of 2022. We are excited to advance the remainder of our painting program with this new approach. I'll now provide brief updates on three projects, Colney Island Yard, 207 Street Yard, and the bus radio system. And given the celebration of Earth Day and all of the great work that's being done by the MTA agency-wide, it's perfect timing to provide progress on our two largest yard resiliency projects. 
So starting with Coney Island Yard, which is the largest combined train storage and maintenance facility in North America, Superstorm Sandy wreaked havoc on it with service shut down for almost two weeks due to extensive damage. Thanks to this project, the entire facility is now protected against future storms with all perimeter flood protection in place. The project is approximately 98% complete and is expected to be substantially complete by June of this year. Next is the 207 yard, which is a similar proposition with three independent projects, but is being managed by one project management team to prepare this vital facility against future storms. And as you could see by the status on the slides, these projects are also progressing well. The final update is on the bus radio system. The new system is replacing an antiquated analog radio technology that is 35 years old. And it's being replaced with a new digital system. The new system also provides emergency alar alarms for the operators and computer aided dispatch with automatic, automatic vehicle location that's being utilized currently in the new bus command center through centralized dispatching. The bus command center began this operation in February of 22. This improvement will bring new efficiencies in supporting the 6,000 plus fleet bus operations throughout the five boroughs. And as this committee knows, this has been a challenging project from the beginning with contractor performance issues related to poor project management and the pace of bus installations specifically. Our team continues to work with the contractor to improve performance. We have begun to make progress. 32 of 36 base stations are currently transmitting and 34 are expected to be transmitting by the end of the calendar year. Bus installations had been slower than anticipated due to an inadequate number of installers. However, a new training program has been instituted in a new state of the art training facility the first class of graduating installers was February 27th, and we are seeing a continued and steady progression in installations. In January, we were at 256 bus installs, and by the end of this month, we expect to be at at least, or at, at least 700 buses. I'm being told that we might actually best the number that you see on the slide. We are, however, in the process of evaluating the quality of the coverage areas and some occurring system interference. Based upon the bus installation rate, we now are currently forecasting the overall substantial completion to be August of 2024. I will now turn it over to the IEC, and I welcome any questions at the conclusion of their report. Thank you. Thank you. The IEC is reporting on four infrastructure projects this month. Uh, they begin, the reports begin on page 15 of your book. On Coney Island Yard, overall this project is 98% complete with the current budget and estimated completion of $524 million, an increase of $3.8 million since our last report, primarily due to repairs to the signal system. And the IEC concurs with the project's $524 million estimated completion. Regarding schedule, C&D now forecasts substantial completion to be June of 2023, a slip of three months since last report due to signal cable replacement, as well as testing and commissioning of signal system and flood barrier equipment. The IEC concurs with the revised substantial completion date. At this point in the project, there are a few risks, significant risks remaining, and those are spelled out in your CPC book with their respective mitigations. The IC would like to point out that based on the size of the complexity of this Coney Island Yard facility, the project team has done a tremendous job of implementing storm recovery and resiliency protection to ensure the effective delivery of service for MTA's customers while the rail yard remained fully operational. On 207th Street Yard, overall this project is 92% complete with the current budget and estimated completion of $643 million, an increase of $9.8 million since last report largely due to overruns in TA labor and support services, CND has identified savings and maintained sufficient risk reserve to fund this shortfall. The IC has reviewed project costs and believe the project can be completed within the latest EAC. 
Regarding schedule, the latest submission by the contractor pulls the, back the schedule two months to the original substantial completion date of November of 2023. This is accomplished by advancing the signal system breakdown testing, followed by installation and field testing of new signal equipment. The IC finds project substantial completion date of November 2023 will be challenging. While the project has identified mitigations to the top risks, which are outlined in your book, the IEC believes that January 2024 substantial completion is possible here. On the 207th Street Seward project, this project stands at 63% uh, complete with a budget of $152 million and an estimated completion of $163 million, which has not changed since last report. C&D has a budget modification in place in process to cover the cost of for a CCM and a higher than expected utility relocation cost, and the IEC concurs with this EAC. Regarding schedule, since the last report, the contractor's substantial completion date has moved from April to November of 2024. CND has not accepted this change and is working with the contractor to improve the forecast for substantial completion. The IC agrees that the contractor can improve on the schedule and complete this work by June of 2024. We have taken into consideration that major activities such as manhole, regulated construction, and pipe jacking can be done concurrently at multiple locations over the 14 months remaining on the project. The top risks and respective mitigations are detailed in your book. On bus radio, this project is 70% complete, and C&D's estimate completion is $330 million. The IEC forecast an estimate of complete, a completion of $360 million, which is an increase of $10 million since our last report due to delays, the impact of change orders, and commercial issues. A budget modification will be necessary to reconcile the budget and estimated completion. The IC would like to note that the project has made progress in several critical areas. The production bus installation began in November of 22, which immediately followed pilot testing finishing in October. Prototype installation of additional bus types and a new training program instituted by the contractor to cut down on training and certification time, both key to meeting the production plan, which cut off to a slow start. The bus radio installation at seven depots with plans to be at 10 depots by July of 2023 and completion of all base stations except Toad Hill and Kearney, which are planned for September 23 and February 24, respectively. The IEC concurs with C&D's forecast project completion in the third quarter, providing the contract that continues to accelerate their installations and achieves full production rate now planned at, for July of 2023. The IEC notes that Department of Buses is making sufficient buses, installation location, and resources available to enable the contractor to meet this installation plan. The top project risks, which were previously noted in earlier reports concerning contractor training and resources, radio coverage and system reliability and performance, and their respective mitigations are detailed in our report in your committee book. And that concludes the IEC comments on digital bus radio and our reports for today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chair, if I might just emphasize a couple things from the infrastructure report, and we thank the IEC for their, their diligence in, in reviewing these projects. First of all, the 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 overcoating story. I mean, I know it's getting you know late in the day of uh, board committees, so it's so um, uh, you know not always the the sexiest projects. But you know these hundreds of miles of line structures that Dana was showing that um, are you know spaghetti through the neighborhoods of so you know so many great New York City neighborhoods. Um, you know, it's not only the aesthetics of those structures. Um, that are important here in the the overcoating work, but you know overcoating means maintaining the steel so that it has a longer life. And I think you know this this is really one of those things that not only ensures that our system can continue to operate uh, in a reliable way, but also um, that we maintain our presence in New York City neighborhoods in positive ways. And the uh, process that Dana described for us ramping up the uh, number of miles of, of overcoating that we're doing per capital program could only have been done with construction and development in place because really it's Dana Hecht uh, running the infrastructure business unit and Joe Keen who runs the bridges and tunnels unit sitting together you know th looking at the best practices for 
painting and overcoating bridges uh, in the Bridges and Tunnels organization, uh, bringing that knowledge in and using it to deal with our subway line structures that have been the source of that. So it's a great uh, example of a best practice. And I also just want to emphasize that um, you know the bus radio project has been a uh, a, a sort of uh, uh, albatross around my neck, as it was, uh, you know, my uh, around my predecessor's neck, uh, and uh, you know, Mark Roach, who runs our our delivery uh, unit overall. Um, I, you know, I think we we have we are pleased with the progress. Um, we are uh, we are certainly not pleased with the overall contractor performance that we've had, but we have had some interaction. I had all the 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 senior um, you know North American executives of our contractor uh, meet me out at Jackie Gleason uh, bus depot a couple months ago to sit and really look each other in the eyes and say we're going forward. Here's how we're resolving the problems and getting to the installations. We're on a trajectory where installations are occurring that could take us to completion of the program if our contractor can hit those installations. And so um, I think the board can be assured that uh, everyone here that's involved in this is going to be strident uh, in ensuring that we hold them to that commitment that they've made to ramp up the teams and the professionalism of the teams, the training of the team so that we get those units installed and get out of this program. It is a very important technology improvement that we're making for 6,000 buses. It is not simple, but it is well overdue. Uh, Albert and then Mr. Solomon. Uh, since we've been talking about the elevated structures and how they run through so many New York neighborhoods, um, we've all heard, obviously, things falling from them. Um, there's safety issues. There's vibration 24-7 from trains going back and forth. I think we were told at one of the committee meetings, probably transit, that the elevated structures are basically inspected once a month. Is that still the case? I, I would have to get back to you on uh, transit's inspection routine. I, I would say that those issues you're describing, the capital, you know, ramping up capital maintenance in a significant way, the way that we've done it, that's the best solution. And we're very focused on uh, identifying areas of concern in the 20 year needs assessment um, through looking at the line structure. So uh, on the capital side, we're working very hard on that. And we'll get back to you about what transit is doing on, on uh, inspection. Thank you. A uh, question on the bus radio system. Um, one of the risks um, flagged by the IEC is um, about uh, interference issues. And it was mentioned here that some equipment's being installed at two depots in Staten Island and that there's a request for a cellular backup. So question is, is this only a Staten Island issue? And what are the redundancies that have been built into this entire project with respect to outages and interference? Um, so I'll just say, no, it's not only a Staten Island issue. Um, it, um, it is um, uh, it's sort of complex to go back and identify. It, it relates to um, th this issue in particular relates to differences in the way that some of the other providers have started to use their technology that they weren't doing at the beginning of the project uh, that has to be adapted to. But our expectation is that our contractor is going to give us a system that works reliably and in a redundant way. And so that's the current technology solution that's being piloted to try to address that. Thanks, Jamie. But then in relation to the cellular backup, is there, you know, in terms of redundancies, you know, best practices when you roll out a digital system like this? Um, and if it's not contemplated now, sort of what are the cost implications? I see here design review and some other things that would need to be done in integration. So. Yeah, that's right. So that basically the redundancy is we are in the process of erecting or improving dedicated towers for bus radio communications on their own dedicated system, and then the redundancy is the cellular system. And in some ways, it's also the case in reverse, that the towers are a redundancy for the, the cellular system. Um, but that's why, that's why that's being pursued as an option, to ensure that we have redundancy where those interferences have been located. Um, and no other questions or comments uh, on the presentations. Um, I think we have no procurements this month, and somewhat symbolic in light of the fact that Dave Cannon, who we're all accustomed to hearing present 
C and D, and before that, MTACC procurements is headed towards retirement. We celebrated him last week. He's one of the people that everybody in the MTA uh, has enjoyed working with. So uh, Dave's chair is empty today, but uh, symbolically, um, it's going to be empty for a while. <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll, we will. I just wanted to call the board members' attention to the fact that Dave is, is retiring. We have all love working with him. Um, with that, uh, if there's no other business, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So move, second, no objection, we are in, in adjournment. Thanks. Sometimes the public may call us train drivers. Honestly, it doesn't bother me because I know they don't know. My name is Keisha Cole. I'm a train operator, and I've been with MTA for six years. I work on the 7 line. It's approximately 21 stops from Main Street to 34th Street, and it takes about 36 minutes from end to end. My name is Jim Van Name. I'm a train operator for New York City Transit. I've been here about three and a half years. I operate the train on the Q line, which end to end is approximately 44 stops, and it takes me about an hour to complete. My earliest train memory is I was a kid. I got on the F train with my mom. The first time I was on the train, I was excited. It was fun. I was raised on Staten Island, and my friends and I used to take Staten Island Ferry over to the city, and we used to ride the train all over the place. Uh, that's probably where I got my first love of the subways. As a train operator, there are two different ways you can pick up your train. You can pick up your train in the yard as a put-in, which means you okay your train for service and bring it into the terminal station, which is the last stop on the train line. Or you can actually pick it up from the terminal station. When preparing my train for service, I do various checks to make sure it's safe for myself and for the public. Once my day starts, I have about three round trips. I take passengers from Main Street to 34th Street and back to Main Street. That's one round trip. I start over at the yard, and then I have to do what we call a put-in. I have to prep the train for service, and then they send me out over to Stillwell Terminal, and then I go into service. I do my two trips up to 96th Street and back, and that pretty much completes my day. It usually takes anywhere from eight to eight and a half hours. At the end of the day, the two ways of finishing the job is to just walk up the train at the terminal station, at the last stop, and just sign out and go home, or to do a layup, take the train from the terminal station back to the yard, lay it up, put it away for the evening, and go home from there. I love the fact that I'm moving this big machine by myself. There have been times when I'm operating the train and I think that this is the greatest job ever. The things that I get to see when I'm going down the line and I'm seeing the sun come up, it's just so beautiful. This is my dream job. I love this job. And some of the amazing moments I see in this job is when I'm going over the Manhattan Bridge, sometimes at sunrise to see the sun coming up, or even better, sunset, to see the sun setting behind the Manhattan Bridge is, uh, is quite a sight. I pinch myself that I'm in such a great job and have that opportunity to see such great things. I enjoy transporting people from place to place. It's just a good thing. I feel like I'm doing something special. I love trains. I love operating the trains. I love being a part of New York City Transit. And knowing that I'm helping people get through their day and get to where they need to be gives me a lot of satisfaction. What does a record do? Hi, my name is Devin Mullen. I'm an assistant maintainer at the Verrazano Bridge and I've been with Bridge and Tunnel Authority for five years now. Well, basically we make sure that anything that happens on the bridge, whether it's a collision or a disabled vehicle, contractors working, we make sure everyone gets on and off the bridge safely. Any five minute delay turns into 20 minutes of traffic. The city is busy. Rush hour is, is, is tough, uh, you know, roadways are congested to begin with, so we want to make sure that we can keep those roadways clear and that's, you know, main function of a record driver. 
every day they save the day. You know, that, that little disabled vehicle, if that disabled vehicle is not removed, a lot of people are not getting to work in the morning. So their quick response is going to determine how the rest of the day is going to go for a lot of people. They are the go-to guys. We depend on them on a daily basis and, and they perform their job very well. Our truck is our main tool. We make sure it works well and then it serves us well. The light duty wrecker is usually we use for flat tires, overheat, small vehicles. The medium duties, they're basically utility. Anything we need other than tractor trailers and heavy trucks. Anything that requires heavy boom lifting, uh, winch outs, things like that, we're gonna use the heavy wrecker. Working on the roadway, it's a dangerous condition. You have vehicles flying by you at 60 miles an hour. People aren't paying attention half the time, so you do run the risk of getting hit. So, so they never know what's gonna happen when they're up there. I mean, there's different types of Well, we don't have legal counsel joining us uh, for some reason. I think uh, we're unsafe. Oh, you're oh, Paige, you move seats. Oh, wow, wow. All right, welcome, welcome to the front row. Welcome to the front row. All right, well, welcome everyone to the finance committee, the final meeting of committee day. There's been a lot of grousing today about the length of this meeting. Actually, I think it's quite we're quite timely today, so no complaining. Everyone settle in, and I'll call the meeting to order. David, do we have any? Do you have any, <laughs> David, do we have any public speakers? Good, af Shh. good afternoon, Mr. Chair. We have two members of the public speaking today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds left to conclude your remarks. Our first speaker will be Rachel Foss, followed by Jason Anthony. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rachel Foss. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for reInvent Albany. We advocate for more transparent and accountable authorities like the MTA. News reports indicate a deal on MTA funding and the state budget is emerging. While it appears that all parties intend to fill the MTA's deficit, it's unclear whether funding will prov be provided for service expansions or to avoid fair hikes as requested by many of our fellow advocates. Also unknown is what policy changes will be included. In particular, we support greater capital spending transparency through the capital program dashboard, which was included by the Senate and is also a bill sponsored by Senator Ramos and Bobby Carroll in the Assembly. We have the following thoughts in response to potential proposal floated in news reports from Friday. On increasing the payroll mobility tax for only New York City employers, we supported the governor's original proposal for an increase for the entire MTA region because it would put the MTA in the most stable, solid ground and be remitted directly to the MTA. We opposed the Senate's attempt to exempt certain employers in Hudson Valley counties from the existing PMT. And attempts to exempt all employers outside of New York City from a new increase are similarly problematic. Employers outside of New York City in the MTA region are part of the same regional economy that depends on a healthy MTA and have a shared responsibility with all MTA stakeholders to make the MTA whole. Um, New York City taxpayers already pay an outsized amount of taxes to the MTA according to the Citizen Budget Commission research. 
On one-shot payments from the state, we believe these would probably come from the general fund and would require yearly appropriation. This means that it's more vulnerable, vulnerable to raids or cuts during the budget process, and one-shot funds should only be a bridge to new recurring MTA-dedicated taxes. Lastly, on the free bus pilot, we believe they are best accompanied by inclusion of automated traffic enforcement mechanisms to improve bus speeds. Additionally, sufficient state funding must be provided to offset all costs to the MTA. And to that end, there should be a public report from the MTA regarding implementation um, that shows the costs, ridership, et cetera. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our second and final speaker is Jason Anthony. Hey, Neil. Hey, Kevin. And the rest of the Finance Committee meeting. Uh, last Wednesday, we found out on the New Jersey Transit Corporation Board meeting that in 2025, they will face a fiscal cliff. And at the same time, they unveil that they're even considering congestion pricing, Kevin. That's interesting news to hear. But their own governor, Phil Murphy, has said publicly opposing congestion pricing. But one of their board members, Bob Gordon, said publicly in their board meeting that even him is supporting congestion pricing. But what are we talking about? On one hand, they're having a fiscal cliff that they have easily avoided five years back having fair increase that they didn't five years ago. While us, we're having a fiscal cliff and we are asking them to continue as a region that we are to support us to our congestion pricing idea, but they're acting very selfishly, and then we are facing a fiscal cliff ourselves, and regions like our beloved Neil, that pays $600 a month to travel to New York City. It is not fair, it is not, a uh, great idea that states like New Jersey are acting very selfish and to serve their own interests. It is time for them to pay their own their fair share to our region. That's all I have to say. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Um, thank you. Mr. Chair, I was just informed that there are two remote speakers. Um, the first remote speaker is Christopher Greif, who will be followed by Andy Pollack. And good afternoon. I thought I almost forgot me already. Uh, Christopher D. Grimes, sorry, cannot be there. But I do want to discuss about this concern of the fare. As you know, as General has been mentioning, uh, the, about the fair fare, we need to make sure that low-income families, including seniors and people with disabilities, we cannot lose that funding to make sure that every low-income seniors and people with disabilities are getting the, the payment to get on the bus and get on the subway, especially accessory. Right now, if we go somewhere else, the fare is a little more higher. Here, it's lucky we can get it on accessory, which is the cheapest one, 275. But we, if the fare goes up, a lot of low-income families, seniors and disabled cannot afford this. This is not fair to them. And if we are doing any fare hike or pucker hearings, we ask you to please put in the book how much is the reduced fare price. We also want to make sure that the monthly stays where it is because people who use it the monthly on the subways can balance their budget for Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare because it does help them to budget their budget so they can travel on any of the bus or the subway, or the express bus, or the SPS buses. We ask you to please do so. So therefore, families, low-income families, seniors, and people with disabilities can get on a bus and the subway safely. And the ones who do pay the fare. Thank you. Thank, um, thank you. Our final speaker is Andy Pollack, also remote. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, Neil, and good afternoon, everyone. So I am speaking today, as usual, for behalf of Passengers United. 
So over the weekend, I notified Jack Nierberg and Charlton D'Souza about the news from Albany, first reported by Newsday, that it sounds like Albany is going to be sending some money over to the MTA as part of the upcoming fiscal year 2024 budget. Any day now, hopefully we're going to be getting some excellent news from the state capitol in Albany. Now, I have been hearing rumblings, especially Jack and Charlton on their behalf, that there is a pilot program that's being in the works to have two free buses in each borough. Now, specifically in Queens, I did speak with Charlton about this, and we do agree that the Q5253 route does need to be free because it goes from Far Rockaway and it does serve all the way up to Woodside. And then hopefully maybe a couple east-west routes can be reevaluated, like the Q1213, the 46, the 43 in Queens. Those are busy routes to see a high amount of ridership out of all the Queens buses. And hopefully um, Manhattan buses can... Basically, I'm hoping that everybody will be able to benefit from two routes being free in each borough once he provides us the money. So that's pretty much it, Neil. Thank you for letting me speak today. And hopefully I'll be back speaking to the committees next month. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. That concludes the public speaking all session. Right, thank you to all our speakers. Um, approval of the minutes, March 27th meeting. Can I have a motion to approve? Awesome. Second. Second. Discussions, edited solutions. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you very much. 2023 Committee Work Plan. It's in the Committee Book, page 13. There was one small change around the annual report on the variable rate debt. I know that may throw you all off that we're going to be moving that to next month. <laughs> Hopefully everyone exceeds to that change. I know that's amazing that we're waiting on that. All right. Not going to sleep, uh, Hayda said. All right. David, the uh, budget watch, please, sir. Certainly, as fast as possible. I didn't say that. I didn't say fast as possible. I just said budget watch. Don't worry. Results are for operations through March and subsidies through April and are measured against the adopted budget. Fairbox revenue was $25 million favorable, or 7% in March, and over the first three months of the year was favorable by $36 million, or 3.5%, mostly reflecting favorable ridership, but also some higher than projected average fare. Ridership has been trending consistently with the midpoint of the McKenzie scenarios in the mid-60% range since September, although March was more favorable. Fairbox revenue through March, however, remains $393 million, or 27% less than the first three months of 2019. <clears throat> Toll revenue was $16 million favorable, or 8.7% in March, and was $36 million, or 7% favorable, year-to-date reflecting higher than projected traffic. Operating expenses were $21 million or 1.6% favorable in March. Year-to-date expenses were $100 million favorable or 2.6%. Year-to-date, 62% or $61 million is attributable to favorable payroll and health and welfare costs due to vacancies, including additional overtime to cover for those vacancies, with the remainder predominantly timing-related. Overtime, which is included in those expense numbers, was $28 million unfavorable in March, or 41%, and was $46 million unfavorable year-to-date, or 21%. Overruns were primarily due to vacancy and absentee coverage. Debt service was $27 million favorable, or 10% in March, and $42 million favorable, or 5% year-to-date, due to the timing of debt issuances, debt service deposits, as well as lower-than-budgeted variable rates. Subsidies were $93 million unfavorable year-to-date through April, or 7%, primarily reflecting results for the real estate transaction taxes, which were unfavorable by $104 million, or 28%. The petroleum business tax, which was favorable by $8 million, or 4%. The payroll mobility tax, which was favorable by $16 million, or 3%. And the for hire vehicle surcharge, which was unfavorable by $12 million, or 10%. So the real estate taxes and the for hire vehicle were unfavorable. The PMT and the petroleum business tax were favorable. Taken together, operating results through March and operating budget subsidies through April, these results were favorable by $120 million against the budget, or 7%. And if there are any questions. Questions? Hearing none, please, sir. 
Um, yeah, just a, a couple comments. Yeah, I, I think the takeaway is on the budget, or, you know, we're kind of on track, you know, within the margin of error, you know, 100 million. I'd say the, you know, ridership we watched, which did very well in March, is kind of flattened out a little bit in April. So we're kind of right on target. If you look at some of the graphs, it looks like we've actually started to trend above the McKinsey midpoint. That was a good March number. We're kind of back to the McKinsey mid midpoint, but you know, with the school holidays, we'll see how it how it uh, how it plays out. Um, you know, on the you know the economically sensitive taxes. The one thing you heard David say, they, they you know the real estate transaction taxes took a pretty pretty big hit. So it's definitely something to watch. You know, we collect over over a billion a year in in real estate taxes, and they're off. You know, hundred-ish million just in a in a couple months. So, um, but that said, the other taxes are are hanging in there. So we'll just just have to uh, have to see it. Um, you know, in terms of expenses, same thing. Running a little bit under, mainly you know vacancies over time up a little bit, as, as David David mentioned. Um, you know, looking forward, we're all obviously all waiting for the state budget. Um, you know, I'd say that. Uh, Obviously, a little bit later than we're all all hoping. So, other than the uh, anxiety of coming in every day and <laughs> hoping to hear hear a deal's done, we're you know we're still on track. Obviously, we're running out of time. We would have loved to been know our path by this point and be able to talk about what we're doing on you know on the on the fare and toll plan. So there might you know depending on uh, when the budget does does pass, you know, we might be, uh, you know, we'll see how the exact timing on the fair side works out. Um, you know, as you've read in the papers, it seems like uh, a deal's getting closer, but it's never done until it's done. I'd say the, you know, the good, the good thing in the discussions is there's always, you know, every party at the table has recognized and offered a good amount of funding for MTA to you know meet meet our goals, it's been the the components that have been more more of the back and forth. So uh, stay tuned. Hopefully something soon. As you know, extender I think was put in place till till Friday. But uh, hopefully, fingers crossed. Maybe this will be the last extender for for this cycle. But I don't know. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. I mean, seriously, I think this is uh, wonderful news of what we've been hearing, whether the our public speakers or Kevin's commentary, uh, the governor's leadership, your consistency in Jano's about about demanding clarity about what we need, the governor's leadership on what she believes we need in the legislature, obviously coming together to provide for what is a real chasm. Um, I do have a question for you, David, if you don't mind. Going to Budget Watch, thank you for putting these graphs in. I don't know if people are looking at these, but they are helpful, if in small font pictures, uh, for what the issue is. If you wouldn't mind a couple of clarifying questions, I find the upper right-hand box to be the most useful, which is the MTA-wide ridership box, because obviously that is the primary reason for our budget chasm. Uh, not that this committee can support the uh, increased uh, return to riders, but we certainly are affected by it. So could you remind me a couple of things? When we write MTA-wide ridership, what is included in that number? It, it's all of our operating agencies, obviously with the exception of B&T. So it's transit, bus, and subway, MTA bus, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and Staten Island Railway. So it's excluding bridges and tunnels. Correct. Okay, good. And then the second thing is, again, my eyes are very very weak at uh, 52 years old, I guess. Um, could you help me just maybe going forward put underneath the month what the, pers the actual number is? I mean, clearly you can see it's touching 70% what looks to yeah, be. Yeah, it's actually 69.3, I believe. Okay. Month. What month is that for? I March. Can't... March. Okay. So you're talking the real data now, but we're looking back one month. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So March, Fine. Was, March was a good, if you look at the graph, it looks like it's touching right, towards right, the right. top end is probably when we had April and it might come back. Closer, closer to so the we're in the time machine here a little bit. Uh, we're we're back a month, but you're you're in the present day. It seems like okay. But but just to remind everybody, this total ridership, um, or at least on a revenue basis, is 
you know, we're, the budget projects 69% on average for, for the calendar year 23. So we're, we're getting up to kind of where, you know, we need to be. We can't really peter out at 65 or 66%. We got to, you know, by end of the year, hopefully start to, to get 70, 71% to get the average over the year. To, to, and, and just to, to remind my colleagues, if we follow the solid green line in that box, the, the midpoint, the MTA wide ridership, that tracks effectively with our budgeted numbers. Yeah. So if the ridership numbers track along, knowing that, for example, real estate is a totally un, uh, uncorrelated to ridership item, if we track along with the ridership number, the solid line, the midpoint, we're tracking along with our budget roughly. R roughly, it also depends on the average ticket price, which drives yes. revenue, which has been a bit on the favorable side and so forth, but yes. Okay, so just, how, just for all of us here playing here and those playing at home, following along with how we're progressing, I think that's a useful graph for us all to pay attention to. All right, uh, Marsha on the video screen, Finance Watch. And we'll oh, try sorry. to make it bigger for you. For yeah, I think I think the size is, I mean, we do have the technology. It's digital. We can yeah. afford the uh, bigger, maybe Either next page. Either that or page. I'll bring special glasses Or special you. glasses. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> very, very kind. Okay, enough humor. Marsha, Finance Watch, please. Hi, good afternoon. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Before I start, I just want to say a welcome to Olga Chernat, who is the Deputy Chief Financial Services, replacing Pat McCoy. And starting next month, she'll take over Finance Watch, and we are pleased to have her back, um, especially uh, our team. She is my boss. Um, just a couple quick items. Uh, you'll see in the book, we mentioned something about the P3 ADA upgrade project. That's really just to give you a status update about the um, project that is going to provide upgraded elevators at 13 subway stations. The developer is going to be uh, pricing their bonds next week. And once that financing is in place, the project will be able to proceed. They'll be closed by the end of the week, uh, settled on the deal by the end of the week. Um, and included in the pledged assets to the bondholders are the payments that are required by MTA under the project agreement, such as the availability payments and the progress payments. Uh, so our team is gonna be involved in the pricing to, to monitor and, and uh, keep tabs of that. Um, and we will provide a status update for you next month, probably. Um, and just the uh, monthly fuel hedging program, the March 29th, we executed a 1.6 million gallon ultra low sulfur diesel fuel hedge at an all in price of approximately $2.44 per gallon. Details are in the book. And one last thing, I just want to mention, we have our annual disclosure statement and our combined continuing disclosure filings. That's that annual big push that we need to do by the end of April. We'll be posting that on April 28th. Um, and I just want to give a shout out and thank you to all of the agency staff that have provided um, valuable information. Jim McGovern, um, his, his whole team has been working so hard to get the It'll be unaudited, but it'll meet the, our requirement, the un, unaudited financials for us to post. Um, our special disclosure counsel, Hawkins, Delafield, and Wood, who's leading the effort, along with our deputy general counsel, uh, Dwight Qua. So just a big thank you to everyone, because it is a big effort um, every year, and we appreciate that. And that's it for Finance Watch. Any questions for Finance Watch? Okay, so Marsha, maybe as a final task for you, for your and thank you for your service on this committee uh, since Pat left, just remind everyone, I mean, the graph on the top of the Finance Watch, I think, is useful and instructive for us to understand what's been happening in the markets. So can you just compare for us what the, the average fixed rate was sort of a year ago to now? Maybe just, again, it's always valuable to instruct our committee about what you're seeing and so we can be more... Uh, adept at understanding. So can you just give us a little lesson about what this graph is telling us, please? Yeah, so the, and I may defer to Olga, who has, a, you know, experience in this as well. Um, the, the graph that we're um, using is the bond buyer revenue bond index, and that has, I believe, 20 revenue bonds in it. Um, Olga, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and that average life of 30 years is kind of showing the, you know, the typical average life of, of the similar to what we would usually issue, which is a 30 year level debt service. That's our, uh, the assumptions in the financial plan. So as you can see, we've, we track, we started tracking this um, in 
August in terms of this, this chart. So you can see the, issu the issuances that we have um, and what changes it not only is the market volatility, but it's also the average life of the bonds that we're issuing. So the longer term uh, bonds with an average life that are you know above 25 years, closer to 30 years, you can see those above the line um, versus the TBTA 2023A, for example, average life of seven years, that was a refunding. And you can see that the um, interest rate was you know 2.56%. Uh, so the last deal we had was the sales tax deal. And if you remember when I mentioned it last month, it was during a time that was already a little volatile and it was the day before the uh, bank bank uh, failures um, uh, uh, were announced. Uh, so it was a fairly, you know, it was, was somewhat volatile that week. So you can see that interest rate did come up a little bit higher than what we were benching, um, benching against. Um, Olga, I don't know, do you want to add any insight that you've seen from your experience in the muni market as well? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yeah, um, you know, um, I, I think uh, Marcia gave a great explanation of what's happening on the graph, uh, but very broadly, right? Uh, uh, the line, um, the bond buyer revenue bond index line, right, which is, um, uh, that represents um, the benchmark yield. Um, and a, again, as Marcia said, that's an index that's comprised of 20 revenue bonds. So it's a composite index. Uh, and we uh, measuring our performance relative to the benchmark. So you can see, uh, based on different characteristics of our bonds, we, uh, you know, come fairly close to the benchmark, or we below or under the yields. Um, I would also point out that um, uh, another factor that kind of drives the the various performance of our credit as well as the benchmark is the credit quality of the bonds in the benchmark versus credit quality of the bonds offered by the MTA. Yeah, just uh, one thing to add on. So if you think a big picture or kind of an interesting environment, if you look at the graph, what you'll notice is, and this is of reflective of long-term rates, not short-term rates, which you probably hear a lot about what the Federal Reserve influences. So long-term rates actually were much higher around the end of 22, early 2023, and they've actually come down quite a bit. They, you know, by look, if you look at the graph, it's come down. That's because inflation has started to come down and the, the market has started to view that the Fed's getting towards the end of their tightening cycle. So usually where you have a yield curve where it's rates are lower on the short end and higher the, the longer you borrow, it's actually inverted right now. And so our, our borrowing cost of our borrowing in the 10, 20, or 30 year part of the curve is actually lower than current, current variable rates. So I, I would say that, you know, there was some fear around the beginning of the year that, gee, runaway inflation could lead to runaway interest rates now it's much more balanced, and it's really, you know, is inflation going to keep coming down? Obviously, the the a lot of people say the the interest rates um, reflect a, a relatively high probability of a recession sometime over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, there's views all over mild recession, no recession, so forth, and and so on. So it's a, I would call it a fairly you know, given everything going on, it's a fairly benign interest rate environment from our perspective. Benign, but worse than but it was. Worse than, yeah. yeah, than it was back in, you know, early 2022, but kind of less scary than it was in early 20. And, and I, I bring it up not because I want to bore people with a history lesson about muni bonds or what the last year is like, but it would be useful if we had as a committee a rule of thumb in our heads that for every, in this case, if you see 3.15 in the far left of the graph to 3.64 at the far right, how 
sensitive we are. I know most of our, our uh, debt is long term, it's fixed rate, but with a half a point increase over that period of time, a rule of thumb in our total portfolio of, of bonds and issuance, what in fact it's worth to us if we had to issue things at a higher rate. I'm not putting you on the spot to give an answer, but I think that's worthy of us to think about as a committee what that actually does cost. Because again, we have not no control over uh, rates, but we certainly are affected by rates and worth worth thinking about. Okay, back to, back to the back to the agenda at hand. David, we have an action item, please, around FIMTECH. Over to you, sir. Certainly. This item seeks board approval to allow the First Mutual Transportation Assurance Company, FIMTECH, to indicate a capital markets-based reinsurance program by expanding FIMTECH's current traditional capital markets-based reinsurance program to include a catastrophe bond-based reinsurance transaction or similar parametric-based reinsurance contracts. The purpose of this transaction is to reduce FIMTECH's risk transfer rates through diversifying the reinsurer base from the traditional global reinsurance market to include capital markets. This will allow FIMTECH to create additional savings by employing a strategy of maximizing tension comp competition inside each market as well as between the two markets. Materials can be found on page 27 of the committee book and staff are available to answer any questions. Can I have a motion please? Thank you, David. Second? Second. Thank you. Any questions? Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to spend a little time with procurement. We're going to flip the order of what's in our book. I'd like to first start by um, thanking Kavesh for his incredible service. Uh, he is going to be Moving on to retirement, though, as he has reminded me many times, he is way too young for his retirement. Um, we will miss, first and foremost, his mellifluous voice, um, which I think we will not have any procurement person, past, present, or future, with such a, a stentorian and radio-ready voice as his. But, but more importantly, we've been we've been fortunate to have Kavesh's, I think, very thoughtful approach to procurement. I am sure that. Um, uh, that while his pension will not be cheap, that he has saved us far more in in being a diligent procurement officer. So thank you, Kavesh, for your, your tenure and your time, and we wish, wish you the best of luck. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Chair. And I'd just like to say um, it's been a privilege to and an honor to serve at the MTA and this great state of New York, not forgetting Connecticut. And, uh, you know, it's... it's um, I came in at a tumultuous time where, uh, you know, we had a great challenge and, and I think that one of the great uh, ideas of consolidating the, the entire procurement organization together with the supply chain was, was an excellent idea where we were able to focus on critical and key procurements and also leverage the, the might of the MTA, uh, should, should I say. Um, and, and we've seen some definite positive moves in that regard and you know so I leave a great team behind uh, thank you to the board for your cooperation and also your good counsel um, and uh, you know to the, to the the MTA folks um, it's been a great ride and um, it's a small world I'm, I'm sure somewhere along the line we will we will meet up and um, I wish you everything of the best thank you all right well you're not done oh. We're not done yet. Let's start with the HP contract, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. So there are two actions for Finance Committee approval this month in the amount of $88.6 million. These actions are found in the April Finance uh, Committee book on pages 32 to 38. The first action uh, is a modification to extend an all-agency competitive uh, procurement contract with HP Hewlett-Packard, Inc., to, pro to continue to provide managed print services for MTA and its operating agencies for three additional years. To date, there are an estimated 4,054 printers in the managed print services program and installed throughout various MTA locations. And, and, and board members, this is actually a good news story because when we started off this program in 2016, we had 13,000 plus printers. So we've reduced it dramatically, um, and it has come with significant savings, uh, much to the order of close on to $16 million over that program. So we want to continue with this contract, 
um, with a single service provider to service all the standardized in-scope imaging and output devices, which will allow for streamlining, streamlining of the equipment and maintenance process, uh, improve the level of service quality and responses for repairs and maintenance, reduce the number of imaging and output devices, and provide a central point of administration for, prospect, for proactive remote management for all in-scope devices. Uh, this three-year extension is projected to cost $17 million, which covers the existing fleet of leased devices as well, as well as maintains and supports the MTA's own devices are not under a lease structure. Um, on, on, a, on another note, we also have, men, we have a service level agreement with HP, which is at 97%. They have consistently exceeded the 97%. Um, so from that perspective, um, I submit this uh, procurement for board approval. Okay, any questions, David? Nope. Okay. Any questions on this procurement? I'm going to take a motion on this one first, please. I have a motion to approve the managed services. Sammy, second. Blanca, discussion. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstentions. Motion passes. Kavesh, the second procurement, please. Thank you. Um, so the second one is the award of a competitively negotiated services contract to Michael Baker Engineering to provide oversight services of the MTA's capital program for a four-year term with three one-year options to renew at the MTA's sole discretion in the sum of $71.6 million. The MTA requires the services of an independent transit engineering firm to perform periodic monitoring and oversight on projects in its capital program. Under this contract, Michael Baker will provide the MTA Capital Program Committee professional observations, evaluations, recommendations, and reports concerning key elements of the MTA's capital program. This includes the quality of work, adherence to the project and program budgets, adherence to schedules, project scope and functional requirements, and effective program and project management controls. After negotiations with Michael Baker, uh, Michael Baker had submitted its best and final offer, which represented a reduction of $22.6 million from its original proposal. And this represented a 24% reduction on their offer and was based on a heavily negotiated uh, reduction in pricing, reduction of the pro proposed number of personnel, hourly rate adjustments, profit and fee percentages, and also would MTA audit recommendations and overhead uh, rate reduction as well. So I'd like to turn to Michelle Woods, the MTA's Auditor General, for further discussion. Michelle. Thank you, Kavesh. Um, the independence of the IEC is critical to their oversight role, and one I personally take very seriously as the MTA Auditor General. Um, as, because of that, the current contract and the proposed new contract both include specifications related to confidentiality, conflict of interest, and independence of the contractor and subcontractor. The employees performing the work as the IEC are required to sign non-disclosure agreements and agree to hold all confidential information in strict confidence. The contractor is also prohibited from pr proposing on or working on any other capital program related work for the MTA, the prime contractor. Consistent with the current agreement, if a subcontractor the IEC, to the IEC, the prime IEC, would like to propose on any future MTA capital program project, they must first provide the MTA project manager in the Office of Construction Oversight with a written request, which identifies all the individuals and entities involved and sets forth in detail the nature of the relationship and why it would not constitute a conflict of interest. This must be reviewed and approved by the project manager at the OCO, which is an MTA employee, prior to the subcontractor being allowed to proceed. Um, I've committed to monitoring this um, very closely as we go forward in the new contract, even though it's not different from, from the old contract. I've also committed to um, establishing a, a written procedure, so it's really clear how we will be monitoring that, we'll, where we'll get the information from, how we can ensure not just what's in the contract, which, is, which requires the subcontractors to disclose and the prime contractor to disclose, but also as a detective control so that I'll be looking at any payments we make through both our PeopleSoft system as well 
well as our tracking through the uh, PSR system, which is our project uh, tracking system, as well as the B2G system, which tracks all subcontractors that are um, minority um, uh, business um, uh, firms so that we, we know how much is being paid since we don't have a direct con contractor relationship to them. Um, Paige, is there anything? Sure. I just wanted to, I, I moved up to the big table just to underscore um, a couple of things about the contract. Um, the contractor can enter into subcontracts, but that is only after the written consent from the MTA. So the MTA will provide written consent as to what that subcontract looks like and the services the subcontractor is going to provide and the terms of the subcontract. Also, um, any to avoid any actual or potential conflict of interest, the contractor shall be prohibited from using any subcontractor um, to, for these services, for the IEC services um, related to anything the subcontractor is doing for a capital project. And that includes also third-party contracts. So if a subcontractor wants to engage in services for any other entity, they need to get, um, that needs to be disclosed to the MTA, especially if the, um, that third-party contract requires the services or, um, uh, uh, agreement with the MTA. So there are a lot of um, provisions in the contract that uh, centers around any potential or actual conflicts of interest. Kim, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, just one thing, just Michelle, to be clear, in, in terms of the subcontractors, they're required to disclose MTA staff will be sharing that information with capital program uh, committee members, you know, with some frequency so the, the uh, committee itself can assess kind of the relationships or where, where, what firms might be doing something under the one contract versus another. Sure, and so you know, our contract with the prime contractor is, is our relationship, um, but I've, I've committed to developing a procedure that specifically talks about how we, within the MTA, how our project management will monitor it and will report out. And so yes, um, we will report any, any potential conflict to the um, CPC and to finance if, if they um, choose to have that information. That will explain, you know, yes, we have a subcontractor to our prime who does this work, however, they, pro they, they would like to propose on this other contract and this is why it's not a conflict of interest but and and we we have the ability within within the contract to to disallow that so if there is if there is a contract a, a conflict and um, we do not have to uh, approve for them to for do to do work where there would be a conflict a potential conflict okay uh, I think we've had we've had a number of discussions about this in other sessions and so I, I want to just give an opportunity for us to talk about it before we even move this for a vote so David first please yeah, I'm, I'm going to vote for this, but I'm worried about some intangibles that even though there's no direct evidence of conflict, whether the subcontractor, in this case, also representing us in another fashion, might withhold real criticism. And this is a soft thing, not, a, not on a, you know, something they're working on. But will that ultimately uh, mean they'll pull their punches on something else because of their other substantial financial engagement? I think I'm going. Can I just address that? Because um, so, so currently, the current contract, the way it's set up, allows the subcontractors to, to do that work. And you know, I've only been responsible for them since August. But I can certainly tell you that none of the subcontractors working under the prime contractor have pulled their punches, um, regardless. Um, so, so it is it is a, it is a soft thing. It's something that has to be watched. Um, but but um, but we do we do, you know we do watch that. We do you know work with them on you know OCO the the, the people that we you know Michael's in the room. Um, you know we work closely on them um, with their with their oversight of each of those projects. So we we know what's happening with them. Okay, please, Elizabeth. Uh, if I'm reading this correctly, it looks like we went out for public advertising. We sent notice to 183 potential bidders. 84 
requests came in to pull the RFP to take a look at it, but we only received two bids. It, this is just a comment. We might want to go back to some of the other folks that pulled the proposal to see why they didn't bid. Procurement did you want do? Uh, so, so um, board members. So what? In fact, these are, this is one of the challenges we face. Um, typically, where a number of the proposers or intended proposers had pulled it, but then realized, okay, they, to an extent, may not be able to work on other contracts for the MTA. So the, the, the verbal responses we got from the team was, listen, we'd rather then look at working for uh, the MTA on the C&D side or whichever other agency where the pool is much larger and we are not limited to just this oversight role. So that's why you end up getting very, very little competition. Um, but at the same time, you know, these are the firms that were, went through a rigorous process and have said, we are prepared to do this. Yeah. Other comments? Hada? Um, I just just to um, comment on your comment, we've been through this for the last, I guess, uh, three or four weeks, and I think um, what the 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 way Michelle and Paige described how we're moving forward on this contract, I think makes me comfortable to vote for it. Um, but I want to make sure that we're going to you know be updated and um, be. I don't want to say be told, but made aware of any issues that arise up as a result of this. So, absolutely. Um, so we'll have a procedure that lays out how we're going to monitor it. Um, but I, and, and, and the only reason I'm, I'm comfortable with how you'll be told is because I won't allow anything to go forward that has a true conflict. And so the only thing I would be bringing to you is to explain, here's what's going to happen and this is why it's not a conflict. And if, if there was any, any concern on, on the, you know, on, on the um, CP side, C side or within finance, of course. But we you'll also t uh, keep us aware of if a Baker wants to bid on something. Baker won't be able to, but yes, any sub. Yes, okay. any sub. But, okay. but any sub, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Sharif, please. Sure, thank you. So I, I too am going to vote for this, and I do want to comment on what my colleagues have commented on. Um, number one, first, to thank Kevin, to thank Paige, to thank Michelle for the extensive conversations, and you, Chair, obviously extensive conversations about this, I think that we all agree that the IEC performs an incredibly important function. Um, and so we want to preserve that independence. Um, we also had significant conversations about the balance that we need to strike with respect to having a healthy pool of contractors to be able to draw upon so that we have healthy competition and. Um, essentially produce a better product for the MTA. And so to Elizabeth's point, you know, it is kind of telling that we started out with this huge sort of universe to get proposals, but we only landed two. And so I say it's telling because again, I mean, I think, you know, it's it, the bottom line is driving this, right? And this is a very important function for this agency, and therefore we had to balance. But the conversations that we've had over the last several weeks were to create those firewalls, to create those procedures, to make sure that there are absolutely no conflicts. And so the written procedure that Michelle referenced that's going to come back, the reporting to the CPC committee, the reporting to the finance committee, the disclosures that will be required, both contractually and procedurally, we wanted to make sure that all of those were buttoned up and the I's were dotted and T's were crossed so that we ensure that there will be absolutely no conflicts. So again, while we have the balance with allowing subcontractors to bid on other work so that we don't have a completely chilling effect on the subcontracts and the work that we want um, the contractor community to bid on. So I will be voting for this and thank you for the opportunity to explain. Thank you, Sharif. Anyone else? Michelle, when can we expect the uh, procedures you're going to put in place to be written and shared with this committee? When's a good committee meeting to put that on the calendar for? Well, I, I won't probably do it at the committee meeting, but I'll provide it before the next committee meeting. 
Oh, I, I mean, it, I think it actually would be. I mean, okay. unless you think, I think it would actually be quite useful to do it in public session. Yeah, sure. I think that's. I think that's. Yeah. I think this whole committee's yes. job is transparency, yeah. and it's certainly what I stand for. So Next I would committee. actually like it to be done here, and I think we should do it in parallel. Or I mean, I we should ask our the chair of uh, CPC, who is also the chair of the board, to see if he would like to have that done in his agenda, maybe even on the same day or maybe a different day. Uh, but will you tell you and Kevin and Mark work out when is the right meeting next sure. meeting meeting after and I, I'd like to put that on the calendar I don't I don't want to lose the thread given the importance of the conversation everyone good all right so I'm gonna then call sir I'm gonna then call for a vote uh, motion to approve the Baker contract for the IEC so moved. thank you hate a second all right Elizabeth thank you all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed abstention motion passes thank you very much Kavesh, thank you for your duty, sir. Um, and I think we move on to David Florio for real estate agenda. Thank you. Real estate has four action items for consideration and approval. The first is for the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and it is the acquisition of property from Excel Development in support of phase two of Second Avenue subway project. Bob Paley, Senior Director of Transit Oriented Development, I uh, will now brief the committee on this transaction. Bob. Great. Thank you, David. So the subject property is one of the key real estate acquisitions needed to support MTA's application for a full funding grant agreement from the Federal Transit Administration to advance the Second Avenue Subway Phase Two project. MTA has already acquired several critical properties, including at 125th and Lex Lenox and 125th and Park. And these parcels will provide entrances ancillary buildings and also our key staging areas for tunnels, tunneling and tunnel boring machines. And in the um, May cycle, we're going to be seeking adoption of EDPL determination findings for the final bucket of uh, property interests needed for Second Avenue Subway, and those will by and large be uh, smaller properties. Um, as I said, the key, these key sites, including this particular site, are the most expensive, largest sites needed for Second Avenue Subway. Um, and with these acquisitions, we remain on budget to um, acquire the smaller properties that will follow. So specifically for this site, um, this was the former Pathmark site located on the full block, approximately of 125th between Lexington and 3rd Avenue. And um, MTA has no need to acquire that entire parcel. It's under one ownership. Um, so we sought to acquire uh, the block front on Lexington. It's about 40% of the site. Um, so the proposed acquisition in front of you um, would allow the current owner to develop the remaining portion of the site for commercial purposes, which substantially reduces the cost of the MTA acquisition. So there are several components to the, to the arrangement. Um, one is to acquire uh, Block 1773, Lot 20 from Extel uh, Development for the station entrance, major entrance to the Second Avenue subway, which connects to the Lexington line, and an ancillary facility, um, and also provides a critical uh, construction staging area. Also, we would be acquiring a subsurface uh, easement volume to construct a ventilation tunnel, which would be built under the commercial building that the developer would build. And the total cost of this acquisition is $82 million. And in order to allow uh, Extel to more quickly construct its adjacent building, Extel's contractors um, would be enabled to use a small portion of MTA's property after the acquisition at fair market rental. And this license um, is also included in the agreement. So as I said, this is, this is the highest value property that we're acquiring. It's like the 100% location at Lexington and 125th Street. Um, and so in order to minimize our acquisition costs, as I said, we subdivided the property, and it's subject to a zoning lot development agreement. And um, what this does is it allows the remaining portion of the site to be developed as of right. We also have allocated additional floor area um, to that other site, which, uh, which helps to reduce the uh, acquisition costs. And in addition, the property is subject to a special transit land use district easement, which is provided by Extel to MTA at no cost, which further reduces the acquisition costs. Uh, both MTA Legal and uh, the Federal Transit Administration um, have concurred with this negotiated purchase price, and MTA Legal has further advised that condemnation is likely to be more expensive than the negotiated purchase price. So accordingly, we seek uh, board authorization to acquire Lot 20, to acquire Lot 27, 
subterranean easement and to grant Extel a temporary construction access agreement. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, Kevin's going to just say one thing, okay. and then we'll go to you, Hayda. Yeah, and Jamie, feel free to comment. But you know, one thing, you know, this is an acquisition that's a prerequisite to getting the full funding grant agreement. But remember, there's other contingencies to getting that full funding grant agreement and being able to move forward with the project, such as getting the FONSI for congestion pricing. So we have the sources to do the do the full project and you know the FTA you know continues to do their diligence on the project they have to make a determination that we have the financial stability to over a long period of time it's one of their requirements to approve the project so yeah you know, I'm not saying this because I don't support the acquisition I just want to make sure the committee understands this is one of those many steps things where we right. you know we have to keep the project moving forward and expend right. sources that will you know the fta we expect them to share and <coughs> so forth but this is you know the this is not the last remaining contingency to, to move forward on the project but head over to you um they walk, why is excel leasing part of the property back I'm sorry. Why is Excel leasing part of the property back? Do oh, they need that, it for their development? A, it's an accommodation. They're, they're, they need to build a foundation directly on the property line in okay. order to do that more quickly and not get in our way when we're ready to take the site. It allows their contractors several feet or more to actually get in and stage and build quickly. Okay, so it's just for staging and building foundation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. David, over to you. Yeah, I'll, very briefly. I don't want to slow things down. If the, something falls apart, we're still on the hook for this contract. Yes. So that's that's the risk. Okay. I was sorry. I'm a little you, slow. You, you got that. You got. Yeah, that I, was, I was Kevin's getting, point. He, he was putting it so nicely. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I would, uh, Chair, if, if if I could just respond, I'd just make sure. I'd just I, I think everyone knows this, but first of all, um, <clears throat> real estate acquisitions are the um, often the thorniest things to get into place in order to get these major projects done within the city. And when people talk about why was Second Avenue Subway Phase 1 so expensive, it was because the acquisitions were not done uh, far enough in advance. So, you know, if we want to have a successful project, which this, you know, we all know, Phase two is a you know long needed uh, amenity for a transit starved area. Um, we have to get this acquisition done. But the second thing is, you know, Bob Bob described it as a 100% property. I mean, this is a high value property that's been uh, already rezoned by the city on 125th Street. So, um, you know, nothing is for certain, but um, you know, it, it is a uh, it is a valuable piece of real estate uh, that that we're acquiring. Uh, yeah, and, and again, I agree with the strategy. But one thing you'll notice in the staff summary, you know, we had an appraiser that came in with a very low appraiser. They had an appraiser that came in with very high, you know high appraisal, and we're settling in the you know in the mid range, I guess. And and you know the alternative we have is to go through the you know taking through eminent domain, and you know we're being advised by everybody this is. You know, this is a good settlement deal, um, but you know, I want to make sure everybody's clear on that. And, and just to make sure, thanks. Just to make sure it's it's clear, this is where we're going to be building major station entrance. Sixty-five percent of the users of Second Avenue Subway Phase Two will pass through the entrance at this location. Uh, it is where the ancillary facility, the key ancillary facilities for this major station will be built and the only way that we can really do the tunnel boring and the underground work to build that station is from this site um, so uh, you know and and uh, Bob also mentioned that we are uh, retaining 150,000 square feet of potential development rights as well as part of this sure you please just a question about the payment for this the 82 million this is from the first tranche of the federally approved funding is that accurate I believe this comes from MTA funds, it's my understanding. Yeah, I, I, I believe we have to advance it, and then it's, it's, it's eligible for reimbursement. But I can report back to you on the details on that. Okay. Andrew, anyone else want to go in on this? Anyone else? 
No, okay, Andrew, go ahead, please. You mean everyone would have gone before me? That's no, no, I, I, was, I wasn't going to put him in front of you. I was just going to make okay. sure we have an order. No, okay. absolutely not. Thank you. You're the longest serving board member. You uh, should go first each time. Thank you. Uh, how far west will the storage area, the layup for the trains, be under 125th Street? And how far west will we have to invoke eminent domain? Well, we've acquired the property, uh, the ancillary property, I believe, at 120th on Lennox, which is, I think, approximately, Jamie, I'm not certain of the actual. 120th on Lennox? Uh, I'm sorry, on 25th and Lennox. Oh, okay. Excuse me. So, so we, we, our facilities will, even though the terminal will basically be between Lexington and Park Avenue under 125th Street, the, the layup tracks and storage facilities will go as far west as Lennox Avenue? That's my understanding, yeah. Yeah, we'll confirm Lennox Avenue, but yes. Yeah, there because are, there we obviously have a Lennox Avenue <laughs> subway we have to deal with as well when we get too close. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, uh, what, one quick question for you, Jamie. You keep using the term ancillary, so just can you just, what the examples of the ancillary uses are, please? Um, it, it's a variety of things in, in a, you know, related to a station and to powering the subway, so it's, uh, it may be substation uh, space, it, it's um, likely uh, signal rooms, um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> other locations for, technical components uh, for us to manage the train. There may be, in some cases, some back of house space uh, as well. Um, uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, the, the station areas as well in this location. Uh, uh, Jamie, I'll just also add that um, it, the, probably, probably the biggest volume has to do with uh, ventilation of the subway as a, you know, safety measure. And that's volumetrically. I mean, all those other components are part of it, but volumetrically it's the sort of the fans and the louvers and that sort of stuff that takes a lot of space. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Paige, quick, quick question for you on Robert's rules question. We always, I always have this challenge when we do the real estate items. We usually bucket them and take a vote at the end. Uh, is that appropriate, or do we need to take these individually? I feel like I ask this constantly. You can you can bucket them and take okay. a vote at the end. All it's right, your David. Preference. Th thank you. Well, that's that's certainly been the preference the way we've operated, but I just want to be mindful. <laughs> David, the floor is yours, sir. Okay. The second item, Mr. Chairman, is uh, Newark City Transit. It's a license agreement with HS News Corp for two retail spaces at 59th Street, Lexington Avenue Station. The third item is empty along the railroad is a grant of an easement to Gershaw Recycling Corporation for a freight sidetrack in Medford, New York. And the last item is for MTA Metro North and is the acquisition of a permanent easement and a disposition of an existing one in support of rail operations in Sleepy Hollow. There is additionally one information item. Happy to answer any questions about the foregoing. You just do you want to just tell us the information item? Uh, you it's can't a, you can't leave it there and then just that's it makes no uh, saying there's one and then not telling us what the information is yeah, I, is uh, I, quite the cliffhanger there. Yeah, I, I do it on purpose. It's no, like uh, the final uh, episode of Dallas. It's, it's, it's Keep a going. license agreement we did with with Austining, uh for the for the uh, it's a license agreement with Austining, a permit for them to use uh, our commuter parking lot during Earth Day this past weekend. This past board, weekend, pursuant to board policy. This past weekend. That's okay. Nice. Okay. All right. So uh, give a motion for this uh, tranche. Thank you, David. Uh, second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Abstention. Real estate items pass. Uh, any new business for the committee? Anyone? <laughs> we wait on bated breath for the budget. That's fair. Do you have a Hater requested me to spend some time with her ahead of time on the variable rate portfolio. <laughs> so if anybody wants to join. Okay, that's very funny. Lisa, please. Quick question. I know we're waiting on the, the lovely budget, but w once the budget is approved and hopefully all the numbers go through, what's the timeline on the fair increase as far as what's the process from there, considering we're falling so far behind? Jay, did you want to talk about the uh, <laughs> schedule? That it's Jay, Jay's been man managing the, the uh, complex details of this. Um, sure. Depending on what the executive budget includes for the fare and toll increase, um, we would start the process um, informing the, the board of what the fare and toll increases could be up to, and then start the uh, public notice process for public hearings. Um, we would hold them both virtually, probably, and in person. 
And then um, after the comments have been taken, uh, we would take a board vote to implement them. Um, you know, originally we had a June implementation uh, for board um, the fair and toll increase. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Um, so it'll be a fluid um, sort of process. So maybe July, August would be the timeline. Sorry. No, please go ahead. Please. So we're looking at public hearing of about 30 days. Yes. For comment period correct and then coming back to the board committee and then the board correct okay thanks it's a great question Lisa I, I will encourage as a matter of civic participation the board will be asked probably to join various public hearings for the fare increases Andrew and I David I think I don't know other board members have been on with Hayda maybe uh, when we've had before you were, but it is it is quite a special event to sit up there for three hours and have members of the public come and speak. And it's you, you, there's no back and forth. We just listen. And I I found it actually be a quite rewarding experience to go to uh, where did we go? Queens College and York College and Brooklyn College and places. Style. We've all been in different places, but it's it's a pretty fascinating experience and a good good one. So I look forward in some ways to being there. Okay, you don't want to come? Okay. I, All right, well. I, just to follow David, up, please. I think it's going to be critically important to, to be in person in this one because the public, if the public feels shut off and all going only virtual, you're, you're, we're going to lose traction in terms of what we have to do. No, we definitely do have a plan for in person as yeah. well as virtual. I'm sure each of us will be asked to sign up for a chunk of that to join on the dais. So I may have hearing no other new business. Thank you, Lisa, for that question. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion. Thank you. Second. All in favor. Thank you very much. See you on Wednesday, folks.